This is Jocko Podcast number 416 with Echo Charles and me, Jocko Willink. Good evening, Echo. Good evening. The President of the United States takes pleasure in presenting the Bronze Star Medal II Naval Special Warfare Operator Second Class Sea Air Land Robert A. Holland for service as set forth in the following citation for heroic achievement in connection with combat operations against the enemy as Naval Special Warfare Task Unit Bruiser, Combat Advisor, and Machine Gunner in direct support of Operation Iraqi Freedom on 17 June 2006. Petty Officer Holland displayed exceptional courage under fire as automatic weapons gunner during a daytime presence patrol. While patrolling a narrow street in a dangerous insurgent-controlled neighborhood, his element came under heavy enemy fire. With complete disregard for his own safety, He maintained his position, exposed in the street, and engaged the enemy with his Mark 48 762 machine gun, suppressing enemy fire and allowing his element to take safe cover in a courtyard of a nearby residence. After departing the residence, the element began to fire and maneuver back toward the vicinity of a U.S. Army combat outpost. As they executed the maneuver, he was wounded by shrapnel in the leg, but continued to provide cover for his teammates. By his extraordinary guidance, zealous initiative, and total dedication to duty, Petty Officer Holland reflected great credit upon himself and upheld the highest traditions of United States Naval Service. The combat distinguishing device is authorized. For the President, J.D. Kernan, Rear Admiral, United States Navy, Commander, Naval Special Warfare Command. And that right there is the citation from one of the awards for Robert Holland or Bobby Holland in one of the situations when he stepped up and led. And he did this over and over again on that deployment and throughout his career. And you've probably heard me talk about how the squad leader makes a difference. That's the Marine Corps professional way of saying it. In, in the teams, you've heard me talk about the E5 Mafia. These are the guys that run the platoon. These are the guys that navigate to the targets. They set the breaching charges. They prepare the radios, the vehicles, the crew surfed weapons. They shoot machine guns that provide cover fire so the platoon can maneuver. Well, Bobby Holland was one of those, one of those E5s. Part of the E5 Mafia. And in the book, Dichotomy of Leadership, which was written while Bobby was still on active duty. In that book, Leif refers to Bobby as one of his most trusted SEAL enlisted leaders because Bobby was in Charlie Platoon, Task Unit Bruiser, where he was known as Lead Bob. (laughs) And he was called Lead Bob because in the SEAL teams, whoever leads some aspect of a mission or some part of the platoon is known as the lead. So it's Lead Sniper, Lead Breacher, Lead Climber, Lead Navigator. Well, Bob seemed to kind of lead everything. So he just became Lead Bob (laughs) based on his ability to step up and make things happen. And Lead Bob eventually moved out of the E5 Mafia into the head shed, the dreaded head shed, as a leading petty officer of a platoon, as the chief of a platoon, eventually became a warrant officer in the SEAL teams. And he spent 21 years there, deployed all over the world, including both Iraq and Afghanistan. And it's an honor to have him with us here tonight to share his experiences and lessons learned. Lead Bob, Bobby, thanks for joining us, bro. Jocko, Echo, thanks for having me, man. Um, Humbled to be here. Now let's do it. Yeah, let's go. Uh, Lead Bob, there's more nicknames we'll uncover. There's There's more things out there. I don't know how many I want to unveil. <laughs> there are a couple. Yeah, yeah there's a few. Uh, all right, let's start at the beginning. Let's jump into this. You're born in your California kid. Born and raised California, yep. Uh, raised in Fresno. I actually uh, spent my first seven years in a place called Selma. It's like 20 miles south of Fresno. It's where my parents grew up. Um, yeah, went to Fresno when I was around eight years old and lived there until, you know, joined the Navy, basically. And, and so your mom, she was Portuguese, right? 
We are Portuguese. Because yes. that was one of the nicknames yeah. I remember was Portuguese pig. <laughs> yes, the Portuguese pig. Yeah. See, we're already getting into it, man. Hey, yeah, I'm yeah, just yeah, saying, yeah. we're out of the gate. Yeah, yeah. All right. So, Big Pig was one of my many <laughs> nicknames. Let's get it out. And and the Portuguese pig. Yes. <laughs> so, and you and your mom was what second generation American? Uh. Or her grandparents yes. moved here? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. Yeah. So my uh, my great grandparents immigrated from Portugal. Um, my uh, I don't know all the details, but what was passed down to me was my great grandpa actually. This is in World War One, um, trying to flee all the shit that was going on there. Um, swam out like a mile to, to catch a boat. So he wasn't with my great grandma at that point yet, but he was mm-hmm. fleeing to America. And uh, frogman style. Frogman style. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then what? What was up with your dad? What'd your dad do? Or did your mom work? Uh, yeah. So. My mom was essentially raised on a farm in Selma. So uh, interestingly enough, I was back in town uh, last week and we went back down to Selma, um, cruised around and you know, she took me by the old farm and all that. Uh, but she's raised on a farm, you know, kind of hard living there. Um, she ended up somehow finding herself into the financial services industry and later became an entrepreneur, um, kind of like a rags to riches story there. I don't want to say riches. I mean, we're middle class, but it felt like riches when you're <laughs> coming from a farm, you know? Yeah. So, um, yeah, just real kind of gritty upbringing for her. Um, my dad spent most of his childhood in Selma. He was actually born in Odessa, Texas, and uh, his mom kind of, you know, took him and his older brother from their dad, left Texas at a very early age, fled to Selma, and uh, my dad, I mean, for lack of better terms, basically raised himself from, you know, 12 on, had a really rough childhood, mm-hmm. yeah. Do, and this is all in Selma? All, all in Selma, yeah. Selma's kind of like a, uh, I, I best described as probably like an ag town, mm-hmm. kind of a smaller town. Fresno's a lot bigger, um, yeah. And then, did, did you did your, say your dad had a brother that, that died? Yeah, what, what, no, what my, my dad, uh, my, my dad has a story, man. Um, you know, unfortunately, he's not around to tell that story. Uh, you know, we lost him back in 2012. But uh, yeah, his brother, so his brother, I mean, kind of raised him, he was three years older than him, um, got into the wrong crowd, and, uh, you know, at the age of 21 was murdered. Um, so it heavily affected my dad, mm-hmm. you know, his entire life, my dad struggled with that. And, you know, the you know, being pulled away from his dad and, and his mom kind of abandoning him. Um, and the rumor has it, I, I mean, I don't know, but that guy who uh, murdered my uncle, and my uncle was my namesake. I, I was named after, mm-hmm. after him. Um, he was handled with some country justice when he got out of prison, uh, as rumor has it. Damn. Yeah. Well, right on. Uh, and then what was your dad doing for work? So my dad uh, found himself, he spent a career at a, I guess, a commercial water filtration, uh, you know, corporation, I guess. So he was a purchasing manager and just kind of did that. I mean, as long as, uh, you know, my entire life, that's kind of what he did. Was he ever in the military? He was a reservist uh, post, post-Vietnam, post a couple years, uh, I think he was stationed at Point Wainimi or something for mm-hmm. a year. Oh, so he's Navy. Navy, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was a, a CB. Oh, right on. Uh, electrician and also a pig gunner. Mm, yeah. That's right. So he he introduced me to the uh, the M60, <laughs> which down the road I would actually get to wield, which was really kind of need to go full circle. But yeah, I grew up. Uh, you know, my my dad was in active duty. He didn't like mm-hmm. get into it, um, but held the Navy with such high regard in the military and uh you know was always talking about carrying the pig and uh i never man i i remember this shit um, all the way back in ramadi in, in gunfights but my dad used to tell me um the survival right uh, sorry the survival rate in vietnam for a pig hunter was like i don't know mm-hmm. 30 seconds or something yeah. that was kind of like the the rumor so um you know that conversation kind of stuck with me and when <laughs> we were getting gunfights it was uh yeah, check. You, you try and shrink your head down a little bit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> try and keep that low profile. 
So what are you into when you're growing up, like you're in your childhood? Uh, I was really into sports. Yeah, that was kind of my, my outlet. I was a, a rambunctious kid, I guess you could say. My, my mom. Um, we call those delinquents. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I never spent any time in a facility per se, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I was just full of energy and uh, rambunctious and stubborn and, and a handful, man. But sports was my outlet. So, you know, really into sports, played all sports growing up, uh, you know, started with soccer and t-ball. And uh, then I got into football and wrestling. And those were like really, really my sports. And I grew up playing street ball, street football. I don't know if anyone knows that that's the thing, but Echo, yes, sir. Do we play street ball in we Hawaii? Did, yes, big time. What'd you play with? Uh, just neighbor kids. Yeah, but yeah. what, like a rock? Oh or no, no, a, a no, red I, air I, ball? Uh, football, man. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hey, I don't know. There's different <laughs> levels to street <laughs> ball. That's Charles right. is playing that with a yeah. coconut boy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we have played with coconuts before. Yes, yes. Yeah. So street ball in the street? Yeah, yeah. I probably like every day of my life from like age eight until, you know, I was playing real football on mm-hmm. the field. Uh, my brother and I, I have a younger brother, three years younger, uh, playing street ball, man. Yeah, it's great. Cutting our teeth there. And uh, yeah, man, I, yeah, I was uh, into movies, uh, you know, into sports. And then what's up with your parents? Are your parents like, I mean, it sounds like your mom's coming from a little bit of a rough background. Your mom, your dad's coming a little bit of, of a rough background. How were they getting along? How was how was all that? Like the home life? Yeah, man. It, you know, it was it was good. The, the parents uh, did a good job of not. Both my parents did a good job of not passing down their shit. Mm-hmm. You know, um, and that's that's a real gift. That's a generational gift. And I was having this conversation with my mom. Um, the other day, you know, I, I've been doing a lot of reflection the last week. No, and I, I was going to come on here. Um, haven't really thought about a lot of this stuff in a long time. And, uh, you know, I, I thank her for that because, you know, she kind of broke the kind of cycle of shit there. And that's been passed on to my kids. And uh, so, yeah, you, you know, I, I, I had a great upbringing, man. I mean, you know, our, our parents worked very hard to get a roof over our head. We had everything that we needed. Um, you know, they didn't come from much. Uh, but. Yeah, I, man, I wouldn't change my childhood for anything. I, it was a blast. My, my parents always supported me doing everything, mm-hmm. and, you know, and, and they they let me be me. Mm-hmm. And I think that was the uh, best thing that they could have done was not not resist. Um, you know, they, they, they tried when I was younger and it, it didn't work. And uh, I think I turned out, to, you know, to be the best version I could have been. <laughs> what, what um, like, guardrails did you push up against with your parents? Like, what were you getting into that was where they were like, all right, we just got to let this go? Oh, man. Were you, were you like, getting good grades? Yeah. Yeah, I, I was. Yeah, I, I was a decent kid, man. I, I I was a pretty good kid. You know, I got got decent grades. Um, I wasn't very focused in the classroom. Mm. I just didn't want to be in the classroom, but I got it done. Um, you know, my parents did expect me to do well in school, so I did well enough to keep them off my back. <laughs> And, you know, as I got older, uh, I just got in a lot of fights, man. <laughs> you know, Check. and uh, I was, yeah. W- were you just mouthy or were you a, a nice target? Were you just hostile? I don't know. I, you know, I, I think I need some of my, uh, you know, childhood uh, opponents to kind of remind <laughs> me a little bit. I, I, I like to think that it wasn't me that started it. You know, my parents raised me to never start a fight, but always to finish it. Like it was always very clear that if you get in a fight, you better finish it. And it was like, you know, not like, you know, if you want, it was like, you're going to finish it. We, we expect you to do that. So, um, I, I got picked on for a little bit. I was, uh, I, I got a little bit chunky, you know, <laughs> I, or, or, or hefty. hefty. <laughs> um, you know, but it, it was like solid, like fighter weight, you know, like nine, <laughs> nine, 10 years old, you know, it wasn't like sloppy. It was like kind of thick. <laughs> that happens to boys when they're getting ready to grow. Yeah. Like that age of maybe nine, 10, 11, they get a little bit thick. We'll yeah. say. Yeah. And then when they grow, usually they lean out a little bit. Yeah. So, um, so you got picked on cause of that. Yeah. Don't, don't quote me out, but I think from like second grade to like sixth grade as 120 pounds. And okay, I just that's pretty that's pretty beefy little kid. Yeah. I just grew taller and then I grew kind of thinner, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so I got picked on a little bit uh, and 
and I just handled people, man. Uh, you know, I was uh, straight up, bro. Com- com- completely untrained, like no skill whatsoever. But I was, I was fueled by the movies of the 1980s, man. You know, uh-huh. I mean, all, all those action movies, and uh, you related. I, I related, and yeah, I, you know, I think my record. I think I'm undefeated, man. In childhood fights, I, I fought. Uh, I fought all my neighbors except for one. There, there, there was one kid. I, I won't let him know who he is. Mm-hmm. That uh, I didn't want to fight. Mm-hmm. He, he was a tough guy. He, he is older too, but uh, yeah. And and in school, uh, got in a lot of fights there. And uh, I mean, just Did damn you near get in trouble. Yeah, uh, my mom was on a you know first name basis with the principal. <laughs> Um, I don't think I was suspended, but I was threatened to be suspended. I was uh, threatened to be expelled several different times. Sure. And, uh, yeah, so just, just like a lot of fighting and, uh, man, I got so many fights. I, I was even getting cocky and, and like trying new moves and shit that <laughs> I had no business doing. Um, what year is this? Oh, this is like circa, you know, like eight, eight, 88 to okay. kind of yeah. 90. So like, this is still pre UFC. No one knows. What oh yeah, no, 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 no. All right, so you're still thinking Roadhouse moves are gonna work. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. I, <laughs> I got a story for you. All right, speaking of uh, Roadhouse here, so I'm uh, I want to say I'm 11 years old and uh, on the playing ground and playing basketball. The basketball goes out of bounds, and this kid, you know, like picks up the ball. And I was like, hey, man, you know, give us the ball back. And he's like, yeah, not happening. He threw it away. I was like, oh, it's game on. Right? <laughs> like, fight is happening. So we, we end up going after it and, uh, you know, throw a couple of blows. I'm like, I'm like 11 years old, man, just a little chunky butt, throwing, throwing blows. And like I said, I, I was like so cocky at this point. I've been in so many fights. I'm like, it's go time. I'm doing it. And I decided to try for the first time in my entire life a roundhouse kick. Hell yeah. Yeah, bro. It's real. Right on. Not, not only did it not land, but I <laughs> fell on my ass. And uh, yeah, not not a great look. So, <laughs> Is this, when did you meet Tyler? Uh, I met Tyler in eighth grade for sure. Maybe, maybe seventh grade, but we got really close in high school. And the, the reason I bring up Tyler is because, well, we actually all know him because he ended up in the SEAL teams as well. And I'm yep. sure we'll get to that. But that was seventh, eighth grade. You met him, started running with him. Yep. Yep. And you get in high school, or did you keep wrestling? Uh, I stopped wrestling in, in eighth grade. Um, man, I, I really credit. I, I only wrestled for like four or five years, but. Um, Bro, that wins every fight. If you're 11, 12 years old yeah. and you wrestled for four years, you're winning every fight just on that. I mean, and a nice roundhouse kick, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, you know, back then they didn't have mixed, mar- sorry, mixed martial arts. They didn't have jujitsu. Uh, well, it, it wasn't as prominent, I guess. So, no, they didn't have it in America. So it, it was kind of yeah. like karate, taekwondo. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, those were kind of like what, what kids would do. Um, but I wrestled. And I think, you know, strongly encouraged, you know, especially young boys to, you know, do one of those things, do martial arts, uh, wrestle, because, I mean, I, I just learned things at that young age that I carried on with me the rest of my life. And yeah. the, uh, the the discipline to wrestle, um, I mean, the hardest practices of probably all the sports, I'd imagine. Um, yeah. You know, cutting weight, the discipline, and, and then just standing in the ring, you know, staring that other dude down, you know, the heart's racing, and, and like, you're going after it, you know. Yeah. But uh, so I, I was a good wrestler, I, you know, pretty accomplished um, up until eighth grade. I made it up to, I'm not sure if it was a state meet or regional meet, but a pretty big meet up in Sacramento mm-hmm. in eighth grade. And, you know, I got pretty close to like finishing. I got towards the end and then uh, I met my match. Uh, the a jun- junior Olympic dude oh, yeah. who, I mean, looked straight up like Rocky. Mm-hmm. And I, I lack skill, mm-hmm. to be honest with you. I, I was just kind of like aggression and... Uh, and I met my match, and I think he got me, I think it's called a surfboard move. Mm-hmm. And he just maxed me out on points. <laughs> and I was like, you know what, man, I feel like my wrestling career is over. So I uh, went into to high school, and my high school had a really great football program, a year-round program. Damn. And uh, that was basically, you know, I, I had to drop wrestling, and I was all in on football after that. All in on football, and what what the, did you make? Like, are you playing freshman team, varsity team, JV team? Like, how'd that go? What'd your career look like? Yeah, yeah, my high school career. Uh, I, I started out. I played <laughs> played freshman ball. Um, had a pretty good season, and then after the freshman season ended, uh, our varsity team was in the playoff run. So they had, I think, they won the championship 
the year prior. Like, really, really great team. Uh, I don't know what we were ranked in the state that year, um, but my senior year, I think we were ranked like fifth. So, like, super solid program. Uh, the head coach came in. I, I don't know what level he coached in college, but he came down and just ran kind of like a college-level program. At least that was the perception of it. Um, so they pulled me up to varsity at the end of my freshman year. Uh, by this point, I, I played Ironman ball, uh, which means offense and defense um, on the freshman side. But they pulled me up, and then I just played defensive line mm-hmm. from that point what on. What did you weigh, like, in high school? Uh, I think I was 190, uh-huh. 190s. Uh-huh. Is that by the time you got to your senior year? Uh, yeah, man, I, I don't remember, like, what I came in mm-hmm. at um, – Freshman year, but yeah, I, I was like 190s. Uh, senior were you year. jacked? Were you lifting? Were you squatting? Or was it just kind of like normal yeah, I, growth? I mean, I wouldn't say I was like jacked, like, uh, you know, like muscle man jacked, but I I was I was super strong. I, one of the things that, you know, I, I didn't mention, we kind of passed over, but when, uh, you know, I was a chunky butt from like, I don't know, 9 to 11 or whatever, I started to lean out. But one of the things I did, I, I made a – a pact with myself, um, fifth grade summer going into sixth grade. I'm like, I'm done being a chunky butt. So I just stopped eating shit. And, uh, <laughs> and I started, my, my dad had some weights. So I started like lifting okay. weights and I was a strong kid. So yeah, I was strong and, uh, I was fast, you know? And I, I say that like with a huge grain of salt, like compared to fast people, mm-hmm. I'm not fast, but I, I was, you know, decently fast, aggressive, uh, and I, I felt like I was born to play football. Mm-hmm. So how far did you make it like your senior year in football? Yeah. So, man, I, I was all in like, uh, you know, I had aspirations of playing after high school, but I think my social life and uh, distraction kind of got in the way in high school and I just stopped developing myself further. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I, I'm still like ranked pretty like what, high. What grade was that? Well, I, I would say probably junior year and senior year. I just kind of slacked off. Did you get a car or something? Yeah. Did you get yeah. a girlfriend? Yep, yep. Um, I actually met my future wife in high school, so uh, dated sophomore year. Are we allowed to say her name? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Beth, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. you met Beth. I met Beth uh, so- crazy, sophomore year. Dude. I know, it's crazy. Yeah, oh, um, and a big I, distraction right there, Beth. Big distraction, just distracting there, there you, you all go. over yeah. the let's, place. Let's let's blame her for the reason why I'm not. You know, I didn't play in the NFL. Um, not the fact that I was you know five eleven and not even two hundred pounds playing defensive line, nonetheless. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I was a very social kid, and you know, man, I just was distracted and uh, probably doing things I shouldn't have been doing, and not you know, I I didn't want to get big. I was happy being kind of strong and lean mm-hmm. and I probably had to gain another 30 pounds, you know, which I would do later in life. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so we, we made it, uh, you know, I, I got injured, uh, really bad high ankle, sp- high ankle sprain my senior year. D- it didn't take me out of the game, but, uh, you know, I, I was just like less, less than full force that, you know, ha- first half of the season, their stats weren't that great. And, uh, you know, there were no, no scholarships at the end of that, no, no colleges ringing. Great, grades were decent, um, but I kind of squandered that. And my, my final game, man, I, I, I remember it, like, very, very closely because we were making another run at the championship, uh, had a good football season, into the playoffs, or, or it was the game deciding if we go into the playoffs. That, that part's a little bit fuzzy, but um, – we were down. It was 28-21. We're playing our, our rival. So uh, I went to Clovis West High School, and our rival was Clovis High School. Um, they were ahead. Clovis was ahead 28-21. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think it's poetic the way my career ended. Uh, if you want to call it a career at my high school, <laughs> sports it's a career. career. We're calling yeah, yeah. it a career. Yeah, all right. All right. Um, so it was a play action, uh, you know, run on the uh, – offensive side and I was a nose guard I broke right through the line and I just saw the quarterback and I hit him he fumbled the ball and I'm looking at man I I can paint this picture for you right now we're probably I'm probably like uh 40 yards away from the end zone and the ball is there and there's no one I see no one I pick up the ball and you know I just I, I start booking it and I made it like probably three yards and I got 
tackle from behind. Um, that was my last play football. We drove it all the way. Our offense drove all the way to the one yard line, and they they couldn't couldn't get it done, man. Um, so that was it. End of the career. I was the uh, you know we we went into the locker rooms change, and I went back out on the field and just kind of like soaked it in, man. That, that was football was such an important part of my life up to that point, and uh, I mean I, honestly, man, I, when I went through buds, I was looking back at football practices and like i mean this ain't that bad <laughs> Jack. yeah it, especially summer in fresno like uh, oh yeah yeah Freaking it's miserable 110 degrees and this is back when you know uh hydrating was like a, a luxury mm-hmm. you know <laughs> oh, yeah mean, that's the, that this is pre the big hydration thing <laughs> you gotta stay hydrated yeah 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 <laughs> We had back in, it was like they started saying hydrate or die. Back then it was just die. Yeah. <laughs> just like just die. Like you don't need water. What you, what's wrong with you? Yeah. You're a freaking wimp if you need water. <laughs> we had ambulances come out. Yeah. This this was not uncommon. And you know, everyone would just look at a guy just like weak. Yeah. This guy. Heat Kaz. Yeah. You were into music too. You play guitar. Yeah, I did. So, so my, what was that all about? Uh, my parents divorced when uh when I was around twelve and my mom started dating a guy, uh, ended up marrying him for a couple years as well. He played guitar. So he introduced me to guitar, and uh, I, I picked it up. I loved it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I started, started jamming out. I think, uh, man, Paradise City was the first song I learned. Oh, dang. Yeah. Straight yeah. in. Yeah, and, uh, you know, I, I never learned how to read music. Um just tab. Yeah. And just kind of like self-taught. I say self-taught with a grain of salt. Uh, you know that that gentleman taught me a lot. Mm-hmm. Taught taught me all the chords, and then I would just, you know, that that was kind of my thing. So whenever I was out of football, I would go to my room and I would jam and I would play songs and I would uh, write my own songs and, and do that. And then uh, you know eventually got into hardcore music and hell yeah yeah. <laughs> Echo's favorite? <laughs> no, that's my favorite. Yeah, but yeah, you know, Echo throws out the hell yeah at certain moments. In podcasts, usually it's on some real dumb shit. Oh <laughs> yeah, to be honest, with you, he'll go hell yeah. Like someone will say, like yeah, he actually already said one today when I said Roadhouse. Did you hear that? He goes hell yeah, <laughs> because you know that's oh, yeah. some meaningful shit to Echo that's, Charles, bro. He's like, you know, you know, that's a bouncer right there. That's his, yes, that's sir. his uh, forefathers yes, right there. Yeah. Yes, Pat's, Pat Swayze, man, man <laughs> guy, yeah. got after it. So you're listening to hardcore. You going to shows and everything? I did. Yeah, uh, I went to my first show in eighth grade. Uh, Bad Religion was my Damn, first show. Nice, yeah, yeah, good, good, uh, good, good punk rock, punk rock band back then. Yeah, um, got knocked down in the mosh pit. My yeah. first experience with that. Walked away, had a bloody ear. You're fired up, fired up. Like this yeah. is look, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and got more into it in in high school. Uh, I actually, I mean, backing up a little bit, the uh, Headbangers Ball. I was mm-hmm. really into that in the uh, late 80s, late eighties, early nineties. Yep. Um, with Ricky Ratman. Ricky Ratman, oh, remember man. that? Yeah. The Headbangers Ball with Ricky Ratman. Yeah, and they would play songs that weren't appropriate for the daytime MTV. Remember when MTV had music on it? Yeah. It was an interesting thing. Mm-hmm. So as you're doing all this shit, do you have a plan for your future? No. <laughs> yeah, is that, is that a shocker? I, I, I mean, football was my plan, mm-hmm. but then I just kind of let that die. Mm-hmm. Um, no plan at all, and that became clear uh, senior year. I mean, when football was over, it was like shit. So were people like applying to colleges and this yeah. kind of stuff. Man, I. And I, what are you doing? Like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> just everything wrong. <laughs> you know, I, so like even backing up uh, during the football season, it was so awful. But uh, I took the SATs on a Saturday after a Friday night football game mm-hmm. up super late. Uh, I had to drive. It was like 45 minutes South of Fresno at six in the morning. I was doing touch and goes. I mean, I surprised I haven't made it there in one piece. I was smoked. I did awful. You know, mm-hmm. I, I didn't have any big prospects. I wasn't super into school. Um, but my parents told me as soon as, as I was done with football, it's like, go get a job. Mm-hmm. So it's like, check. All right. I'm going to get a job. And then just figure it out. So what, I, what was your job? Uh, I ended up getting a job at the Silver Dollar Hofbrau. Which is what a restaurant? 
It's a, a Hofbrau is like a restaurant bar. It's kind of like a bar with a cafeteria set up. It, it, it's weird. Um, so I, I got a job working in the back. So I, I was like in the kitchen, mm-hmm. cleaning stuff up, uh, bus boy, mm-hmm. you know, uh, washed dishes, graduated, kind of like was a bus boy and, mm-hmm. and a bar back and then um, did some ad hoc bouncing as well. Hell oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know. um, but yeah, so it's, you know, I, I, no, I, I didn't have a plan. Um, I decided to go into junior college or community college. Um, because that's what you do when you kind of don't have a plan. Mm -hmm. Um, so figured I would do that and kind of figure stuff out. And you know, that, uh, my senior year, I was just kind of doing a lot of exploration, like, you know, young men do at that stage and like, man, what, what do I do? Were you thinking military? Did you start to consider military? You know, I I started having some ideas. I mean, if you're watching freaking predator and freaking Rambo and all this stuff, you must be. Yeah. I, I did. I, I I was raised on those movies. I was raised on. Yeah, I have uh, this Rambo knife here. You know, <laughs> First Blood, Commando, Predator. So I felt like I wanted to do some sort of you know, you know, action career, <laughs> if you will. But I had no idea kind of what that was. Um, so yeah, went went to community college. I actually uh, one interesting thing that happened to me in my senior year uh, was I f- I found a martial art called Aikido. Mm. So uh, I was actually at a party um, senior year. This is after the football season Mm -hmm. and at this guy's house. And he had like a full on dojo set up in his in his house. Now now we look back and know that this dude was a nerd. (laughs) For sure. (laughs) At the time, we're like, yo, he's been trained by the ancients or something. Mm -hmm. Oh, he had he had straw mats out like it it was it was legit. So um, I'm I'm like, hey, you know what? What's this? And uh he showed me some moves, and I was like, oh, okay, that's kind of cool. And, you know, he's like, oh, by the way, this is, uh, you know, you heard of Steven Seagal? I was like, oh, please tell me more. <laughs> you know, that, that's what uh, Seagal did, and I was like, I was intrigued. So uh, I ended up going to a class that next week and, and got really into that. So that became my outlet. Did you buy those weird pants and everything? No. Okay. No, I, I have a great picture I'll show you after this. Uh, I, I got to do uh, some like black belt testing at Seagal's residence. <laughs> Damn. And uh, I have a picture of him wearing the funny pants and, and elf shoes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wait, cool. the pants are for the like the ma- the teachers and stuff, right? It's not for the regular oh, students. Oh, oh, oh uh, yeah. I'm sorry. You're, you're talking about the hakama. I'm just talking about like the aikido pants. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah, with that yeah. whole outfit that they were. No, yeah. I, I never, I never made black belt. I, I got up to. Do you, uh, to. do you need to have a black belt to get the pants? You or whatever? do. You're you're supposed to. Yeah. What there's do you wear uh, before that. Like just, a regular gi. Normal. Yeah. Just gi. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, the first I know this because I did Aikido back the, the, in the day. Too. Oh damn! Look, it all comes out. I, it. I, the only thing I know about Aikido is I bought my first gi mm-hmm. ever from an Aikido school in Ocean Beach, okay. yeah. and it was it was cheap. It was forty dollars. It was uh, it was called unbleached, so there was like a white one, right, yeah, right. and it felt a little bit softer. Yeah. But that was like forty eight dollars, and the the one that I got was forty dollars. Okay, and it was unbleached, so it was real rough, and it was like a yellowish yeah. kind of gnarly looking color. Yeah, awful. And it lasted like three weeks because mm-hmm. they didn't know what we were about to do with these things because we were turning the <laughs> yeah, yeah, and just, just killing different. each other. Yeah, so yeah. the thing didn't last long at all. And then I had to go back. I had to go get like a real jujitsu gi. Yeah. But that's only so the only the high level people wear that weird outfit in Aikido. Yeah. So it, it depends on, you know, if, if you're going to like a non-traditional um, mm. place, they, they may do that, which gets really confusing because like we used to travel and do seminars and training events. Yeah. And so sometimes Check out Bobby and the freaking training uh, program. Yeah. <laughs> so so sometimes you, you would go to these seminars and, and you. You know, you're training with folks and you mm-hmm. pair up with people and you're training with you. You're like, man, seems like you're not a black belt. Yeah. And you're also like, it seems like I could kick your ass. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Um, yeah. But in, in Aikido, it's a uh, young chunky. Bobby's going to come out and whoop some ass. Wrestling. <laughs> you're you're basically a white belt all the way until you wear a Hakama. So there's no you, you don't know kind of who you're dealing with um, and, until you get the Hakama. And then, you know, that's just first degree black belt. And then you go on from there. So right. how many how often are you training? A lot. Like yeah. every day type uh, thing? Not every day, multiple times a week. Mm. I, I mean, it, it became it became my new football. And this it, is your senior year of high school? Senior year. And yeah. then it carries into when you go to uh, 
community college. Yep. You keep training. Yep, yep. I, I train train really hard uh, and you know, started traveling. It, it just really kind of consumed my life. Mm-hmm. So uh, Aikido, yeah, basically I, I went to school, um, you know, worked out and did Aikido. And, uh, and then later when I got motivated to, you know, go the route of prepping to go to the teams, I mean, that's just kind of all I did. So what, what, so how'd you find out about the teams? Just straight the movie Navy SEALs? <sighs> It, it played a huge part. Uh, so there's Leif Babin. He's just straight up like yeah. that's like a game changer for him. <laughs> Freaking Navy SEALs the movie. <laughs> uh, Hands else down, that? Some, well, someone else was on here. It was like Navy SEALs mm. and uh, Dave Burke, Top Gun, like a hundred percent. Yeah, good hundred percent. He's like, oh yeah, Top Gun came out. He's like, okay, that's what I'm gonna do. Yeah. So was that where you first heard of the Dames? <laughs> I don't know where I first heard of it, but I do recall I had a teacher in uh, eighth grade who uh, the rumor was he was a SEAL. Turned out not to be the case. And <laughs> I, I, I've learned many years later that he went to BUDS. Oh, okay. He didn't graduate BUDS. But I, I remember, I think that was the first time I, I heard of it and, you know, kind of piqued my interest. Um, you know, and then and then I, I start Aikido and Steven Seagal and, you know, under siege. Oh, that's right. He was a Navy SEAL cook. Navy SEAL cook. I'm like, man, I don't want to be a cook, but I kind of like, you know. I, mm-hmm. So I, I started looking into it more, and then I watched Navy SEALs the movie, and there's no turning back. Man. Oh, okay. Kind of the best, <laughs> best movie, hands down. It's good. I, I've, I've watched that dozens and dozens of times. And if it's on, you know, if I'm scrolling through the uh, – the channels it's on, I, I have to finish You're watching it. it. I'm watching it. Pay yeah. homage. Yep. Go to a recruiter, like and and Tyler. You guys, did you guys just sit down and watch it together and freaking just geek out and go like, let's go join the Navy? So it wasn't like a linear path to go to the team. So oh, you two weren't like on it together. We got there, but we weren't there immediately. Mm-hmm. So probably spent um, six months outside of. High school, um, just kind of mess around, no real designs to go into the military. Um, then I started looking into the SEAL thing and talking with Tyler. And Tyler was actually uh, looking to become a Marine. Mm-hmm. So we went to a, uh, like, Armed Forces Mall. You oh, know, yeah, like, yeah, like yeah. you go, like, uh, just like on a street corner. It wasn't mm-hmm. in an actual mall. Mm-hmm. But it was like, you know, Army, Navy, Air Force. There. Yep. And we went there um, just trying to talk to a couple of dudes to kind of fill it out. And I wanted to talk to the Navy guy. Um, shocker that, like, Navy guy was out for lunch. <laughs> Jack. But you know who, who wasn't out for lunch was Gunny. Yeah. Gunny came out, you know, saw two, two fit dudes standing outside. And I was like, hey, boys, come inside. And he had us up on the pull-up bar immediately, sure. cranking them out. He's firing us up and, you know, introduced us to Force Recon and, you know, put on a video and I walked out of there 100 percent thinking I'm going to be a Marine. Uh, I was going to say I don't know how you didn't sign the dotted line that day. I did. I, I actually, I so much so I went home, and I told my mom. Yeah, I, I was living with my mom at that mm-hmm. point. I'm like, Mom, I'm going to be a Marine, and she just <laughs> completely broke down. And 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 really because I hadn't talked much about the military up to uh-huh. that point, so it was like completely out of the blue. And she's like, Please don't, you know, just think about it, give it some time. Um, and yeah, so it, anyways, I, I did take some time. I was like, all right. Yeah, I woke up the next morning and the uh, Gunny's, you know, spell had kind of worn off. <laughs> and from that point on, I, I was like, man, I'm I'm all in. Uh, and then probably six months after that. All in for the teams? For the teams, yeah. But you uh, still hadn't talked to a recruiter yet? No. no. Okay. I, I ended up going back probably like six months later something like that. Um, by that point, Tyler had kind of gone on board. So we decided to, uh, to, to do that later. Yeah. And, and basically it was all in, you know, on the frogman path from, from that point. And then, uh, spent the last, at least the last year and a half, maybe even longer of just training. And Tyler and I trained, uh, like madmen. you know, I mean, for the better part of two years and trying to get ready. Trying to get ready. W- was that like that all that time? Was it because you were thinking, oh, this is going to be so hard. Like, I'm not ready yet. I need to get ready. Was it yeah. one of those things? Yeah, yeah, it, it was. And there wasn't a whole lot of information back then. As you know, I mean, there were books from Vietnam. Mm-hmm. Um, the Internet was just, you know, coming online. But, like, people weren't really using it that much. Yeah. Um, so 
yeah, I, I, I was trying to convince myself that I could do it. Mm-hmm. And I was trying to prepare myself. And uh, I did come across, uh, Tyler and I came across a couple of books um, that had like, man, I think it was a Stu Smith book. Mm-hmm. It was like a workout book. And then there was another book. So, you know, we gobbled those up and we created a, a training plan. I mean, this was like the first real exercise I'd had in my entire life of setting a goal and figuring out how to conquer that goal, mm-hmm. like invaluable stuff. But uh, yeah, I, I'd never ran more than than the uh, high school sanctioned mile. Mm-hmm. You know, like I, I ran lots of, uh, you know, yards and football, um, but had never ran more than a mile. So started running a lot, uh, worked our way up to 30 miles a week, was running uh, two, or sorry, uh, swimming two miles in the pool, which is miserable. Yeah. It's awful. That's like, a- like, uh, you like know. a 25 meter pool or something like that. Exactly. Ugh. Yeah. Started doing uh, pool skills stuff. So like we knew enough about buds yeah. to know what the requirements were. So you know, Tyler and I were drown proofing ourselves. We were uh, breath holding. I mean, doing looking back, especially when I got into training mm-hmm. and and you learn some stuff. It's like, man, just really dumb stuff. So uh, just for everyone that's listening, one up, one down, man. When you're working in the water, you're doing breath holds, you're doing drown proofing, anything like that. One guy on the top. The other guy can do breath holds. Don't be competing against each other because you you can you can definitely both pass out and die, and it's terrible. So one up, one down is the rule for that stuff. If you're listening and you're a freaking knuckleheaded young man between the ages of 13 and 24, and you're you and your buddy decide you're gonna go, and you're like, we need to do breath holds. Just one up, one down. That's the rule. And so you guys are running, you guys are swimming, you guys are doing drown proofing, and you're getting ready. What um. You finally go to the recruiter. Was it a hard process? Uh, no, that that was easy. Um, you know, basically, I got my my ticket to Meps, so went to Meps, and uh, that was up in Sacramento, and uh, you know, Meps is essentially I, I don't know what it stands for, but it's kind of military processing or medical type stuff. Military so. entry processing station, something like that. There you go. Yep. Yeah. yeah so did. I mean, it's like an all-day affair up mm-hmm. at early, and they're prodding you and poking you, doing you know every test known to man. Uh, and then at the end of that, you sign your paper. So I, I did all that, and I talked to the to the recruiter. And prior, sorry, backing up, I talked to the recruiter, and he put me in for the seal contract. And I think there was like a you know twenty five hundred dollar bonus. Yeah. Oh man. A and. Lot of money. Uh, so, so I had that contract going up there to MEPS and, you know, I, I do the whole uh, slew of tests there and I get to the point at the very end of that, you go to an office and then they go through your contract. And I was trying to get into the delayed entry program. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I didn't want to go. I, I was, I mean, even at this point I, I was in, but I was like hesitant to pull the trigger. So I was like. Because you thought you need more preparation? Yeah. Yeah, I did. So I was like, you know, I, I want like six, seven more months. Um, so anyways, I, I, I'm at the desk with the recruiter person, whatever that is, I'm going through the contract and I'm flipping through. I'm like, yep, yeah, good, good, solid, nailed that. Um, and then I get, you know, to the back and there's a signature. I'm like, man, I'm not seeing any seal shit in here. And you know, that it, it was a lady, uh, just told me like, yeah, you, uh, you failed an eye test. You don't qualify. Oh yeah. It, and I was like, what are you talking about? So, uh, I mean, I was devastated and I, I walked out of there. I, I didn't, I obviously didn't sign. I'm like, mm-hmm. yeah, I'm, I'm out, man. And I was like broken hearted. I'd spent the last, you know, 18 months. So what part of the eye test did you fail? So, you know, I spoke on this on another podcast a couple of months ago and I may have misspoke because my memory was fuzzy. I, I had to consult my mom on this, but she just said I, I failed the general eyesight. Like the, uh, I'm not sure if the requirements were 2020. Mm, I don't know. I have for, no idea. For seal back then. Um, but yeah, just, I failed the eye test. Mm-hmm. So I got kicked out and, you know, went back to my mom and uh, devastated. My, you know, my mom was kind of hesitant for me joining the military at all. Mm-hmm. She was kind of stoked. <laughs> <laughs> she was, but you know what? She actually helped me uh, I, I went and got a couple of doctor appointments on my own. I went to some uh, optometrist and I was determined to find a way in. So I ended up, I went to two separate optometrists until I got the one I liked mm-hmm. and got what I needed. And man, I guess that's all it takes for the Navy. Mm-hmm. I, I went with a uh, permission slip and I, I went back to MEPS. Do you wear glasses now? No. 
do you know what your vision is now? Uh, it's, I mean, it's not 2020. Like my left eye is a little bit weak. So I think oh. probably, you know, my, my left eye was probably a little bit lazy. I, I know there's a depth perception test yeah. that I've known kids that have failed and they, you don't, you can't go. And it's a weird thing. It's like one out of every hundred people or something. They can't see depth. And that's one of the few, like you can get just about any job in the Navy, but you can't be a SEAL. And it's a bummer. I was talking to one of the Master Chiefs that's like sort of in the team still. And he's actually trying to push for some of these things to change. Because you have kids that they fail the depth perception test, but they like played freaking baseball. You know what I mean? Where obviously you have depth perception if you can play baseball. And there's just a weird thing. I don't really remember the test, the depth. It's like dots. You're looking at dots or you're looking at a house or something. And and you have to see, is this dot in front of the house, behind the house? And some people just can do it and some people can't. So I don't know. Maybe you failed that thing. I, I don't know. But I went and I got whatever test they needed and... And and it got me in. So I did Tyler. What what happened to him when you failed? Was he like, yeah, you you suck. <laughs> yeah, he. I mean, he he carried on. And uh, what was interesting was we we ended up. I mean, I I got that resolved. I don't remember how long it took, but I got that resolved pretty quickly. I mean, I I wasn't pouting too mm-hmm. damn long on it. I went, and I'm not one to give up too easily. And yeah, I mean, that was like another. There's all these moments throughout your life. These like little you know, micro decisions, these character building moments, like I had an out, you know, like people had known at that point I was training to do this. Mm-hmm. Um, I could have taken that out. Um, but that was a case where I, I kept pushing. My mom helped me out. Um, and so I, I got back on the debt program and then Tyler and I were, were aligned on that. And, uh, but we ended up not coming in at the same time. He had kind of a medical issue that delayed him. Mm-hmm. Um, but man, that last, after I signed those papers, Training like a psycho? I, I trained like a psycho. I was still in school at the time, and uh, I had to explain this. So I ended up going to school later in where my transcripts were necessary. And there was this, like, this period where, you know, like good, good grades, you know, first two years in college or first year and a half, and then this semester um, where I just, man, I, I was just partying and just, you know, thinking like you're going to leave and never come back yeah. <laughs> type of thing, like just – just getting after it. And uh, so I, I was just training like a psycho, just partying, just trying to get it all in. Uh, still doing, you know, heavy Aikido at this point. Um, Beth and I had broken up. Like whenever I started going full psycho, mm-hmm. full psycho, like mm-hmm. towards the Navy. And it was like Navy. Yeah, Aikido, nothing else matters. Aikido, working out. You were like, it's best for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're like, I'm not, I might not come home. You just find another <laughs> full legends of the fall. <laughs> <laughs> no, man, it, th- this was, this was not me. This was like, she was done. She's like, yeah, you know, oh, I mean, yeah. she was over your dumb ass. Yeah, well, th- there was no time. Yeah. I mean, I was just working out nonstop and I, I'm just a psycho. man. Yeah. So, um, it's weird too. When you're going in the military, if you like, if you don't know people that were in the military, you just think you're, that's it. Like, I know when I joined the Navy, I was basically, like, saying goodbye to my friends for the last time. <laughs> I was like, you know, it's been nice knowing you. I'm out. Like, I'll never see you again. That's how I felt. Yeah. And part of that was kind of good. But I didn't have any. Like, if you grew up, let's say you grew up in San Diego, you'd see military people everywhere. And they'd be like, oh, like, you know, you go to school and they'd be like, oh, some dad that's there that's in uniform picking up his kids. You're like, oh, it's kind of a nor- – there's a normal side to it. If you – like, I grew up in a little town in Connecticut, dude. There's no military people. So I thought, well, there's no military people because when you join the military, you're gone. That's it. You're in some other world. So, yeah, you get that attitude like, it's over. You know, all your all your old friends, they're out. Your girlfriend's gone. doesn't matter. <laughs> Parents, good luck. Thank you. Goodbye. Yeah. I'm carrying on. <laughs> <laughs> I had a good buddy, and I'll, I'll call him out here, um, Kerry. He, he was one of my Aikido buddies, but uh, I had a heart-to-heart with him um, getting ready to leave, man, because I was having, like, second thoughts, man. You know, it, it's tough. Like, when you are – you've never done anything like that mm-hmm. as a kid or a young man. You haven't left your family. Um, it seems daunting, and just like what you said, man, it felt like I was never coming back. Like, I was never going to see my family again. 
um, because I, I was going to get shipped to some faraway land on, on clandestine missions. You know, that, I uh, felt that way too, but I was super pumped. <laughs> I was super stoked. I was like, you're just, I'm, I'm out. out of Connecticut. Yeah, I'm out. Yeah. I'll see y'all later. <laughs> Remember me in the setting sun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, just too many movies, man. Yeah. You know, <laughs> Jack. Yeah, so and, you had your heart to heart with Kerry. What'd you say? Uh, you know, man, he just kind of he just kind of fired me up. He just kind of pulled me out of it. You know, I mean, it was just that kind of weakness creeping in. I mean, just like everything else, when whenever you're about to do something really tough, you're gonna have those those thoughts, mm-hmm. and you're gonna have that. Uh, you know, I mean, it's it's that human survival instinct trying to <laughs> trying to pull you out of like the shit, you know? Um, but Jack. yeah. So I, I, you know, uh, obviously went through with it. My, uh, my dad took me to the drop off. Um, this was right after Y2K. Oh yeah. yeah. So we barely made it out of that one. <laughs> we barely made it out. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then I was shipped off man and off to, off to boot camp in, uh, Chicago in January. That Good was, times. Man, that, that was, ain't no Fresno. No, that is no Fresno. It was uh, epic snowfall. And really, I mean, I'd been up in the snow. We got mountains near Fresno, uh, but I'd never seen snow like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Boot camp, shock, regret, dismay, didn't yeah. care, uh, it, RCPO? Uh, yeah. Were you the RCPO? For like a week. Oh, okay. You got but fired. then they found out I had no rhythm because one of the rules, or not, not the rules, but uh, roles of the RCPO uh, the RPOC, right, yeah. is uh, you sing cadence. Yeah. And the Navy, they sing their cadence. I, I hope they don't do this anymore, but it's not like the Marine Corps where you, you have like a... An aggressive cadence. An aggressive yeah. cadence. You're like singing... Uh, yeah, I wasn't singing no cadence. No. Um, so I got demoted to Master at Arms. Yeah, you are probably a solid Master at Arms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, I was yeah. good. I was good. <laughs> Doing the... Uh, back then they had the... Uh, I don't even know what they call it, but the like SEAL... The, did you do the SEAL PT stuff in the morning at boot camp? No. Nope. It's good. They, they had like a, a small debt there, and then everyone who wanted to go to SEAL program, you go and you work out there. Because, I mean, basically, if you're a really fit dude, you're just getting out of shape yeah. in boot camp. So at least you're getting a little bit there, and then you get double rations at the chow hole. Yep. That's what you get. Um, but, yeah, boot camp, boot camp was easy. Um, you know, I, I was – I'm the antithesis of you in terms of like, you're a morning person, very yeah. clearly a morning person. <laughs> and uh, I grew, you know, to be better in the morning, but I was not a morning person. So, you know, one of the uh, nifty things that I did that I'll pass on to any prospects out there, you could use my trick here, was, uh, you know, we had to make our bed every morning, right? Mm-hmm. And cut those creases and yeah. all that stuff. And uh, one thing I would do is I, I would, make my bed and I would just never sleep in it. I slept. I think everyone did that. Okay. Oh, I did that too. Yeah, I think everyone well, did Well, I, I slept on top of the bed and then mm-hmm. I had this trick, you know, because they have Reveille, I think it's at four or something like that in the morning and I was just so tired. And I would post myself underneath the bed and uh, like I'm fixing the bed, you know, oh, so yeah, the yeah. feet are, are hanging out. <laughs> I just hang my hand like in the bed. I would just sleep for another 45 minutes <laughs> every day. Um, but yeah, glad to get out of boot camp, um, and then I went off to uh, ISA school. Well, check in Virginia then. Damn Nick. Yeah. Yep. Right on. Yeah. And so now you must have seen some team guys around there. No, you know, uh, no. no, I I was on a different side of base there. Um, I didn't have any real interactions. Um, I did at one point. So you know, in A school, I was teamed up with other guys who wanted to go to buds. Mm-hmm. And we were training together and getting back in shape. And uh, one guy was a, like, super nature tracker guy. Like, I'm not sure. If, have you heard of uh, Tom Brown? Yeah. Yeah. He was, like. He's one of those guys? One of those, like, disciples. Oh, like, legit from Tom Brown. Well. Or just into it. Really into it. Okay, but sure. probably, probably, like, legit. But uh, he had us, like, he took me in the swamps in Damneck. They have legit swamps yeah, yeah, there. Sure. And uh, swam with alligator gar. You know what those are? No. They're gnarly. They're like, uh, I mean, it's if an alligator and a fish. Yeah, had I was going to say, isn't it like some kind of weird fish alligator it, combo It's thing? a prehistoric fish that looks like an alligator. And they're, I mean, get like six feet long and they have teeth. Um, so you swam with these things? like Yeah. What, yeah. like they were in the same lake or swamp or you were 
interacting with them. <laughs> like, what's up? I was interacting with them. Did, this guy was like, uh, you know, what's the the Steve Irwin? Dude? Steve Irwin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, he of the damn neck he's, swamps. He's like petting the alligator guard. Oh damn! Right on. And uh, he's like, hey man, yeah, go ahead do it. I'm like, oh. did he go to Buds? This guy? They went to Buds. I everyone I went with Buds with uh, didn't end up. Taken there, at, at least in my my yeah, class. Yeah, that alligator gar shit only goes so far, homie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there there were uh, I think there were like four or five of us great guys. Um, you know, definitely would like to get back in touch with some of those dudes. So, so you show up to buds, and how's that welcome aboard? Uh, yeah, it was good. I I went on. Uh, I took a month of leave from a school, mm-hmm. so that was like a couple months there. And during my leave, uh, I went water skiing and now I'm not a doctor, but knowing because I've had these injuries since Mm -hmm. pretty sure I tore my meniscus and I showed up to buds, you know, just like in a bad spot with my knee. Um, and it wasn't like, you know, I was malingering and not doing shit. I just, I was in pain. So, um, but I I had a little while to class up, had, had a few months there and kind of got through that or, you know, it, it got you know, to a serviceable point um, and ended up classing up with class 233. And this is uh, in, you know, July. Well, I, I, I guess we classed up in October of 2000. October of 2000, you class up. Chris in that class, 233? Uh, he was for a little, he graduated with that class, but he started, I think he started in a 230 or 31 mm-hmm. and he rolled back. So after Hell Week, he rolled into my class, and then uh, I ended up perforating my eardrum in second phase, uh, doing the tower drops. Ooh. Yeah, ear exploded underwater, and then, so I got rolled out of that class mm-hmm. into two, three, four. How was, so first phase, you kick off first phase. What's going on? Is it hard for you? Are you feeling like, you, was your knee healed enough? Anything kick you in the ass? Uh, you know, man, I felt like I felt like I excelled in first phase. So like I, I was very well prepared for that. Everything that I did, that Tyler and I did, it, it paid off, man. I was mean, was Tyler with you? No, no. Was he behind you, or ahead of you? He was behind. Okay. Yeah, he was a couple of classes behind. But uh, I mean, we had done so much prep in that that uh, you know, I I was very very prepared. The one thing you really can't prepare for unless you do it is running in soft sand. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, man, I, I was, I, I was a good runner and yeah, I say that again with a lot of humility compared to like real runners, but right. for a 200 pound man, yep. I was a good runner. Um, swimming was kind of like, was not my thing. Mm-hmm. So I, I'd done a lot of swimming. I, but for whatever reason, you know, in the ocean, uh, I was a bad guider. <laughs> and so, you know, a two nautical mile ocean swim was probably like two and a half miles. And yeah. like, it, that was just, I survived every single swim just barely just seconds away from just failure. just seconds away and it was like you know i was i was giving everything that i had every single swim um but past all the other tests like uh you know all the the underwater stuff uh I, we had all done that man so like you know when you talk about the role that training plays in in preparation uh i felt like i had a leg up i mean i, I had done the 50 meter underwater on my own mm-hmm. um in fact Tyler and I both, after a night of uh, partying, if you will, um, both went to the pool straight after that. I I did, I don't know, probably 60 underwater. He did like, he did full 75, mm-hmm. um, you know. But yeah, we, we'd done all that stuff, uh, very prepared. First phase, you know, thought I did pretty well there. Um, in Hell Week, I was like in the rock star boat crew for a bit. Mm-hmm. And then I found myself... Uh, which you might get a kick out of this, but uh, cause I mean, I'm not like a short dude, mm-hmm. like an average height guy. But yeah, what are you, 5'11"? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I found myself in the Smurf crew. How? Man, I guess the, uh, with 233, they were like a bunch of giants. Okay. And uh, So it, you weren't like the towering over the other Smurfs? Cause normally like the Smurfs are like 5'5", five, 5'6", five, five, maybe? I was towering. Yeah, okay, so you're like boat full on head yeah yeah so so come wednesday night you know we're we're sitting there and i'm just like you know we've won like every race up to this point we're just like cruising man and then they're doing like all right get in a height line and they set us up and they're counting i'm kind of looking around and i'm like looking to my left i'm like oh shit (laughs) there's only six guys to the left of me and sure enough uh i I got put in the smurf crew for the last last part of hell weekend that was absolutely brutal Mm -hmm. so um now that i'm you know 
here with your audience. I'll just apologize for presumably what all the weird noises I was making. You know, it's just that <laughs> boat was crushing my neck. <laughs> it's freaking gnarly. I could hear the if you take two rocks and you rub them together, I could hear my neck doing that during Hell Week. And like li- literally that noise, I was like, mm, this is fucking probably not good. Um, so yeah, be careful of that. Uh, so then you, you make it through Hell Week. Anything crazy happen in Hell Week? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I guess uh, I have a good little story. I mean, this is just like one of many of where I'm just doing kind of stupid shit and other people are paying the consequences. But uh, we were doing a, a drill to where you're like uh, – I'm not sure if it's like a kind of like escape and evasion. I mean, basically, you're you're trying to go undetected from the instructor staff. Mm-hmm. And you're like crawling on the O course, yeah. and for like a mile or something yeah. like that. And my my swim buddy and I were like really into it. I mean, we're just like we're not going to get caught. And you know, they have a bunch of wreckage and stuff out on the O course, and we found a little piece of wreckage. You know, because they have instructors coming with spotlights and doing all that. And so you know, this guy's you know, instructor's coming in, and we're like, all right, you know, dig in, and we dig into the sand in this like wreckage. And then I wake up like an hour and a half later because we just passed out. Ooh. Because like if you in Hell Week, if you stop, yeah, yeah, if you stop for any amount of time, like you're just toast. You're out. So um, they they you know at this point they'd gone full admin. Oh. Light, lights are on. They're beating the class right, and it's like you know they're they're calling out our names, and we come to, and it's like oh shit, <laughs> <laughs> sorry guys. <laughs> Jack. But no, get, get through Hell Week all right in one piece. Um, and then went into second phase. And uh, did, did uh, was there anyone that shocked you that they quit? Any of these like yeah. D1 athletes and all that? Exactly that. Yeah. What did you say? We had a, our in two through three, our OIC was a, uh, I think he played, I think he was a quarterback for Notre Dame. Uh, don't don't remember that guy's name, but he was a big hulking dude. I mean, just like Superman looking guy. And uh, yeah, he he went, and then there were some guys, you know, guys I went with. Uh, Isn't that freaking crazy? Yeah, you're the freaking quarterback at Notre Dame. You're like, you know what? I'm gonna be a seal. And you tell all your friends, and you tell your mom and dad, and you tell your girlfriend, and you show up, and you freaking quit. Yeah, that's wild. There were other guys, uh, you know, the ones that stand out to me, uh, a couple loudmouths. Mm-hmm. You know, these are the guys that are policing everyone up, mm-hmm. you know, because guys aren't squared away and yeah. not doing the right thing. And then in Hell Week, you see, you know, you got the uh, the car lights, you know, looking at you and you're in the surf and then like you're just seeing their silhouette yeah. kind of going away. It's like, damn. Yeah, there's this whole thing. I did a few podcasts about the psychology of military incompetence and it's this whole thing about, it's written by a guy that was in World War II who became a psychologist, but... He like talks about how people that are like super orderly and and like highly authoritarian kind of things that you're talking about, like, hey, you need to square yourself away. They like things to be followed. And then you get into Hell Week and it's just like total mayhem and their brains can't handle it. And they just quit. That's it. Game over. Yeah. I, I mean, for me, um, you know, people always ask when whenever, you know, you're talking to a SEAL for the first time, it's like it's going to happen within the first two minutes is, did you ever think about quitting? And I can honestly say, no. Yeah, me neither. I hear guys like, everyone thinks about quitting. I'm like, no, 100%. Not, I, not just me. I know all kinds of guys that didn't think yeah. about quitting. I, I guess maybe a lot of guys do, but a lot of guys don't. Look, it, if nothing else, I mean, even aside from like, you know, I, I want to do this job and whatever, I mean, just the, uh, you know, not wanting to let people down and like you said, you're going to do something, not mm-hmm. doing it, like all those reasons there's just no way, man. Yeah. yeah. It's just not happening. Nope. So then you go from the, you, you make it through hell week. Now it's first, uh, second phase diving and what you hurt your eardrum. Is that what you said? I did. Yeah. So we had done the, uh, we had that this since decommissioned it. I mean, the teams have moved, uh, all that stuff, but, um, they had a tower, the 50 foot tower. And we used to work in that, that, that thing was daunting, man. Mm-hmm. So we did some work in that in first phase and, and no issues like went down and, tied some knots and then in second phase um, they're building up your competence you know for all the underwater stuff that we're do- doing in second phase so they had a couple of different events and one of them I think I think it was just called bottom drops where you just go down to the bottom and uh, I had a cold 
And I started to go down and I made it like 20 feet and I'm trying to like Valsalva, you know, to equalize the pressure in my ears and it's not happening. I'm like, well, I have to keep going down. Just keep going, bro. Keep going. And then that underwater explosion happened in, in my head and I got vertigo and I was like, all right, I'm going back up and went back up. And then, uh, yeah, sure enough, I perforated my eardrum, pulled me out of that class and, uh, man, that two, three, three, those guys were just a bunch of rock stars and, uh. Yeah, so it definitely was hard leaving those guys. But and so, so would you become friends with Chris at this point? Uh, not really. Not just so you guys just knew each other. Yeah, but no, yeah, no. and it, it was short. I mean, it was only uh, I don't know how many weeks after Hell Week, but Chris rolled in to two, three, three after Hell Week, and then um, that evolution was like the second week of first of, of second okay. phase. Yeah. yeah, and just the reason I bring that up because I know you guys became. Uh, you know, super close and everything. And when we were together, you guys were freaking. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you guys were all tight. Yeah, man. He um, he was actually part of the reason him and one other dude um, who were in that class. So another guy rolled in when Chris rolled in, ended up being in Charlie Platoon. And mm-hmm. those two guys are the reason why I found my way to still team three Charlie. Sure, okay. yeah. So you get rolled and now you're in two, three, four. Yeah, and buddy. this is the one with the freaking documentary. Yeah, man. So what was that like? It was wild. It was, uh, you know, it's such a difference. Uh, 233, I mean, we were just like, we couldn't do anything right. We were just getting beat down. Uh, and 234 had a lot of scrutiny on it because there were cameras there. So it was like, it was a different vibe, mm-hmm. you know, because cameras were rolling. So it's like, all right, guys, we can't can't be doing that <laughs> on camera. Um but but the guys were were amazing. Uh, they were a really small group, so I don't remember how many guys they had rolling out of Hell Week, but it's like twenty or something like that. Really really small class, and we ended up graduating with twenty five. Um, but I mean, a lot of great mugs there. Uh, you know, dudes I still keep in touch with. Great guys, and uh, but you know, it's tough anytime you're going into a class like that. That you know, small group that's really tight. You know, it took a little while mm-hmm. to kind of. How much were the cameras there? A lot. No kidding. A lot. Yeah. They they found me. They seemed to find me like uh, during every moment of weakness I had. Mm, it's all documented. It's all documented. Like none of the hero shit. Uh, now uh, I'm going to go watch it, bro. No, no, you're not. It, it, it's, <laughs> oh, no, I am. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to send you screenshots. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> the only like hero shot they, they have of me is in the intros. I'm doing like this pirouette and then I uh, just looking just. Just looking badass. Just looking badass, man. But you know, they, they got me. It's like uh like all my low moments. They got me, you know, struggling in push ups and uh they got me doing a dive soup uh check, rolling up uh with my oxygen or sorry, my, my air bottles off. <laughs> so I get beat for that. And then uh <laughs> the only other time like I, I passed uh I passed all these like water tests first time every time, you know, and anyone who does that says that with a certain amount of pride. Um, but you know, I had issues during the Drager buddy breathing. Mm-hmm. So wait, you got through pool week all first time, every time, including pool comp. Yep. Oh, so they really did have cameras flowing the whole time. Oh, come on. I'm man. just saying, no. bro. I mean, <laughs> you know, though I, I, I do have to clear there and I don't want to dime him out here, but on the video, they mistaked, uh, me for someone else as failing pool comp. So if you look closely, they have like a quad screen of like, OC, whatever it is. Uh, uh-huh. And uh, and it shows someone getting pulled up from the surface, and you can very clearly see it's not me, but it says Holland. Oh, like they, they were just determined to uh, make it look like you failed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so uh, you know, Drager buddy breathing. They they got me uh, coming up to the surface, so I, I was the you know the the top buddy, and and you're passing a rig around uh-huh. basically, Aaron. Uh, yeah, he was kicking it out, and I think the hoses got kinked, and mm-hmm. uh, homeboy wasn't getting no air up top. Mm-hmm. So that world was like you know. Shrinking down, starting to fade. Starting to fade. So I, I came up, and they got that on video. You know, me on oxygen. So it's just like, yeah. Damn, bro. Documented. Yeah, but luckily, no one will ever see that after this. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> luckily, they won't. Just, PID just dime you. myself out. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and so now you go into third phase. All good there. No factor. Good times at SCI. Yeah, man. Good times. You know, I had uh, like one issue. I don't know what it was. Uh, yeah, I grew up shooting. Like my dad you know, used to take me to the range a lot, um, but I had like a hard time crawling like on rifles, mm. you know. So it's like 
that was one of those moments. Anytime I, I hadn't failed anything up to that point. So, you know, in the teams, you start to fail something. You get uh, the pressure ramps up mm-hmm. really quick. And I, I personally think the gun was shot out. You know, I'll, I'll stick with that story. But, uh, yeah, aside from that, got through that. Uh, went to went to SQT after that. Got to do airborne school. You know, I, I felt like I was – I'm definitely not the old guard. Like, you're, you're the old, you know, 90s frogman mm-hmm. old guard. You know, guys that raised people like myself. But I feel like I got, a, you know, the tail end of it in terms of, like, some of those experiences. So, you know, went to, uh, to airborne school mm-hmm. in Georgia. Where were you at? When September 11th happens, because you must have been in training still. Were you in SQT or were you in Buds? Yeah, no, I was in SQT. Um, I graduated in uh, June of 2001, Buds, and we were in SQT um, getting close to the end there. And uh, we were out at Nyland, and we were actually doing some Claymore ambush stuff, like old school Vietnam shit. Mm-hmm. And it was one of those overnight evolutions. Mm-hmm. So go out there. Um, do that basically until sunup. So we were cruising back to the compound, made it back 6 a.m., you know, 6.15, 6.18. Uh, you know, the news was on. The first tower had been hit. And, you know, as everyone knows at that point, no one really knew what was going on. Uh, you know, we kind of grabbed breakfast. We're all glued to the screens. And then the you know, second tower hit, man. And it was it was very clear at that point, you know, what our career mm-hmm. was going to entail after that. It was clear to you that at that point, even in SQT, you were like, oh, it's on. So much so that uh, we actually had, um, we had a guy in our class quit on, on 9-12. Damn. Yeah. I I mean, it, everyone knew. Like, we, we didn't know what, yeah, to what, what extent, it was yeah. going to look like. But, I mean, it's like, shit, you, you know that we're going to, we're going to be in there somewhere getting after it. You had a guy quit. Yeah. On nine twelve, you know what, man? From SQT, I, good on him. There's yeah. a there's a lot of guys. I, I want to say a lot. Um, some guys go in for the wrong reasons, mm-hmm. you know, and they'll they'll do a pump, they'll get out, and and when you're in a non wartime situation, all good, no big, all deal. good, yeah. no harm, no foul, man. But you know, you know, you got pending combat, mm-hmm. and uh, you could be a liability if you're not if you're not all in. So this guy wasn't all in, and. Uh, yeah, so that was uh, – I ended up – I checked into SEAL Team 3 two months later. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's one of those things. I've I've had that conversation with a few people over the years. Uh, the first time I had it, I was talking to some woman who wanted me to meet with her, and and her son wanted to be a SEAL type thing, and she was like, oh, I'd really like to meet. And I was, he was like a friend of a friend of a friend. So I was like, yeah, this was like probably 10 years ago. And I was like, okay, yeah. And I meet with – the kid's like all – fired up and stuff and I can do this many pull-ups and I have this swim time and I blah 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 and I was like do you want to kill people and are you ready to die and it was like both him and the mom were kind of like they hadn't even they haven't they hadn't considered that part of the job you know what I mean and that is that is actually the job the job is you're gonna kill people and you're you're gonna put be in harm's way for you and your friends to get wounded and killed that's what the job is that's actually what the job is everything else is is whatever it's training it's you know, getting ready, but the actual job is you kill people and you're going to be in a position where you and your friends could get wounded and killed. And if that's not in the front of, of your mind, it's not a good job for you. You know, any other reason, any other thing, any other f- fantasy or vision that you might have, that's not what the job is. The job is you're going to kill people and you're going to be in a situation where you and your friends can get killed or wounded. And that's the way it is. So, yeah, probably a good call for that guy to freaking bail yeah no doubt at that juncture um so it was team three and wh- where wh- when you got to team three did you did you go into a workup was did you get thrown into a platoon how'd that go down yeah uh i showed up at the end of the pro dev period so that was november i think we were okay. uh starting work up you know i don't know april of the following year Um, So it it was kind of junk time, you know, so it was kind of getting into the holidays. We we went right on a trip like Mm -hmm. within, I think of me, uh, my first week being there, we went on a trip um, up in central California, Mm -hmm. along the coast, Um, may or may not have gotten into some trouble up there, which got some people disbanded from a whole city. Um, Damn. 
I'm trying to think of what this is. So this is 2001. The uh, slow incident. Oh, was that you guys? Yeah. Well, there's a couple slow incidents along. Yeah, the yeah, way. yeah, yeah, yeah. There were several. There, there were. There was, there was one where the guys went up and got in a fight with like Tim Kennedy and a bunch of Chuck Liddell, Chuck yeah. Liddell, yeah, yeah, yeah. and a bunch of yeah. actual yeah. UFC guys. Yeah. I I take it back. We didn't get people disbanded, but we started. We opened up, you know, mm-hmm. the, the the can of worms. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I, I mean that that was like, you know, first trip. Welcome to the teams. Yeah, and. Yeah, man, we were rocking and rolling. We we kicked off uh, work up, and then yeah, CQC was our first block. And and so now you're with Chris. We are. Yeah. So this is Chris Kyle. Chris Kyle's in 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 this platoon. Is Jeremy in there too? He is. Yep. Damn. Okay. Yeah. So, just you're a new guy. What's it, you know? So I talked about like, oh, your job is to uh, kill people and be in positions. Let me tell you about the other part of the job. When you're a new guy, an enlisted guy in the SEAL teams, it's a freaking blue collar job, right? You're building pallets, you're moving gear, you're fixing gear, you're fixing motors, you're cleaning gear, you're cleaning motors. It's a, it's like a blue collar, hard work, freaking job. That's what it is. And that's what you're doing. When you're a new guy, you're getting like extra, <laughs> extra of that. Uh, what what did you get? What was your job in the platoon? Pig gunner? Yeah. Straight up. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was like no doubt. Uh I think at one point they tested me on the radio and they're like, nope, <laughs> not a chance. Yeah. Can you carry heavy things? I'm like, yeah, I, I can probably do that. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah. So I was a dub gunner and you know, no quals at all. And I was thrown in uh, first Lieutenant uh, East coast calls it engineering. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, man. And that was like boats and motors. And uh, I was also uh, Chris and I were, both ISs, intelligence specialists. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we were in the intel department as well. Um, but yeah, man. A lot of responsibilities in there for his <laughs> two new guys. <laughs> intel yeah. department guys like, get a map. <laughs> yeah, you have to get the maps and you have to get, you know, chem lights and yeah, it's a very tough job. Yeah, you could you could sell that sounding so cool like well, we were in the, in, in the intel department. Like, I can imagine you and Chris as new guys in the quote intel department. It's like laminate these maps, you freaking meatballs. Yep, yeah, that was it. <laughs> There was no Jason Bourne going on there. No, no, none of that. No, no Tom Clancy <laughs> stuff either. And so you guys, you guys go through your workup. How's the workup? It was good. It was good. You know, I, that was the first time I felt like I'd kind of gone through buds. You know, relatively unscathed. But you feel the pressure as a new guy. Did you get your trident at the end of SQT? I was one of the last guys to get it at the SEAL team. Okay, so you showed up, new guy, no new guy. trident. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. For. Uh, Man, I want to say the better part of a of a year. Mm-hmm. So yeah, walking around without that trident and earning it and studying for my board. Mm-hmm. Back then we had a trident board, yep. and and trying to learn. I mean, that's what you're trying to do as a new guy. You you think you know at, at that point. Uh, you think you know everything. Mm-hmm. Coming from buds, SQT, you're like, man, I am just I'm ready to rock, ready to run and gun. And you show up to a SEAL team to a platoon, and you're like. I don't know anything at all. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like such an, it, SQT has gotten so much better. Um, and the new guys are way better prepared than we were back in yeah. the day. But, you know, we had no exposure to CQC, for example, uh, close quarters combat um, until my first platoon. So that was like drinking through, a, mm-hmm. you know, fire hose and, uh, you know, throwing shots and like you're getting counseled. I'm like, you know, holy shit, man. Like mm-hmm. I'm going to get booted from the teams. So, they, no, I, they kind of want you to think that too. I mean, at least they used to. They used to like want you to think you're probably going to get shit canned. Like that was always kind of a little bit, little bit over your head of like, you, you don't freaking, you throw another shot, you're freaking out of here. You're like, what the, f-? you know, <laughs> that was a freaking 50, 50 yard shot with a shotgun slug, dude. That's a hard <laughs> shot, bro. And they're like, we, we got to make these. You're like, can okay, I so see you do it? You shut up, new guy. <laughs> yeah, that, that's it, man. I mean, it's a, uh, you know, and that that's the mindset that you want to have. That's you want guys, you know, not not to be scared to fail, man. But I mean, it, it matters, and like every, everything is con- consequential. Everything matters, and you're all in, like every second. Like there's no there's no mailing it in, no. you know. And so also at this point, like you guys must have known you're going to war. I mean, it's like a different workup than it was four months ago because four months ago and I did a bunch of workups where there's no war going on and look you take it seriously you do your best and 
But it's always like there's a chance, there's some slim chance that you're going to get the big mission of whatever that might be. Yep. But for you guys, must have been thinking, oh, we're 100% going to war. For sure. So we had had guys from Team 3 that had already been to Afghanistan. So, I mean, we, we knew we were getting in something. You know, Iraq hadn't kicked off yet. Um, but, yeah, I, there was a different mindset. Now, I, I can't speak to what the teams were prior, but there was a, a certain focus and a certain kind of eminence about what we were doing. So, you know, I was just trying to keep up, man, and making all the usual dumb guy, you know, dumb new guy mistakes and uh, trying to overcome those and, and trying to – learn the job and you know i seem to you know always find myself in some sort of trouble uh you know i just damn near drowned a couple times as a new guy how'd you drown as a new guy man i i don't do well with like you know a half inch cord underwater oh, stuff yeah. like that so like you know we were <laughs> like a freaking half inch half inch nylon freaking <laughs> magnet you are <laughs> dude so you know i mean like we were uh as a new guy you're carrying all this shit oh, yeah, that's right. and so and if you have a propensity to carry more shit then you just carry more stuff so yeah we're doing dives i'm carrying a bunch of shit and uh we were diving on a rig in the open ocean and uh i got caught up you know underneath and had to abandon my rig Damn, dude. Get up to Did the you service. do a free, sim, free swimmer ascent? Yeah, it, it was. Real? Uh, That's amazing. <laughs> oh, my God. So what was kind of funny about that was, uh, I mean, the guys were up at the surface at that point. So they, they had already gone up uh, in a controlled manner like you're supposed to do. And um, <laughs> I was kind of stuck down there. And the guys running the dive are kind of freaking out a little bit. And, you know, you have limited visibility. And so you know, everyone's kind of like looking down, trying to figure out what to do with me. And then uh, I kind of popped up and I, I'd kind of floated like behind the group. And uh, not sure if you've seen the uh, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Uh, when, when, sure when, have, when Indy but... goes over the cliff and they're kind of like all looking over the cliff like like he's perished. So oh, it was kind of like that moment where <laughs> you know, I kind of cruise up and, you know, with the group and like, hey, what's going on, guys? <laughs> <laughs> It's like, oh, there you are. Was your rig beanered in down below on yeah. the line or whatever? Yeah, 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 yeah. So that that was one time. The uh, other time we were doing uh, a sub-op uh, during the big exercise uh, off the California coast and uh, working with boats off of the submarines. And uh, I was the only one in, in a boat, in our inflatable boat, and it capsized. And I saw the whole side of a submarine, like way, way too much of a submarine that you should ever see because the sea state was like gnarly. Mm. So it flipped the boat and I was like trapped under there. It felt, it felt like minutes. I'm sure it was like only 10 seconds, but uh, I popped up out of that. My eyeballs were huge, you know? So that, that was just like how my first platoon went, yeah. you know, it was just kind of like always, uh, always on the wrong side of things. And uh, a lot of learning. I had some great older guys, uh, you know, my, my first Louis uh, C. Daddy was an amazing, he, he's an amazing guy, but he he raised me right, um, you know, taught me kind of, you know, I, it didn't take as a new guy, but taught me everything that I knew. Um, just a really solid guy, some great operators there. Um, but yeah, first platoon was all figuring it out. And then eventually we uh, we, we deployed and found ourselves uh, over in Kuwait. When did you get there? So the war hasn't kicked off yet. No, but we're there. It's staged. Yeah, it's uh, you know, all the stuff is going on in the news, and we don't know what's going on, but it feels like it's it's going to be happening. So we were there in late 2002. Mm -hmm. um, ended up doing, uh, I guess it was supporting UN sanctions. Mm -hmm. So doing shipboardings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we did a shit ton of those, and uh, man, that's just good old school frogman pirate yeah, shit, man. Just running around the what do they call it? The nag. Do you remember that term? Yeah, the, the Northern Arabian Gulf. The sag and the nag. The sag and the nag. Yeah, running yeah. around the nag and the sag in our boats and helicopters, other boats, and going and hitting ships and taking them down and getting control of them. Yep. So, uh, you know, we did that for for a few months, and then uh, winter set in, and then things were starting to build for Iraq, and we were starting to, you know, the U.S. had a plan at that point. And we were starting to train, and uh, we had been nominated as the Desert Patrol Vehicle Platoon, the, the Mad Max Platoon. The DB, DPVs. So these are 
they're they're dune buggies. They're yep. like high speed dune buggies that people drive around out at Glamis, and there's some kind of racing protocol with those things. There's like a whole group that races like those kind of vehicles, but we had them in the SEAL teams for a while. We don't have them anymore. <laughs> we don't have them anymore because for a bunch of reasons. The number one reason is they're they're a racing vehicle, which means they have high standards and very tight tolerances for the way they function and the way they're built, and which means they're gonna you put them in very tough situations, they're they're gonna have problems. And so they were they were generally speaking pretty problematic in terms of their mechanical stability. They broke down a lot. And then on top of that, if you break down anywhere in the world and you need, let's say, a tire or a gasket or a freaking carburetor or whatever you might need, you can't get it. I guess they yep. weren't carburetor, they're fuel injector. But if you needed a part for those things, you, you couldn't get it. Whereas another vehicle such as a Humvee, you could you get any part anywhere, take it from another one. Like they were just so, there's Humvees everywhere in the military. And so it'd be, it'd be almost like if we used weapons with a different type of ammunition. You know, like, where are you going to get your ammo from? So that was kind of the deal with the DPVs. They looked freaking cool. They, they always yeah. put them in highlight Navy SEAL videos. They put those DPVs everywhere. But I'll tell you what, you, you want to see some eyeballs. You, you know, rolling onto a base on an Army compound, and, yeah, you look like rock stars, man. Yeah. They don't know, like, like everything you said, the upkeep on those things and uh, the capabilities when you weigh them down. Yeah, 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 right. They, yeah that's right. They make them super heavy because they're made to store. They're not like four-wheel drive. They're not four-wheel drive, so they, they're made to be light and float over the sand. And yep. once you weight them down with a bunch of team guys and a bunch of gear and a bunch of rockets and a bunch of ammo, like they just sink in the sand and mud and they just get stuck. Yeah, man. <laughs> and you guys were designated the DPV platoon. Oh, yeah. Yep. And then you had a plan of what you guys were going to execute when the war kicked off. Yeah, so uh, we ended up being part of the uh, you know kind of strategic mission to to invade iraq so mm-hmm. we we were a part of that um securing some of the the onshore sites there and uh that was that was just a that was a wild kind of week leading up to that mm-hmm. because we were on i mean just like uh you know scud and gas alert notice so we were in mop gear which is the chem bio gear and in kuwait you know the uh you know, U.S. had amassed kind of all the troops for the invasion. Uh, it was pretty clear that this thing was imminent, and Iraq was launching, you know, rockets or scuds or, you know, whatever they were towards us, and we were constantly under the threat of, like, you know, getting gassed. So walk around in gas mask and, and getting jocked up, like, all the time. So uh, leading up to the – man, I have to look at the dates. I feel like the invasion happened on the 21st. Um doesn't matter. Someone else can fact check it. But anyway, so leading up to that night, you know, we were kind of in mop gear the entire night. And then we got the, the call, like it's it's go time. So we uh, we got in the, the DPVs and loaded these things in, uh, in CH-53, the, the C stallion. And, and we cruised into Iraq, man. And that was uh, that, you know, there were a couple times in my career, out of all the things I did, um, where I just felt that that pucker factor, and going into, you know, uh, Iraqi national territory, you know, uh, they had they had anti air systems and all yeah. that shit, and uh, you know we were trying to do things to mitigate that, but I was a new guy, you know, in my mop gear, uh, in body armor, strapped in a gunner seat, in a racing harness, with four inches of room on either side in my, in my roll cage. And then the, uh, the DBV was strapped into the 53 with three inches of room on both sides, uh, you know, to the walls in the pitch black dark and we're, and, and the call comes over the radio, you know, whatever, uh, you know, whatever code word they, they passed over. I mean, mm-hmm. like we've crashed or we've, we've crossed the, uh, the national territory line there. And then, they're throwing chief, yanking and banking, and I, I don't know if we were taking anti-air fire. Someone else could. It, it felt like that because we were doing hard moves, and I just had the realization, man, that's like, like if we get hit, I'm just I'm gone. I mean, there's no surviving this. There's no, you know, egressing and swimming out like 
just toast. Yeah, and it's complete unknown. Um, the first Gulf War that went down, it was like I was watching the news, and they're like, oh, there's going to be 40,000 casualties in the first 24 hours or 48 hours, something like this. And you just, it, the, the unknown is way worse than the known. And so, like, that's a perfect example. Like, we hadn't, you know, you fast forward three months, even if you fast forward like four days, you're like, oh, okay, they, they don't really have the capability that they, we thought they may have had. But you're a freaking a new guy. What you just described, being in that DPV strapped into that gunner seat inside of a 53, when that thing is strapped in there, you are doomed. Like, doomed. doomed. This thing, even if that thing successfully crash landed and was on fire, you're never getting out. Like, you are you are freaking dead. So, I like to connect things. You know, I'm a big, like, movie buff guy and uh, in shows and, and all that. And uh, Band of Brothers had come out prior to that deployment. And I'm not sure if, if you've seen that oh, and, yeah. and, and you recall. Do you recall yeah. the, the scene to where they're jumping out? Yeah, yeah. Like, that, that that's is how what, you felt. That's how I felt. Yeah is we're getting shot at like get me the hell out of here i want to get on ground yeah. like now i that's my overwhelming feeling as a military human like anytime i'm i'm in a aircraft airplane helicopter uh vehicle tank bradley humvee i don't like it I want to be on the ground. I want to be on my feet. I want to be with my platoon. Like that's it. That's what I, I'm just the whole time. I'm just waiting to, so I can be on my feet. Cause then I feel like we can control what, what's like, what's going to happen to us. Yep. All that other stuff is just in the hands of fate. And it's not a good feeling for me. It was never a good feeling. Yeah. Yeah. No and doubt, the, man. The one that you just described is a prob. I think that's a worse feeling than I ever had in any of those situations. Like I've flown into places, driven into places. I, what you just described, I never had that feeling before. I'm trying to think if I have. No, I've never had it that bad before. There's been a couple times like going into a couple places where I was like, oh, we're going to get IED'd, but not quite. I, th I always feel I, I always feel like someone else is going to get IED'd. And even if I get IED'd, I'm going to be okay. I'm going to get out and do awesome kick ass right that's in my little stupid brain but if you're in a helicopter that's not happening if you're strapped into a helicopter if you're strapped into a dpv in a helicopter that's strapped into the helicopter bro good times uh, yeah. so uh and and you know going back I, they were expecting casualties you know mm -hmm. i mean you don't know what you don't know uh we hadn't fought in a major conflict i mean they were you know a year into afghanistan that was a much different war um you know we're fighting a country here um, so I really had no clue kind of what we were getting into. And so, yeah, like all that shit's running through your mind and, and having no, like, you know, we'd done a bunch of shipboardings and stuff like that, but having no missions under your belt, I mean, it's just your mind running wild. Mm -hmm. And what was the mission by the way? So what'd you guys do? You guys hit the ground, launch the DPVs. What are you guys going to do? Basically set security around a facility. Mm -hmm. That that was it. Uh, we were working in conjunction with the Royal Marines and some other folks, um, and it ended up being, I mean, basically, I won't say a soft target. I mean, there are a lot of guys there, but the, uh, the cast that happened prior, I mean, just softened kind of all those defenses. So we went in and yeah, it's pretty, pretty simple mission actually. Dude surrendering dudes dead. What'd you find? Both. Both. Yeah. Yeah. We didn't, uh, in, in the morning, like we didn't have any interactions. Uh, you know, we were kind of in the peripheries. Uh, some of the Royal Marines were, were getting after it and then, uh, the sun came up and there was carnage mm -hmm. you know uh yeah i mean a lot of guys got uh the, the iraqis uh just got handled and then um yeah there were some that had given up and you know were being kind of detained and, and and worked there and uh and then we started cruising around uh you know i mean again we were figuring stuff out mm -hmm. and and not just like the SEAL teams, but yeah, you know, the, we, we, we collectively, the, the, the collective we. So we were just kind of like cruising around and we just kind of cruise around without a mission a little bit. And, uh, you know, for all the talk that's gone on for the reasons why we went into Iraq, I'll, I'll just tell you this because I have the pictures to prove it is those dudes. And I'm not talking the Iraqi soldiers, but the people there were stoked to see us there. I mean, they were waving along the roads, you know, they felt liberated. So for, you know, for whatever that's worth, that's what happened. Mm -hmm. And how long did you spend uh, you know, on the ground? Uh, we were there, 
I think a couple days, you know, it's kind of fuzzy there. And then we uh, went back to Kuwait, kind of refitted, and then we got launched back out to a place called Nazaria for a little bit. Um, and just kind of doing recce shit, like not not doing any sexy type DA stuff. That still in the DPVs. Still in the DPVs. Yeah, we did a uh, an SR on the um, the Shat al Arab mm-hmm. waterway yeah, that yeah. separates uh, you know Iran from Iraq. Mm-hmm. Did that, and that was that was kind of that deployment, you know. And then uh, went back home. Did it seem like that the war was going to be over pretty quick? Yeah, it did. I mean, I think even before we'd gotten home, I think, uh, you know, President Bush had had the mission accomplished yeah. on the the Lincoln, I think yeah. it was. You know, yeah, it, it, I mean, we cruised. I say we, and I'm talking about the U.S. again. And we had guys, we had other elements that did the roadshow to Baghdad. Mm-hmm. And it's like, man, I mean, they were there within a couple of days mm-hmm. and had taken over the country. And, uh, you know, we just couldn't hold it. Uh, and I wonder, so from your perspective as a new guy, that's a great, like, you're very lucky, right? You're a new guy, you're going into war in your first deployment. Did you realize how cool that was? I did. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. No, no Good. doubt. I mean, it was a huge mission, you know, maybe not the sexiest mission, but, uh, still, I think the largest, you know, yeah. NSW mission collectively that we've ever done yeah and to do a mission any mission at the time was like you're freaking stoked so did did you uh was there anything that you personally like lesson learned that really stuck with you from that first work i mean i know there's like a thousand little ones any major ones that you're like i i I need to make sure i do this that i mean obviously you had your guy that was sort of like your sea daddy in first lieutenant who who kind of passed on the way of the frogman to you um Anything else in that first first deployment? I mean, too many to name. Not, nothing yeah. like big that comes out, but I, you know, there were just a lot of yeah. micro lessons learned, and you know, I I felt like a stupid new guy during workup. You know, I, I just felt like, you know, I, there was a lot of pressure going on, and by the end of that deployment, I felt like a team guy. Mm-hmm. Like I felt like I was starting to get shit, mm-hmm. and you know, unfortunately, I just have have to learn things the hard way. And sometimes it takes me a little bit longer to get there, but I felt by the end of that deployment, I felt very competent. Now, uh, you know, still like a lot to learn. That's just mm-hmm. like you know your your yellow belt, but yeah, yeah. it's uh, the learning curve in your first platoon is freaking steep. It's you you can't get ahead of it. Like no new guy is going to get ahead of the, the power curve when you're a new guy in your first platoon. It's just not it's not possible. There's too much to know and too much to learn, uh, but. Once you're in your second platoon, like it, it's so much easier. It's like infinitely easier in your second platoon. It's hard to be behind the power curve in your second platoon. So in your first platoon, you got guys like there'll be like two, one or two new guys that like, bro, are these guys even gonna make it through workup? All the other guys are kind of like fighting to get through workup, and then you have, I guess you can have one or two guys that are like, yeah, they're pretty squared away. But by your second platoon, no, no one's doing bad generally speaking, maybe one out of 100, is doing bad in their second mm-hmm. platoon. Like, they made it through their first platoon. You get your second platoon, you're, generally speaking, you should be pretty good. You don't have any responsibilities. You don't, you know, you're, you're not really in charge of anything in your second platoon. Or you're not in charge of, like, leadership. So you can, your second platoon, you should be, you should be a solid team guy in your second platoon. Yeah, for sure. And And really, what you're trying to get to is you want to be someone that people can rely on. You, you you want to be dependable and you're just trying to get there as fast as you can. And some guys get there, you know, sooner than others. And, uh, there's a lot of pressure to do that. And I wouldn't have it any other way, man. I mean, that, that's what builds character is, you know, that intense pressure of, do I belong here? Do I have what it takes? What do I need to do to get there? Mm-hmm. And that, you know, whole kind of evolution kind of makes you who you are. Yeah. Uh, Come back from that deployment, you're fired up, roll right into your second platoon because that's what you do in the dreams. You go right into your next freaking platoon. Freaking awesome. Um, what? So what's up with your next platoon? Did you get any schools? I did, yeah. I, I finally got a bunch of schools. Uh, ended up, you know, I, I went to the Hearst School. So Hell that's, yeah. yeah. Oh, oh yeah. 
you know, Jack. helicopters, fast rope propellant. Yeah. So I did that. I you know I did the dive soup, RSO, all those things. Uh, the big one I got was was breacher. Mm. So that that was the one I wanted. Um, that prior platoon was like a very you know we and, and actually team three had like uh, just a lot of breachers and a lot of uh, breacher training that they would do on their own that was was not even part of the workup. So that was something that I was like, man, I, I feel like this is this could be my thing. You know, I like carrying heavy things. I like breaking shit. Um, so yeah, I I got breacher school. Actually, Jeremy and I went to breacher school. And then Chris, is this when Chris went to sniper school? He did. Yeah. yeah. Chris Jack. Chris went to sniper. Um, so yeah, it, it was good, man. I went to breacher school, and you know, so maybe there was a little bit of hangover from my my new guy, you know, figuring shit out. But mm-hmm. I, had, I had a close call in breacher school that another like kind of defining moment that. Uh, you know, I mean, like, you, you know me as, you know, the lead breacher for, mm-hmm. for a task unit. And, uh, you know, I went on to, you know, do a lot of real world breaching. But, uh, you know, I, I got ahead of myself, man. I was, I won't say cocky, but we had been doing so much breaching at Team 3 and in that platoon prior uh, that I was, I was working on speed. Mm-hmm. You know, and we got to, we got a couple of weeks in and I was, I was doing really well in the course and we transitioned from um, one one device to another device, mm-hmm. which required like a different procedure. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, my mind was like speed. You know, it's all all about you know, just kind of mastering mastering the uh, the art of breaching there. And uh, it was during a rehearsal, but we were doing a rehearsal with a with a live cap, mm-hmm. and I ended up, uh, I mean, detonating a cap that shouldn't have been detonated. Oof. And Jeremy actually took took the brunt, um, took a little frag in his leg, mm-hmm. peppered him a little bit. But uh, that was that was the first wake up call. I mean, that was the first time uh, in my you know going through buds, like no issues in buds. Um, you know, I, I talked about I, I didn't struggle as a new guy, but I mean, certainly I I had my mess ups there. But this was like a first complacency issue to where I was going too fast. Um, I was rushing through something and I wasn't realizing the full impacts of, you know, making a mistake like that. And you, you make a mistake with explosives, you make a mistake with a rifle and people can die. People can get maimed and it's happened. Mm-hmm. It's super unfortunate. And I had that happen to me in breacher school and I thought I was going to get booted out. And then you don't know the repercussions after that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't know why they did it. Um, the cadre kept me there and you know, maybe it was my performance up to that point. Um, they kept me in and, and I fought my way back. I ended up being one of the, they nominate guys to be like, uh, the lead breachers for the FTX. Mm -hmm. Um, so I got to be one of those guys, but I mean, you do something like that and you feel like you you have to repay it the rest of your career. Yeah. Cause I mean, if that had been a live, uh, explosion. I mean, with a full breaching charge on there, who knows what would happen to Jeremy? No doubt, no, no doubt. It, it's not lost to me. And and again, you know, to jump away and just talk about like training and why we do things the way we do. You know, the crawl, walk, run mm-hmm. is there for a reason, and there's a reason why we we go dry before we go live. Is so when mistakes like that happen, they happen with paint and with a cap, and not with a you yeah. know full charge. <sighs> Um, how's this platoon? So you're still together with Chris, you and Jeremy, like this. I, I keep bringing this up because you guys were such a prominent piece in Charlie Platoon and Tasking Bruiser. Like the three of you, you freaking knuckleheads, were just like such a um, cornerstone of the of the Tasking. You guys, I think. Well, Jeremy was an E six at the time, but you guys were like kind of the E five mafia the e-dogs making shit happen and so you guys are st- you guys are together in this platoon you got your platoon commander at this time is rob who's freaking just legend just freaking outstanding yeah. um just a maniac awesome frogman team guy and your platoon is it's kind of mayhem so i i, I know this because like i obviously you guys rolled into tasking a bruiser, and so I got to see and hear about what your previous deployment was like. But also just knowing you guys and knowing Rob, like, it, and hearing stories from all all of you guys. So this was like mayhem. You guys were, you guys were freaking. 
going we, going hard. We were meat eaters. <laughs> yeah, we we had a great group. Um, yeah, Jeremy and and Chris, and uh, one other guy. We we stuck together, so we had a good contingent from from the prior. Who's the other guy, Jake. Uh, no, it, just an older guy. I, oh, okay. I don't want to mention his name just because yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if he wants to be mentioned. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so we had a good group of returning guys, and but all the older guys had left the platoon except for my my sea daddy became the LPO. Got it. So we were in this weird position, right, uh, that we were like, I think to a certain degree looked at like these combat seasoned dudes. <laughs> Which was not the case, right? Like we, we had done a couple of missions uh, that weren't, you know, super tough, that deployment. But I think, I mean, because like when you don't know, I'm sure like like you've been a 90s frogman, the guys who yeah. did shit, like yeah. you looked up to, it's like, man, I can't believe those guys yeah. were on the mission. Yep. Like we had guys that had been in Grenada. Panama. We, we had guys that had been in, I, I don't think, I never had a guy in a platoon that was in Panama, but I had a guy in a platoon that was in Grenada and I had some guys that were in the first Gulf War. By the way, the combined like combat operation time of both those was like three days of bo- of everyone. But like you're saying, it was like, hey, they had combat and we didn't. And it's just, you just don't know what you don't know. And you just have to think that this thing is this elevated thing and what's it going to be like and what it was like. And they, they went through it. And so now basically everyone's looking at you guys with that attitude. Yeah, that's it. So, I, I mean, we were meat eaters and... Uh, and we had a good time, man. And we, we trained hard and and like any sort of uh you know, issues I felt I had as a new guy or lack of confidence or whatever the hell you want to call that was just gone. Mm-hmm. You know, even the preacher shit. Like w- once I got through that and I, I, I survived all that, you know, it's full steam ahead and just make myself the best team guy I could be. And 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 like what you said, that second platoon, when you get into your second platoon, it's like things are clicking. And things felt like they were clicking, not just with me, but with our guys, and we were highly functional. You know, I mean, just kicking ass and, and doing really well in all the training blocks and having fun outside the training blocks. And, uh, yeah, just full speed ahead, like in all aspects, you know, of team guy workup. Did you guys not, did you guys get a, did you guys not get in trouble? No. That's impressive. Yeah. yeah. And I, I, that's impressive. I don't know what the statute of limitations are uh, yeah, yeah. for, for, for all the trouble that we, we yeah. caused during that time. But, uh, no, we, we stayed out of trouble. Yeah. Um, others weren't so lucky. Um, man, lots of, lots of great memories. Uh, and I, I treasure those and, you know, whenever the boys get together, we, you know, we love bringing up the old shit. I mean, you know, you, you have to think too, that, uh, I, I've done a lot of reflecting over the years and I feel like, especially as the war was ramping up and the mission in Iraq changed such that we were doing like direct action missions, mm-hmm. guys were getting in gunfights, things were getting a lot more dynamic. The wars were ramping up. And, you know, kind of going back to what we were talking about, like joining the Navy. I mean, it just felt like, you know, like we were going into the shit. It, mm-hmm. it was it was imminent. Um, you don't know what's going to happen. So just like live life to the fullest, get every ounce of it. And that's what we were doing, man. We were living hard and fast in all aspects of everything that we're doing. Uh, enjoyed the shit out of it. Glad we didn't get uh, rolled up and that we survived and uh, a lot of great lessons learned and. End up having a pretty good deployment as well. Yeah, there's there's no doubt that you have something. In, look, when you're skydiving and diving and shooting live fire and blowing things up all the time, even in the 90s, even when I, you you ha- you have that feeling in the back of your head, like, yeah, you know, and like we're jumping or we're doing whatever on Monday and it's Friday. Freak, let's rock and roll, man. Let's go. Like we're, you're not thinking long term. You're thinking like let's let's enjoy this gig that we're on so now when the war kicks off 2001 you're like you got that but now it's amplified and intensified by quite a bit because you're going into combat and people are trying to kill you so that's like you you add that to the testosterone you add that to the freaking like the friendship brotherhood you add that to the shenanigans and the good times and you're out good just go out and do something hard like just go out and you know go out and go into the desert and spend whatever four weeks in the desert out there out all day up and down hot dehydrated and all that stuff hard training you get back it's like oh we're gonna go rock and roll that's what's gonna happen so all these things combined together this is to get the life of a of, of a frogman and that's what you guys were doing getting after it yeah that's it man I mean uh 
We we lived the life. <laughs> that platoon is great. So you're going on deployment, and at this point, what year is this? Like 2005? Four. Four? Yeah. Okay, 2004. So at this point, they were taking guys, and you would basically do three months in the Pacific and then three months in Iraq. And they were, look, in my opinion, they were doing that. It was kind of like the fair fairy had showed up and it was like, hey, we want to make sure everyone gets combat. We want to make sure everyone gets to go to war. And hey, what we'll do is we'll send, because we didn't, no one knew those freaking wars were going to last for 20 years, right? So they're saying, oh, let's, we'll put you over there for three months, then send the other guys for three months. So that's what you guys did on deployment. Yeah. And I mean, I think, I don't know if they had this in mind as well, but you think, yeah, not knowing how long the wars are going to last in terms of the benefit to the community mm -hmm. and get more guys deployed to combat yeah, zone true. as well. Yeah, true. It's a, it, maybe not a bad move, but if we would have known that the war is going to last 20 years, which eventually once they figured out the war is going to last 20 years, like, yeah, you, you yeah. just, you're going on because it's a big, just the logistics of taking guys. So and, expensive. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's so expensive and such a pain. And, and really in three months, like you're just getting up to speed. So why are we going home? Let's keep, or why are we going to this other AO? Let's keep going. Uh, so your typical exercises and stuff over in the Pacific? No. Did I, you go I to mean, the Pacific first? I did, okay, yeah. Good. Which... I think it's good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, it, it... Oh, no, no it'd be better yeah, to do the other yeah, way. It, it'd be better to go the other way. But at least we had something to look forward to. Mm -hmm. there, there's pros and cons, right? Yeah. Because if you do it the other way and then you're there, it's like, what's the point, yeah. right? Um, but at least we knew we were going to the show and... Um, yeah, and, and we knew that we were going to be in a spot doing DAs, doing mm -hmm. direct action stuff. So had all that to look forward to and uh, just kind of buying our, our time until we, we got there. And then, uh, yeah, so actually Chris and, and the other guy got pulled from our platoon for the push through Fallujah right. in November 2004. So we were like, just super pissy about that. <laughs> Hanging out in, in Paycom and- Just uh, reading after actions from Chris. Yep, yep. Yep, and it's like, man. And so uh, eventually we linked up in January, and then uh, that was a good little deployment, man. I mean, yeah, we were only there for about three and a half months, but uh, I don't know, did maybe 15-plus DAs, mm -hmm. and uh, that's where I cut my teeth as a breacher. You know, man, that, that was in, those were like the heydays of doing roll-up assaults. Mm -hmm. Like you were like riding the rails, um, you know, fast roping on the X, Got to do some of that sexy stuff. Um, but I'll tell you what wasn't sexy was my first op as a breacher. Let's go. What went down? <laughs> hey, lesson was learned. But uh, so we're, we're rolling up and um, I have my charge on me and we're, we're heading to target. So, uh, you know, basically kind of breachers, part of the, the point element, if you will. We, we head to the target and we have to hop over a wall. Well, this wall was pretty short like a four foot wall. Um, we got a structure there and I have my nods on, right? This is kind of how we train, but we you know, maybe hadn't been using that many walls or hopping over walls. So like the art, the art of the hop hadn't mm -hmm. been uh, perfected yet. So I, I had my stuff like all ready and like I'm good with that. And uh, so I, I roll over the wall, you know, kind of four foot wall that I can kind of walk up to and just kind of like roll mm -hmm. over. And it was 10 feet on the other side. <laughs> and so I just spilled, you know, uh, you know, ass over kettle or whatever. And it was just a complete mess. Yeah. So, I mean, got up and like, you know, my nods were flopped up and I was catching. They had like clotheslines. So it was just like, I, I did everything wrong. <laughs> just keystone cops. All oh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just making so much noise. And then, um, but I, I made it up to the door. The breach went fine. Breach went good. Uh, you know, the guys didn't leave me enough room um, to not blow myself up. So, yeah. I, you know, got, was a little bit too close. But um, other than me spilling over the wall, it, it went pretty good. <laughs> but 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 I learned a valuable technique, which I use after that, is I, I would never go over a wall on nods. I mean, you, you look over mm -hmm. the wall on nods, but always looking underneath, trying to use that, uh, you know, the depth perception isn't great on those things. Yeah. So after this, you know, uh, first breaching little fiasco, at least over the wall. So what was your op tempo like? Uh, I think we were doing a couple ops a week. Cool. Yeah, cool. so like like I said, I don't know the exact number, but we, we did, you know, I don't know, 15, 18, something like that. Um, actually, I mean, 
those are like going out on missions, but we would often do multiple targets. So mm -hmm. I don't know. We did a couple dozen, something yeah. like that, DAs, and uh, cut our teeth, man. And that was really, uh, you know, I think Team 5 was kind of like the, uh, you know, the godfather of creating the modern SEAL Team DA. At mm -hmm. least that that's how it, it was perceived on the West Coast in terms of, creating those procedures and uh and doing all that stuff and so yeah we got really good at it and you know those were like the good good old sexy missions if you will where you're just rolling in hot blowing shit up you know taking things over with violence of action mm -hmm. and uh you know rolling off target with yeah. the bounty it's like 45 minutes bro it's like you know what i mean it's such immediate gratification and with such limited like downside you know like it's just good we did one uh one kind of unique mission that we were doing a this was like my first uh real overwatch mm. where we were um we joined up with a this was just kind of a weird one but we joined up actually i think with the first of the 506 out in uh in habania so we we moved around a little bit and they had a kind of an overwatch mission uh, major uh, thoroughfare there and some separate teams kind of mutually supporting positions and whatnot and so we were paired up it was me and another frogman and two army guys and we snuck into a town and I'd, these guys just do shit different mm -hmm. right so uh snuck into a town you know free climbed up like a second story building in the middle of like you know like a city square i guess mm -hmm. and in the morning to my surprise, the whole city was surrounded us. Mm -hmm. Like we were, we were like in an apartment, mm -hmm. overwatching stuff with an active. I mean, there was like I, I looked out the window at one point. You know, very very sneakily looked out, and below, I mean, they were selling fish. Mm -hmm. There was like a fish market right below us, and we were in this kind of like abandoned building. And you know, you had guys like kind of all around. It's like holy shit, man. You know, this can get gnarly really really quick. Um, of course, nothing did. I mean, it's pretty, uh, pretty easy mission there. But um, yeah, other than that, did did a bunch of DAs. Uh, I didn't get roped into any of the uh, security type stuff yeah. that that the other dudes were doing. So yeah, I got lucky. Good. Uh, come home from that deployment, and now you roll into. So now it's two thousand five, I guess. Two thousand four, you might have gotten home, but it's two thousand five yeah. when we form up. So yeah, I, were you already done? No, because we went we went to desert like almost immediately. So you guys had already done pro def. So you probably got home in two thousand four. No, five. Okay. Yeah. So I I deployed. Uh, that was a quick turnaround. We had a couple of quick turnarounds. So oh, that's right. Yeah, there we, was no pro def. Yeah, yeah. That's we right. we came back in uh, April two thousand five, and then went right into it. Check. Um, what's cool is you still are with Chris and Jeremy. Yeah. So, and I. I, the triumvirate. So, do you know what that means? I think it means three people. It does. So I, <laughs> the, once I, I was like, you know, because Leif used to say it all the time. He's like, oh, it's the triumvirate, and and I kind of was like, finally, yesterday I was thinking about that, and I go, what does this even mean? Where does this come from? And it's like some Roman term for three people that are in a position of power, and they had like a bunch of examples, you know, Caesar and this guy and this guy, and so that hundred percent came from Leif. You know, Leif would only only Leif. At that time, had the historical knowledge to come up with triumvirate. Um, so you guys roll in to now. It's your third platoon together. Um, Tony's BTF. Tony comes in as the platoon chief. I was thinking about this too. You guys must have been bummed that freaking Rob wasn't going to be your task unit commander, and you were getting some freaking random guy you never heard of me. Yeah, some some caveman looking guy. Yeah, <laughs> and, and if you're calling me a caveman and you're comparing me to Rob, like these are the options. <laughs> there's there's a lot of Neanderthal activity going on between us two. Yeah, uh, yeah but you guys must have been like, damn, a little bit bummed out because you guys were bros with Rob. You just did a deployment with him, and it's kind of normal that he would just fleet up in the same troop and just take over. I don't know why that. I don't know why it happened the way it did. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, we obviously loved Rob. He, he was he was the man. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, you know, I, I don't know how things shook out, but it all worked out. So that somehow the Ouija board got. Um, I think I just figured out why it might have happened that way, but we can talk offline about it. Yeah. 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 Um, so 
I show up as TU commander. Leif shows up as the platoon commander. BTF Tony's your platoon chief. That's kind of a new headshed coming in. And, but the cool thing is Jeremy steps, steps us up as the LPO. Yeah, so Jeremy steps up. Uh, Chris is still there. And not only that, but we had all the previous new guys. They all stuck oh. around. So we had the... Yeah, we got these know, freaking we had, badasses. We had the, dude, we had, I mean, the dream team. Yeah. And in these guys, we had uh, a ridiculous amount of quals. Like, I don't know. Like, I think seven breachers and seven snipers. Yeah. Like, we were just... Tasking a bruiser ended up with 13 snipers, which is freaking badass. Yeah, unreal. That's that's one set of quals. Um, and you guys roll in there. And it's cool. You know, that's always a question I get asked a lot about is like stepping up from being a peer to being a leadership position. How would Jeremy handle that? And maybe I'm sure Jeremy will come on the podcast at some point. But how how Jeremy handle that from your perspective? I mean, he rocked it, man. He, he stepped right into it. He yeah. was one thing that really impressed me about Jeremy was. You know, he was a couple years younger than me. Um, but in, when you're in your 20s, that's like a big deal, right? Like, I, I'm 22 and he's 20. Um, but he was a little bit younger. And but he, what, he had made first class and you hadn't, basically? What are you saying, man? I'm just wondering. <laughs> no, that, that's how he got yeah. it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he was the highest ranking guy. Um, but definitely the guy for the job, man. I mean, he was kind of a, a prodigy, if you will. You know, just really solid frog man and... He stepped up and did all the things that you would expect, you know, an LPO to do. Mm-hmm. And it, it makes it easier when you have a good guy that you know is a good guy, right? Mm-hmm. Like, so, it, he was just easy to work for. Yep. Yeah, no, he's freaking stepped right up. But that's a question I get asked all the time. Like, oh, I'm getting elevated. And you can go you can go too hard or you can go too soft. You can be like, that's right, I'm in charge now. Or you can be like, oh, I guess I'm in charge. Like, I don't know. And he did a right, the, the, the right balance of like, hey, you know what? I'm I'm in charge now. I don't know everything, but I got to make a call, and this is what we're doing. You know, like he just did it good. It depends the group of guys too, mm-hmm. right? True. Be- because if you have immature guys and uh, you're not able to respect the position, um, and also I think Leif did that. I mean, he was like masterful at how he did that in terms of developing good, meaningful relationships with people, um, but doing it in a way that like there was never any question mm-hmm. that he was in charge mm-hmm. and that when it came down to a decision being made, there's a time for discussion and then there's a time that, you know, this is what we're doing. Yeah. Right. So yeah, Jeremy, Jeremy was good at that. And if you're a, if you're a good dude, I mean, that's hopefully how it should roll. And our first trip was straight out to land warfare and it was just freaking awesome. Yeah. I mean like everybody was just kicking ass. Oh man, I, I just realized the uh, the never ending march. Oh yeah, yeah, that was a rough one, um, especially for guys that maybe didn't take things as seriously as they should have. So we get told um, that we're gonna do a shakeout patrol. Shakeout patrol is like, oh, we're gonna go make sure our gear feels good, make sure that you know our equipment's riding right, and walk around. You know, probably be back in half an hour, maybe forty-five minutes, something like that. This is day one. Yeah, this is day one. We just show up out there. Yeah. So like, hey, we're gonna do a shake. They literally say we're gonna do a shakeout patrol. This is a common thing. Shakeout patrol. The original idea is, hey, make sure your gear's not making any noise. So it's like go out there, shake, shake it out a little bit. Make sure you don't have go through like the hand and yeah. arm signals yeah. and, and like you know, just just shake some stuff out. Forty five minutes, hour, something like this. Easy. Would you call it like a practice run? But it's even less than that. It's less than that. It's like it's like just a shake out. I'm trying to think of a way that if you were uh, uh, in a school play mm. and they were like. Just walk through where you're gonna go. Mm. Yeah, you you're not even gonna deliver any lines. So you're right, not gonna right. sing any songs. Okay. If it was football, what what's your football equivalent like for, for Echo through. Charles? Um, it, it would be a walkthrough, like mm. a like a Friday, you know, afternoon walkthrough yeah. or something. Like so you you literally shouldn't break a sweat. Yeah. You shouldn't break a sweat. You should just be, hey, we're cruising. But for, uh, cause me, so I'm like, okay, shake up patrol. What does that mean? Like I get all my gear totally squared away, like water, everything that I'm going to be carrying, I'm carrying, like I just do what, what I'm supposed to do as a good freaking frogman. Not everyone did that. Good Leif, Leif Babin had had his freaking, he had had his water in his canteens since SQT. And so he, he had water and like the first sip he took, 
okay, so putrid. Me, yeah, the first sip he took it was like spoiled, like <laughs> rotten spoiled water. water. Yeah. <laughs> so so, anyways, they we're, they go, hey, we're gonna take you guys out for the checkout patrol. Then they drive us out in the middle of the desert, and then they start dropping it off off by pairs and giving us link up points. And it ends up being like an all night evolution, walking all through the desert, and guys like Leif hadn't cleaned his canteens. Other guys just didn't bring water, bagels, or he'd v- brought like very little water. And so we end up on this, a little bit of a death march. And this is the story that Leif likes to tell is he comes up to me and he's like, hey. <laughs> he's like, hey, uh, have, you got any, have you got water? And I was like, yeah. He's like, do, do you have any uh, spare water? And I was like, why? And he's like, uh, <coughs> Beagles doesn't have any water. He's he's starting to feel it, and I'm like, <laughs> and Leif's, Leif's, uh, when he tells the story, I look at him. I'm like, is he gonna die? <laughs> I'm like, is he gonna die? And he's like, no. And I was like, well, well, tell him to remember to bring his own water next time. <laughs> so that was one example of you know a few things that went down that night. But like Leif was out of water. I don't know what was your status. Yeah, I I run hot, man. I <laughs> I brought my water, but I burned through you it. Went and, through and it. We marched. I mean, it was hot. Yep. And we marched. Not acclimated because it was day one. Not acclimated. Yeah. And yeah, August I'm or whatever carrying a full, you know, pig gunner loadout. Yep. So a third third platoon, you know, I'm still carrying that pig. And uh, yeah, I, I was smoked, man. And <laughs> did then. You, and, did you go down? No, I didn't go down. No, no, no one actually went down. <laughs> no, no. Everyone sucked it up. No one went down. And then at the end of that, we did like a combat conditioning course, mm-hmm. right? I was in them because it was just getting light. And they're like, hey, combat conditioning course is next. And I was like, oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Yeah. I was like, cool. Let's go. Freaking yeah. combat conditioning course. Um, hey, also, so we're out there. Bagels is out of shape. And he's like, look, dude, you could tell as a new guy, he got done with Buds and SQT and was like, I just finished Buds and SQT and I'm going to freaking relax for the next 30 days of leave. And that's exactly what he did. And you know, normally, I was, I was thinking about this, normally in a normal SEAL team, you'd be like, oh cool, then you get back to the team and everyone would be in pro dev and you kind of get back into shape and whatever. And you can also think, like Biggles, having been a wrestler, he probably like, you know, cut weight and he was like, on that 30 days of leave, he was finding some food, man. He was getting in there. And he, he liked to eat, you know what I'm saying? He, you know, he liked to get, he liked to eat. So he put on some LBs, and the very first trip he shows up on is, is for a desert warfare, and he's not in shape. And um, he was hurting on that, and he was hurting on the combat conditioning course. And so right out of the gate, it was like, this guy's not in shape. And his, he had a cool attitude, but basically you got a sign to freaking square his ass away, right? Yeah. Well, tell me about that. Yeah, we just got paired up. I mean, it, there was really no program, It, you know, Leif just told me, hey, take take Ryan under your wing and squirm away. So uh, what that meant was is we started running together. And so every, you know, not every day, but, you know, several times a week mm-hmm. and on every trip, we just ran. So, yeah, we, we ran the deserts of, uh, of Nyland. And Leif just always likes that. I've, the image just pops up in my head of, you know, we're running with our shirts off down the Siphon Road. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm – like Portuguese tan, middle of summer, <laughs> and and Biggles is just like glaring, oh, just white, God. just uncomfortably glowing white <laughs> down the road. Yeah, yeah, that's freaking classic. Uh, we get well, that, that other story that's freaking classic is freaking Johnny Kim. Like, y- you guys had just like hazed somebody. And I don't think that's the term that we use. You guys had just hazed somebody. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like real obvious and everything. And so I actually got the platoon chiefs and SEA. And I was like, hey, hey guys. And so I pulled themselves so like, hey guys, like I get it, but you can't be dumb. Like you can't be doing this shit. Like it's real obvious, like freaking, freaking keep it under control, boys. And they're like, yeah, I got it, got it. And I shit you not. As we're walk, cause John, cause Johnny had been at sniper school, so he showed up late. And this, this twenty minute period, I shit you not, the twenty minute period that like I saw this happen, and I was like, dude, you guys. So I go, hey, let me talk to you guys. Muster them outside. We're out freaking standing by the whatever that tower is. We're standing there like having a little freaking man on man conversation with the khakis, 
And then during that 20 minutes, Johnny Kim had showed up at the at, at Nyland as a new guy late. You know, now he's late, even though he's at a freaking school. But you guys are like, you're freaking late. And I come walking back in and you guys had taken him like shaved half of his head, beat him up or whatever. And I come walking in and I hear someone like, it was actually Chris. Chris is like, go report to the commander. And I'm like, what is going? Like, that's just a weird thing to hear, you know? Because everybody calls me Jocko. And now I hear like me being referred to as the commander. He's like, go go report to the commander. And I look over and here, here's freaking Johnny. And... I look at him and he's like a little bit shell shock looking, <laughs> but also I see like tufts of hair like on his shoulders <laughs> and like half of his head, but he's got a hat on. And I'm like, hey, bro, how's it going? He's like, and he's like, sir, um, I'm Petty Officer Kim. I'm, I just got here from sniper school. I'm honored to be a part of this. And I was like, cool, bro. It's awesome to meet you, man. I, I look forward to working with you. And then just like walked around. I was like, God, I got some freaking out of control knuckleheads, um, which is kind of what you want. Um, so that was all good, all good. Yeah, good times. But there was some old school bonding going on. Did I say hazing or did I said bonding rituals? <laughs> bonding. I, I think you meant bonding. I think yeah. I meant bonding rituals. So there's some bonding rituals that took place that were uh, going on. So we get done with that. We freaking gen. Um, I think we did. We went out to the desert for vehicles next, um, mobility. Then we go to CQC. Um, and this is when we were still doing CQC out at a civilian place. So that was awesome training. Yeah, great, great workup. Yeah. That's a good one. We really had a, an awesome workup. Going to Mount was also at an army base. So we had a big facility to use out there. And, and this whole time we're having good times as well, um, both on and off the training areas. This is a good crew. Yeah, no doubt, man. I mean, the uh, we had we had a lot of the energy from that prior platoon, yeah. so we were still, you know, a bunch of meat eaters. Yeah, um, but with a little bit more civility and a uh, little, little bit more structure. Well, yeah, I mean, you you throw Tony into the mix, and like that's just a different. You know, Tony's a freaking animal, right? And I mean by by that I mean like he's an he's like part human but part animal. Like, you want to talk about needing water in the desert? Doesn't drink water. No, just coffee and dip. Yeah, coffee and dip. He's like, oh, we're doing a shakeout patrol. It's going to be nine days long. Cool. I'm going to eat dirt and be good to go, by the way. So when, when you were talking about, hey, you know, forming up a new platoon, when, when I heard he was going to be our platoon chief, I was like, oh, shit, this guy. Because he had put me through. Uh, he was, you know, he was like the desert rat out at Nyland. Oh, he yeah. did like years at Nyland and yeah. uh, multiple <laughs> tours probably. Yeah. And he he put us through our sixty gunner course, oh, yeah. the infamous course, yeah. and this was a multi day course, and uh, it was hell on earth, man. I mean, while the the grenadiers are like, you know, <laughs> sipping tea, the during, riflemen, yeah, the, the riflemen the are riflemen like, and grenadiers. what whatever the hell that they were doing training for that week, and we were just grinding up and down middle of the summer, buddy carries and just stuff feeding until our like fingers were bleeding. It was awful. And he was just sitting there, you know, just drinking his coffee and dipping. And uh, and then luckily he would give us a break during lunch and we could go unpack la- uh, unpack ammo while everyone else was eating. So, I mean, yeah, he yeah, was just the like. The thing about that is you might not know how hard he is as a human being because you're like, oh, he's just like sitting up here telling us what to do. But, you know, well, well I'd like to see him do that. And then, you, then, and then he does it. Then you realize like, oh, he'll do this. And that freaking, that type of thing when you. In the SEAL teams, when you have somebody, and there's always someone like this that's into whatever they're into, like the breaching is on the backs of like a handful of guys that were just super into breaching and just took it to the next level. The snipers, like there's guys that just, you know, from generation to generation, like someone turns over that school, that train, that block of training is just like, someone goes in there and takes it over. It's like they love it and they want it to be the best training. And AWs and comms guys and everybody, you get these people in the teams that that create the school or the training for people that just takes it to the next level. Like the AW course is a classic example. The AW course could be like a two hour session, maybe a four hour session. You'd be pretty good. You know, you'd be pretty good after four hours of good drills with a with a heavy machine gun, you'd be like, okay, cool. Like we're pretty good at this. And most 
communities would be like, okay, cool. Yeah, we've, we've really trained our automatic weapons gunners to a, a high level. But when you see what the AW course w- is like, you think, oh, these guys are literally ready for anything that can happen with an AW. It's freaking awesome. And that's what you end up with. You end up with badass people that have been trained to the nth degree and they're going to be able to crush in any situation. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, I, I didn't know much about Tony's background. So, like him coming in, I'm like, you know, is this guy I'll talk or whatever? And he's certainly not. Like the hardest frogman I've ever worked with. I mean, the guy is just like what you said, you know, I mean, doesn't need water, doesn't need food. He just, I mean, he does need dip and coffee. <laughs> And that you can run off, you know, for weeks off that. Yeah. yeah, and so he and I grew up at Team One together, so we knew each other. So, but we had never been in a platoon together. But like when I was coming to Team Three, and I saw that he was one of the platoon chiefs, and and the same thing, like we were both like so freaking stoked because I knew, you know, his reputation as a frog man was awesome, you know, and his reputation as like beating people up and all that he had that too but i knew like hey cool we can you can contend with that like you can contend with like hey dude can you do me a favor for the next 48 hours not punch anyone and and here's why and like we want to you know he'll be like oh, no no wang <laughs> yeah uh, i'll just sit in my room then <laughs> it's like but he gets it you know and he did things that were so one, one of the things that was so professional i'll never forget this I'm out there. We're at. We're doing. Um, we're doing mobility. So we're out there at an island with the vehicles, and we were supposed to be setting up like a little mini op or something. And I'm just standing there, and Tony's like, "Hey," and he's talking to Leif, and he's like, "Hey, what we should do is put vehicles here, put vehicle here, send the guys over here, boom, set it up like this." And uh, Leif's like, "Yeah, cool." And he says, and Leif says, "Hey, why don't you go ahead and you know tell the platoon?" And Tony's like, no, you go ahead and tell him it'd be, it'd be better coming from you. And just to have that that humility for him, he, you know, this was early in the workup. He wants Leif to get that uh, rapport with you guys to be like, oh, yeah, Leif knows what he's doing. He's wanting to build up his boss. And there's so many times where people's ego is like, LT, you go ahead and stand down. I'll brief. Like, he just didn't play any of that. So he's hard and tough as hell and an awesome operator, but he also like really truly understood the dynamics of leadership and the dynamics of a freaking SEAL platoon, which was outstanding. Outstanding to see and beautiful to work with. Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, we build our kind of leadership blueprint with everyone that we work with, but, you know, mine certainly was heavily influenced with, with Tony's and I just grew to really respect the hell out of him. Great frogman, great, great leader, and I mean, just like, you know, just a tactical badass. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> where, you were you were mentioning something before we hit record about when we were at Mount, and like, I was encouraging you somehow to, <laughs> to what was it, an obstacle course that we were doing? A Mount obstacle course? What that's, went down? Tell that's me what exactly what it was. And I, I'm surprised that, that you don't remember this. Um, but we were paired up into groups of three. So it was, I don't remember who the third was, but it was you, I, and someone else. And we were in these teams and it was like a combat condition course where we're doing all these different obstacles in the mount town. And one of the obstacles was like, we're running up a building and we're rappelling down Mm -hmm. and it's a pretty tall building. I mean, I don't know, six stories, something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't even know if we had to belay dude. Um, but yeah, we got up to the roof. We rushed up to the roof, and you know, yeah, we're trying trying to trying to win this damn thing, right? And I, I don't know, you know, what your motives were, but <laughs> you were compelling me to take more slack with the rope. <laughs> and uh, I mean, mind you, I'm I'm like a trained hearse guy. I, I know my way around a rappel <laughs> rope. Um, but you were egging me on a little bit, and I, I don't know how I complied. So I took I took a lot of slack, and I jumped off that roof. <laughs> And it must have looked like an 80s action movie, man, because I jumped, I went like two stories down and I disappeared into one of those open windows. And my oh shit meter was like going off the charts, man. My eyeballs were big and I was just holding that rope and and I, it kind of like ricocheted me out. So I I flew in and then the rope kind of like ricocheted back and I was just like all eyeballs. I just carried on smartly and then went down, but I was like, oh shit, man. Uh, that's classic. That's so awesome. You, you, you were obviously messing with me, testing me a combination uh, of, of probably. I don't really remember it, yeah. you know, but 
for me to be like encouraging people to freaking go hard and, and do tougher shit. Yeah, it's pretty pretty standard. But that's also the trip where Tony broke his ankle, mm. and like he tells he tells the story. He's like just like hobbles over to the side of the roof and then just goes like <laughs> to like try and force his broken ankle to heal. And it was of course after he made some kind of speech like you know something happens you just BTF through it you know. Yeah. And sure enough, what do you do? He BTF through it. <laughs> just freaking hobble around on a broken ankle. Oh hell yeah. Um, we were set to deploy to Baghdad. Yeah. And. We went on a PDSS, so like a pre-deployment site survey to Baghdad, and met up with the the special operations guys. It was SEALs and Green Berets that we were going to go and replace, and we were going to be working with this Iraqi counterterror force, and very, let's say, a, a, a very cookie cutter kind of deployment was set up for us. Like everything's in place. The guys have been trained. The operations are kind of steady and flowing, and it looked like it was going to be just a really good, solid deployment, and that's what was happening. And so I went over there on pre-deployment, all good, like high five with the guys. Yeah, we'll see you guys in a few weeks. Come back. When I came back, they had done, for whatever reasons, well, I know the reason, they wanted to unify the entire western part of Iraq under one special operations leader. They chose our leader at SEAL Team 3 to be that guy. And now the opportunity for him was to unify his whole team underneath him in western Iraq in Al Anbar province. And they ended up coming up. He he I got called in and you guys were on leave. And he's like, hey, there's a chance for you guys to go to Ramadi, if that makes sense to you. And I was like, because I knew what was going on in Ramadi. Ramadi was total mayhem at the time. And I was like, yeah, well, that makes perfect sense to me. And that's what we ended up doing. Now, did you, did you guys, did we, we, I don't even think we had a capability of getting that word to you while you guys were on pre deployment leave. No, no. We came back from leave and uh, that was just kind of dropped on us and, mm -hmm. you know, um, didn't really know like what that meant. Mm -hmm. hadn't, hadn't really had time to kind of absorb. What the change in mission was i mean the original mission was kind of like what i had done the prior deployment that's what we were expecting to do yeah yeah there was a lot there was a lot of people that that was almost like uh what's that expression that was like two birds in the hand is worth one in the bush it seemed like that was a real obvious like hey this is we're gonna go there we're gonna do this type of mission it's already going on like there's no drama we could just go and do that i looked at what are you laughing at echo charles yeah, that was the that was a gross misrepresentation of the expression, but you know it's kind of the opposite. Oh, but okay. hey, man, <laughs> okay, Be, uh, my boss, you do you, my boss, you do you. No, what I'm saying is, <clears throat> going to Baghdad was like, oh, this is a good deal. Yeah. It's already like two two birds right here, right in our hands. We have this real nice, kind of easy mission. Two, two birds in the bush is better than one in the hand. In the hand, yeah. The the the, the, yeah. the, the one in the hand is the unknown. Yeah. No, the one in the no. hand. Okay. The one in the hand is the one that's known. You oh, have yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. 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 you yeah, said yeah. two sorry, in the I'm hand sorry. is worth one in the bush, which is okay. So I'm all, I'm all jacked yeah, up. Yeah, y'all jacked okay. up. Okay, well, yeah, yeah. that's the way it goes sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. We <laughs> had this opportunity to have one bird in the hand. Now I'm tracking. All right, we two had, in we, the bush. We could have had bush. one bird in the hand, yeah. which was these nice, clean, simple, straightforward operations in Baghdad. Great op tempo. Or we're going to this Wild West area, which was really bad at the time. And the task unit that we were going to be taken over for, they were conducting operations, but it was like really hard for them to get operations approved. They, they were getting out of the wire sometimes, but it was kind of tricky for them to get out. And it's definitely like some guys were like, damn, it seems like we are taking a risk by going to do this other stuff in Ramadi when we could have just kind of a nice silver platter with cool ops in Baghdad. I looked at it like, hey, there's a lot of bad guys in Ramadi and they're concentrated there and there's really bad things happening and we can go there and I think we can do a lot of good and do a lot of damage to the enemy. And so I rogered up, you guys all came back and um, we went on deployment. You remember getting there? No, I, I don't really remember uh, you know, much about Arriving there, um, was it the first night that we got into the? Uh... I think it was your guys. So I went early with like Tony and like 
a, f- a few guys like there were some of us went early and then you guys showed up like four or five days later something like that but yeah we got like uh the, there was some assault on the camp and so we end up with the entire task unit including tax just up there <laughs> on the roof just laying wastes across the river oh Shadow stalker getting getting yeah. after it with, with like yeah. no nods and just <laughs> shooting from the uh, the hip. Yeah, I, that was a uh, that was my intro to Ramadi, man. Yeah. I I had a feeling that yeah. we were going to be getting after it. Yeah, the entire deployment. Yeah, and I I just knew so when, when I got there, got on the ground, I realized, you know, some some I went and talked to. There was a, a guy from um, Special Operations Command who was a friend of mine that was there at the time. And he kind of briefed me what was going on. His intel officer had been my intel officer when I was at SEAL Team 7. So I knew her well, and she told me what was going on. And then I kind of obviously turned over with the the task unit that was there before us, got a feeling for what was going on, and then talked to the conventional. So I basically figured out like what we could do that I thought would be very beneficial to the fight. You know, and so by the time you guys got there, I kind of had a pretty good idea of what was going to go down and and how we could start knocking it out. And I for for a while, for a few days, we were for probably like five, six days. We were actually working for the CEO of SEAL Team one. So the SEAL of SEAL Team three hadn't taken over yet. So there was like five days or six days where we were working for the CEO of SEAL Team one who I kind of knew. And what we tried to do is do as many missions as we could in the first five, six days so that we developed a precedent of like, hey, we're gonna be working a lot, and that's exactly what we did. Um, Leif tells a story about the first op that he ran, which I'm sure you were on as a DA in like right outside in Tamim, Mm -hmm. and Leif was like stressed, like there was paperwork due and there was this due, and he was like, you know, he kind of came to me like, dude, we should just like roll this, and I was like, bro, you, you got this. You, this is this is like a literal no brainer. Your platoon knows what to do. You know what to do. Just go knock it out. And he was like, "Roger that." And you guys went and knocked it out. It was no factor. And came back. And he's like, "You're right, dude. Like we're ready." And we just did that as much as we could for the next few days, and almost immediately also started doing sniper overwatch positions. The one of the best things that happened was Tony took a crew out up in a firecracker. I don't know if you were on this or not, but he took a a little sniper overwatch team up in a firecracker and I was this was so early I was meeting the brigade commander for the first time and when I walked into the talk they Tony's element had just killed an IED in placer in an exact spot or like a block away from where an IED had just killed like three Marines and this you this was like the timing was impeccable I'm going into the talk. This radio traffic is coming in. The brigade commander, Colonel Gronsky, is hearing this radio traffic that the SEALs just got here and they just killed an IED in placer, which was right where these we, we lost these Marines. He looked at me and was like, we need you to go to Eastern Ramadi. And I was like, roger that, sir. And boom, like that's kind of all these little elements mm-hmm. kind of got the ball rolling really well. Um, and on top of that, like going to memorial services right out of the gate for army guys and marines that's like one of the first things we did and that was a real eye opener as well i think for everybody yeah man i mean from my perspective coming in obviously it was a different kind of deployment than we had done the last last couple but uh yeah you guys made it clear that we were there to you know make an impact whatever whatever that meant um and getting creative like what you guys were doing behind the scenes which i really wasn't super privy to at that point um to find employment that was meaningful and not meaningful to like you know um beefing up our evals you know doing doing a bunch of ops that don't really matter but um like what you're saying i mean guys guys were getting you know conventional forces were getting getting hammered pretty good you know the iraqis weren't going out um you know the effort required us to do some things that that you know we weren't used to doing um but it needed to be done, and I think you know us walking away after that, seeing the kind of strategic impact of, of doing that was pretty cool. Yeah, the a great example. So we ended up doing these sniper Overwatch positions all over, and when you think about it, how many how many urban sniper Overwatches did we do during workup? The answer is zero. So I was actually talking to a, a guy the other night. And you know we were talking about workup, and he's currently going through workup. And I was talking to him, 
And he was sort of like saying, well, hey, you know, we've got this thing going on in the world. We got this thing going on in the world. We got this thing going on in the world. It's kind of hard to tell which one to actually prepare for. And I was talking about, I talked, I told this to a few other guys as well. Um, what workup does is it puts you in really challenging situations that you learn to figure out. And if you can take your Mark 48 and get it waterproofed and swim across the beach at San Clemente Island and go live fire, hit a target somewhere, and then get back in the water and swim back out to a boat, that whole thing is just a bunch of problem solving. That's what it is. It's a bunch of problem solving. You know, I, I don't think the uh, SR training that we used to do gets enough credit. Yeah, and, true. You know, I, I mean, I think that was the training. I mean, yeah. you look at the muscle movements in terms of the, the things that we're doing, the planning, the multi-day missions and all that. The only difference is, is how you're setting up in yeah. an urban environment. Yeah. But when you have to adapt to, oh, we're going to do an OTB. Then you have to adapt to going to SR. Then you have to adapt to vehicles. Then you adapt to boats. Then you adapt to this. Then you adapt to this. You can't and, do it all. And you can't do it all. But what you learn, what you train to do, sure, you train to do overwatches or, um, or you train to do SR. And yes, you train to do DAs. But what you train to do is you train to think. You train to adapt. You train to learn. That's actually what the workup is, is getting people to learn how to adapt how to see patterns, how to recognize where they can improve. And that's what workup is. And that's actually what SEAL, like even BUDS, BUDS is like mayhem. How, it's, how do you deal with mayhem? How can we take this freaking total chaos of hell week and get a head count? How do we do that? And that's what carries through and that's what, we, that's what we're good at. We're good at looking at a shit sandwich and being like, okay, we need to turn this into an operation that we have control over. Well, uh, us more than others too, I think, you know, we're not mired by doctrine that the teams are, yep. you know, out, out of all the other soft elements out there, you know, we're probably the least doctrine focused yep. now. That could be bad in some ways. It's, but, it's bad in some ways, but it but, sure is good but in other ways. Like what, what you're talking about, I mean, throw us in challenging environments and situations and we're going to figure shit out Yep. and then we'll get better at that down the road. Yep. Yeah. Even when we were out of the water for a while, meaning like NSW in general, you know, in the workups, they, we started doing less and less diving and less and less more ops and people would talk to me about it and be like, you know, we're not even getting the water. I was like, Hey man, if we need to get back in the water, we'll get back in the water. We'll figure it out. It'll take, I went through that cycle, you know, it's like, Oh, we haven't done OTB in a while. Cool. How do you rig the boats? And you'll go screw it up. And then you're like, hey, we need to put one inch tubular nylon around this. And oh, yeah. And hey, we need to make sure we prep the motor like this. Oh, yeah, cool. Hey, we need to make sure that the chem lights, IR chem lights are over. So you, you just relearn it. But because you have an open mind and because you've learned how to adapt, that's what makes it work. And that's really exactly what we did when we got to Ramadi. We were doing operations that we had to figure out. We were doing uh, interact interoperability with Marines and with Army that we hadn't done. We were using vehicles that we hadn't used, Bradley's tanks. We were using air support that we hadn't used, Apache. Like, there's a whole bunch of things that we just had to go, okay, how are we gonna work this? Or we, we couldn't be like, hey, we know how to do this. We have to be like, we've never done this before. What, what do you think? What, give us your opinion. How would you execute this mission, Army guy or Marine guy? Like, those Army guys have been there for four months, six months, 10 months. Marines have been there for three months, four months, five months at that time. Like, hey, how do you guys think of this? What do you guys think of this? Learn from them and then go, oh, what about this? And that's really what it was, was like an exercise in adaptability. Yeah. The other thing that was interesting is we show, you know, we do this whole workup as a complete task unit. We get to Ramadi and we split up into five separate elements. A bunch of different, you know, little five, six man elements are, are now running things. And people like you, you were in your third platoon, you end up as like the assault chief for the special mission unit of the Iraqis as a combat advisor, which is a huge freaking responsibility. That in particular was was really cool and uh, just kind of dumb luck how it panned out. But yeah, we broke up into different groups there and you know, we were in a five man mixed element and with our uh, special missions platoon, I think mm -hmm. they were called, right? The, the Iraqi element that yep. essentially we were partnered with whenever we were targeting, you know, bad guys to go after. Um, and it gave me a great opportunity, yeah, I mean, to kind of plan and lead these assaults when I had no business doing that, you know, structurally in terms of like yeah, where I was. Structurally you didn't, but experience-wise and 
uh, level headedness and performance and leadership capability, you were definitely r- ready to rock and roll. Obviously, yeah, yeah. That that was uh, that was good, man. That was great, great experience. Like super fortunate that I found myself, um, you know, in that group. And I, I was with Leif. Uh, always a great time working with Leif, and you know, learned so much with him throughout that and uh, got really into the mission planning process and kind of the non-sexy stuff. But you know what, like all that stuff, if uh, you're going to do a career in the teams, you know, learning how to do that shit, learning how to, uh, you know, whether it's dealing with products, um, briefing shit, like I wasn't a great briefer um, before then and I was probably not great during that, but I got a lot better at it and, you know, learning how to, run shit you know and and uh at kind of a higher level and it, it was cool you know got to run some yeah, i mean task unit size da's and and deal with all that and to have the opportunity to kind of be in the position i was in was yeah pretty cool you were um you threw out a lot of rambo quotes it's kind of your thing yeah you know i mean going back if if you were to look at my childhood you probably would wonder why i didn't go into the green berets yeah, you know i yeah. yeah huge rambo fan yeah <laughs> Uh, you were, uh, we did a hostage rescue. We did. Yeah. And you, what were you the, were you the assault lead on that one? So I, I wore a couple different hats on mm-hmm. this. This was an interesting one for me. Um, so backing up for the last two platoons, all the direct action missions that we had done, Chris was the point man. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I don't recall Chris talking much about in his book, you know, what he did behind the scenes, um, just to kind of deviate here for a second, because I think it's worth telling is uh, he was a tremendous like navigator and planner and not just in like routes to target, but I mean, you know, like mobility navigation. So like out of all the convoys and missions that we did on the most treacherous roads in Iraq, never got hit by an IED. And I give Chris a lot of credit for the deep mission planning he was doing and developing routes and finding the best ways to get us in and out. Um, and yeah, great, great point, man. Yeah, aside from all the stuff he did as a sniper and everything else he did. Um, but this was the first mission. So when we did DAs, generally Chris and I were like inseparable as part of that point element heading up to the assault. We got the you mission. You being breach team yeah. and him being like point man. Yeah, yep. in, inseparable. Yep. Um, and for this mission in particular, it was a short notice, time sensitive mission. We didn't have much time to plan or to think on it. And uh, I don't recall exactly why, but we, we broke up. Uh, there was an Overwatch contingent. Yep. I know why. I know why. Because there was a tall building that had a great vantage point over the target and the target, we had intel that there was like a machine gun nest and there was IEDs around it. And so in order to mitigate that, we didn't want to just hit the target cold. We wanted to get eyes on beyond, we, you know, we obviously we tried to get aircraft, but we wanted to get our, that was something I was always into. I was always into like whatever we could, whatever I could do with us. Organic. Organic, yeah. I wanted to do. Yeah. And so in this particular one, there was a building which we weren't supposed to go into, by the way, but there was a building that was like perfect Overwatch to look at the target area. Is that like a university or was, something? It was in the university. Yeah. So there was this, there was an area called the al University that we weren't supposed to go into. And, you know, sometimes you gotta make a decision where you're gonna bend the rules a little bit. This is one of those times I made a decision like, yeah, we're gonna bend the rules. There's, it, it's literally the perfect Overwatch for this target building where there was a hostage, where there was reports of IEDs in the courtyard and and heavy machine gun in the, in position in this building. So before we hit this thing, I was like, we need to look and see. What, we need to have our own eyes on. And once the assault starts, we need to have Overwatch as it's going down in case there is a uh, machine gun or somewhere there. So that's why that little split took place. Now that now that you're bringing it up. Sounds like the worst environment imaginable. And like going back to the little vignette, you know, talking about going over, uh, you know, invading Iraq. Yeah, that was like another moment there because I ended up being point man for my first time ever on that op. So it was point man slash breacher um, going into what I thought was the worst environment imaginable. Um, Ended up not being that bad. Um, 
but yeah, that was that was one of those ones, you know, especially now uh, father to a couple of kids. Um, pretty cool, man. Pr- pretty cool that we did that. I'm glad it went it, it went smooth. We got to Target, um, and you know, it, it always shocked me. You know, I, I mean, we we stormed that entire house, made it to the roof before they even woke up. Mm-hmm. So uh, a shot wasn't fired. Um, you know, did what we had to do. Um, got the guys, wrapped them up, you know, saved the kid. And, uh, yeah, that was, that was a pretty cool one. Yeah, I I think I was staged by the Overwatch, which was only like 100 yards away. But as the assault's going down, I whatever, grab a couple guys, and I go to get to the breach point of the assault. And, you know, 48 seconds goes by or something. And the get the target, target secure. And then, like, Leif's calling me, like, hey, Jocko Leif. And I'm like, go. And he's like, jackpot. Meaning we just got the hostage. And at this point, man, I mean, this was, you're always suspect of intel anyways. But I was like, I think I was like, jackpot? And he's like, jackpot. And I was like, roger that. Damn. All right. Like, freaking hell, hell yeah, let's go. And sure enough, like you said, we, we got the, it was like a 15 or 16-year-old kid that had been kidnapped from Fallujah and then taken into this safe house enemy safe house in Ramadi. And so, yeah, that was a, that was, that was pretty good. Yeah. If I recall, was he like a, you know, like the provincial leader's son or something? Yeah. Like that? I want to say he was like the provincial police chief's son or something like this. So he was, his parents were some kind of, um, some kind of political official and that's why they took him. But yeah. And I, I, I may or may not have said, we're Navy SEALs. We're here to get you out. <laughs> yeah. And if he would have spoken English, he may have been impressed <laughs> with that line. But also interesting, Leif pointed this out to me. Uh, a couple of years later, the people that we captured went on trial. And they had to have testimony from the assault team that captured them. And so the assault, the, the people that were, were testified was you and Leif. And you and Leif, obviously you couldn't use your real names because then the enemy might you know, find out who you are. So you guys testified via VTC a couple years later as Lieutenant Ray Tango and Petty Officer Second Class Gabriel Cash. Tango and Cash, Echo Charles, you remember that? <laughs> Tango <laughs> and Gabriel Cash. <laughs> Oh, good times. You know, that, those are just a little ways to kind of get back, yep. you know. Yeah, yep. you got to get them back. Yep. Got to get them back. Uh, but the op tempo there, clearly, I mean, it was really high. We almost, you know, we had guys in the field all the time. Um, you and your team and the other elements, we just had guys going out all the time. The, obviously, the, the fighting was really heavy. Uh, we, we, we talk about, like, when I got back and I was talking to one of the, uh, prior enlisted captain over at WarCom who is a machine gunner, SEAL machine gunner in Vietnam. And I'm kind of debriefing with him. And, and you know, for us, we always held the, we always thought the guys in Vietnam were just like constant combat. And I was talking to him and he said, you know, I was like, well, like how many, when you were deployed, like how many gunfights did you get in? And he was like, I forget the exact numbers, but he was like six. And I was like, okay. And I mean, that was like three days in Ramadi, and um, and I was like, "Oh, did you, did you, how often did you run out of ammo?" And he's like, "I never ran out of ammo." And I was like, "Oh." And we had guys go Winchester on the pigs. A decent amount, like, not a regular occurrence, but more often than you'd think for sure. Like, and you know, guys were were too eager to throw that box of ammo whenever we got in a gunfight. <laughs> try, you know, to, try to get that weight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because guys were carrying extra rounds, and yeah. then you know we're getting a gunfight. You just see boxes getting peppered at your back. And what was your? What, how much did you carry uh, on your person? Five hundred. Yeah, I man, my first platoon. I'm not even shitting you. It was a thousand rounds, mm-hmm. and it was like weaved in my kit. It was ridiculous. Yeah. I couldn't even move. But uh, <laughs> no, we we got down. You know, doing a couple of uh, deployments, and then the SOP kind of change a little bit because you have to be mobile enough. You got to, you know, we're hopping over walls. We're running, gunning. um, So that was usually it. Um, You end up that, that uh, citation that I read in the beginning was you got, you got hit in the leg with shrapnel. Um, You end up getting medevaced. Uh, That was Tony's birthday, by the way. 
Yes. Yeah. BTF Tony's yep. happy birthday was a big gunfight. That's probably that's I guarantee that's the best birthday that, Tony's ever had. That's probably like his fiftieth birthday. Yeah. Back then. He, he was either he was either fifty or twenty one <laughs> or like or like seven hundred and forty two, <laughs> and he's a vampire and he just like lives yeah. war to war. Uh, you end up. It didn't look bad. Like I remember looking at your knee and I was like, it doesn't look too bad, but it was not good. Um, it was worse than it looked, I should say. So you end up getting medevaced and sent to Germany. I got an email here. Oh, shit. Sunday, July 23rd, 2006. Leif. Hey, man, I talked to Jocko yesterday. Gave him the lowdown. I'll repeat myself as usual for you, sir. They were unable to find that tiny fucker with the orthoscopy. Orthoscopy. Apparently, the shrapnel was on E&E from the scope, so naturally they ripped open the rest of the knee, set up an L ambush, and eventually found the little son of a bitch. It was pretty not good. Sounds like it's going to be a little more recovery time than anticipated. I've talked to the docs here, and my basic plan is to hang out here for a few more days, then go to Unit 2 for a few weeks to a month, or however long it takes to be good enough to walk around and then get flown back to you guys. I don't know if I'll be good enough to op with you guys, but at the very least, I'd like to come back and help out any way I can, even if that means being a talk bitch. I'm figuring I'll know a little bit more in the next couple of weeks. Well, just know on the bright side, I'm in a hospital bed sweating my ass off, being bit by mosquitoes, constipated, and I'm pissing on myself on a regular basis, and luckily, they are underfeeding me with shitty food as well. <laughs> Now I think I'll go back and lie about my pain so I can get a morphine Percocet cocktail, relax, and itch my full body rash. Hate, 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 Bob. I, I'm <laughs> blown away that you have that. Uh, Leif had it. Leif had um, it. Oh, my God. That's, that's, that's the, wild. That was, that was a wild time, man. Um, you know, getting back to it, it was a weird, you know, some – shrapnel that found itself right in the middle of my knee and it was hard to get to and i remember uh we had a conversation you know it, they weren't forcing me to go it, this was like a decision like man do what you want if you leave it in there it's going to tear up the inside your knee if you want that to happen um but I, I had a decision to make and that was kind of a tough one i didn't want to leave the guys i mean when you're in it like that and you're going through all that shit, the last thing you want to do is leave the guys and you know we, we talked about working to be dependable and being one of those guys that are relied on um so to get pulled out like that it just sucked and you know they, they were telling me uh, they were hopeful they thought they were going to be able to get in into it with a scope which is really easy throw a scope in there pull it out and they weren't able to do that so it just got a little bit more invasive but um i don't think i've shared this with anyone that kind of like how those couple days went um, I ended up, I, I caught a flight to, uh, I think it was a chopper to Balad. And then I took a uh, C-17 medevac plane, mm. which was wild. Yeah. Um, I mean, if no one's fortunate to be on, on something like that, if it's pretty gnarly. You know, basically that whole 17 was filled with wounded guys that were, they had stretchers stacked like four high all the way across. So um, to walk on ambulatory with a backpack, you know, just kind of kind of hit me there. And then had the surgery, um, you know, was uh, rehabbing, got got out of that, uh, <laughs> that awful, I mean, I just that, that email, I'm gonna have to get a copy of that. It, it takes me it takes me back. Um, but yeah, had, had some uh, some team guys there that were was that was that in Balad or was that was that email sent from Balad July 23rd or was that sent from Germany? No, that was from Germany. Okay. Yeah, that, that was post-surgery there. So I, I was in uh, in the, the hospital there. That's where they sent all the casualties there and uh, recuperating. They, they kept me in the hospital a couple of days and then um, they gave me an allowance to go get some clothes hmm. because a lot of people that go, I mean, they're like coming off the battlefield and it's hmm. not like, hey, go pack a suitcase. Um and I, I went and grabbed some clothes before uh, they were sending me to the to the debt over there. And I remember just kind of a funny little note is uh, they didn't have anything at the exchange. So I just got like some shitty clothes. And I looked just like 
you know, the, the dudes in Pulp Fiction, yeah, the yeah. events in... Uh, you see Santa Barbara. Yeah, I mean, whatever. just like a dork walking around Germany, you know, <laughs> rehab next two weeks there. But, uh, yeah, it, it, it was tough, tough being away from, from the guys and not knowing what's going on. And um, and then I got the call from from Jeremy on, on August 2nd, yeah. you know, that Mark was killed and uh, Biggles had been hit hard and was uh, was en route to, to Germany. In fact, the same hospital that, um, you know, I, I'd left at that point. I'd been out of the platoon for uh, two weeks, um, just for two weeks. So I mean, kind of a blessing in disguise to to be there, and to, and to see see Ryan and and to to be there for him. You know, although, you know, I, I don't know how cognizant he was. He was in a really really bad spot, mm. and uh, to be honest with you, it, it was it was hard to see him like that, like like really tough. Uh, but, you know, I I also got to be the liaison to his family there, which I know was was meaningful to them to hear a voice, someone who knew him, mm-hmm. um, you know, provide a little bit of comfort there. And so hung out with him for a little bit and then he got shipped to Was he still in a, a coma, like medically induced coma at that point? No, he was uh he was awake though, heavily, heavily sedated. Mm-hmm. And making, you know, I mean, just I, I I have him giggling a little bit, the best that he could kinda of giggle, but you know, he had hoses and all sorts of stuff and he just looked bad, you know. And definitely not not how I saw him last. So one of the uh, it was tough, you know, being not not being there with the guys during that event is just one of those things I don't share with the platoon. And, you know, I I don't say that lightly, um, you know, because there's pros and cons to that. Obviously, I I wasn't wasn't there, you know, wasn't able to help uh, all that stuff. But. On the other side, I'm thankful I didn't get to I I didn't have to see that. I got another email from you. Um, this is August 9th, two thousand six. Leif, today is Wednesday, and we will be on a flight with Mark out of Philadelphia to San Diego. We will get back at about eight o'clock tonight and transfer him to Greenwood Mortuary. Sorry about the lack of updates. Connectivity has been bad, and we've been on the road a lot trying to get down to see Ryan in Bethesda. I will call, I will try to call when I can to get through and talk to you guys about what I know. Ryan is getting better bit by bit. He's sitting up, he knows where he is. And he manages to speak to us when we are there, albeit slowly. It's kind of like he's really drunk from his medication. His girlfriend, Kelly, has been by his side pretty much nonstop, and his family has been there for him too. Every admiral in spec war is coming to see him. When Dauber, Biff, and I went to see him, we managed to make him laugh a bit, and he gave us a good TU Bruiser fist pound. His spirits are up, generally speaking, His left eye is a huge question. They ask us every time we are there if he could see out of it right after he got shot, and I can't really answer that question. I know the doctors are anxious to talk to Johnny Kim. The bottom line is that sometimes he can see light when they flash it into his left eyelid, and other times not. The current prognosis is not narrow. He may have all, none, or partial vision in his left eye, and it is going to be crucial in these next few days to find out for his sake. Mark still doesn't know about his right eye, and he still doesn't know about Mark. Just yesterday, he found out he wasn't still in Iraq. His dad is going to take the burden and tell him all these things as soon as he isn't so heavily sedated, and they are hoping to tell him that his left eye is okay. Everyone is expecting him to be pretty upset, understandably, and his dad has already been asking us if there will be a place for Ryan in spec war if he only has the use of one eye. One of the captains from Warcom here told him absolutely they will find something. Hopefully that will help ease the burden 
when he hears all the bad news at the same time. As much as you can imagine, or as, as you can imagine, the family is pretty upset, but they are grateful for all the support. There's a guy here, Chris, from Group 2 Medical. He is a frogman who has been by their side throughout. He is a pretty good point of contact for you guys if you want the no shit situation. He is also going to escort Mrs. Job out to Mark's funeral. He is great and has really been taking care of Ryan's family. That is about it for, for what we know. As for Mark, you guys know about as much as we do. The memorial will, and all will be on Saturday. Good to hear the updated version of the video Nick made was sent. We have a ton of Mark's pictures already, and we'll put something together for the family. We are flying out of out at 5 East Coast time and get to San Diego at 8. We'll make sure to get pics and whatever is handed out at the funeral for all of you guys. Bob. God, man. Fucking just took me back there. I, I don't know where. I, I'm surprised. Leif had these these emails. Um, yeah, I, that was a heavy time, man. Yeah, yeah. It's um, it's really strange that like these emails. I mean, you, they just get saved. You know, these are these are like civilian emails that you know you are going back and forth with Leif, and li- li- like I have I have emails that I sent to my wife, and. It's very interesting because they're all like they're they don't say anything like I know everything that's going on and I'm like hey how are you and it's very strange to see it um, yeah so you ended up flying home with mark did you fly home with mark I I wasn't in the uh they call that the hero flight. Yeah, is that what that's called? Angel flight. Angel, Angel flight. flight. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, no, I I wasn't on that. I, I flew flew separately. Um, the uh, other guys that that went, you know, left country were the actual escorts. Yeah, because we sent home three guys. Do we send three guys home? I think we sent three guys home. Um, and then like, it, you know, going to the service that just had to be. Yeah, it's so I, crazy for you. It, it was, man. It's uh, how everything went down. You know, um, you know, I, I left, and then this happened, and then we're flying back. It was, it was a whirlwind of like every emotion you could possibly be feeling, and then on top of that, um, you know, the, the other guys spoke at the service. I, I didn't speak at the service, and uh, I wasn't capable of it to be honest with you. Um, so the, the guys did a really good job, but you know, I was kind of sitting in the back. During during the service, it was it was fucking weird, yeah, hmm. yeah. Hold that whole time, and then we we buried Mark, um, and then the other guys. I think they went back pretty quickly. Yeah, after they went that. back pretty quick. And and I hung out. And one of the things, my situation. Uh, I, I was trying to stay in, in Germany um, because we had kind of felt that was my path back. Yeah, like closer. Yeah, yep. yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, if we're out in Germany, there's a chance of getting back. I want to get back, and then I got to San Diego. And they don't, they didn't want me to get to go back. So the, you know, doctors wanted me to heal, and then I think the command. Yeah, I mean, they just want to send, they didn't want to send me back. Um, it was a tough time, man, and I, I wrestled with it, and you know, like that first email, you know, makes it sound like I'm super gung ho, and it's the the reality is is. All the shit goes down. It's like a month. Something has passed. No one wants me to go back. Like you know, those kind of demons on my shoulder. Like, fuck it, man. You know, just hang back. We're we're creeping in. But I just had this like overwhelming sense of guilt. Um, you know, and and knew I had to get back out to the boys and and felt in maybe some way that that was like maybe, um, I don't know, some sort of gift that I could give them, you know, some, some sort of positive thing, um, not replacing anything, anything like that, but just something positive to bring the platoon that had gone through so much. Um, and, and I found my way back. So, uh, thank you guys for, for making that happen. That was, you know, I, I mentioned it prior, but you know, your, your life, there's just these kind of micro decisions and moments that kind of 
define you, I think, in, in little ways. And uh, I would have regretted not going back. Uh, I, my entire life, I would have regretted that. Yeah, well, it's a representation. Like, when Cowie got wounded, he he was, like, in Charlie Med telling me, like, please let me stay. Freaking bagels, blind, like, talking to him like uh, can I come back and you know you were in a situation where you you could come back and you did you know which is f- freaking outstanding um, and you know I remember there was definitely resistance there was definitely resistance from like and probably for the right reasons I get it you know NSW trying to take care of the force and everything like that but man it was it was freaking good when you came back I mean, it was freaking good for everything. Yeah, it it was good for me, and uh, everything had changed. I mean, that that's like I said, that is a moment in time. Um, all the shit that I'd been through with Charlie Platoon, everything, um, the most meaningful moments, I wasn't there, you know. So that's that's the kind of gap in that kind of uh, history there. But I I got to go back and uh, help the platoon and and the troop heal, and. And we went back to work. Yeah, you we, know. Yeah, we went back to work. That was it, man. And that was um, what we owed to those guys. And that's what we do, man. We're frogmen. Um, and then, I mean, obviously, you know, we we weren't done losing guys yet because um, we had we had Mikey get killed, yeah. uh, which was another nightmare. Um, and you know we we had a lot of guys get wounded too. You know, I guess Cowie being the, the worst of the guys that got wounded. Um, a lot of guys got fragged. A lot of guys got you know took a hit here. Um, pretty much, you and Cowie were the only ones that had to leave, right? Anyone else? Uh, no. No, no that was one else. it. Yeah, and mine was yeah. I caught the million dollar wound. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Other than obviously when when Mikey died, you know. Mike, Doug, they they were they were jacked up yeah. and they got Kazavac. It was the end of deployment, so it, you know it's like uh, kind of their going, their redeployment. Almost, it was almost yeah. their it was maybe a few days early, um, and so <sighs> what were you thinking when you came home from that deployment? And I, I felt like. Uh, I felt like I, I'd seen kind of everything that I needed to see and gotten out of the teams. That's kind of how I was feeling. I was, you know, th- three platoons deep. Uh, I mean, certainly was in the shit that entire deployment, and I was just a little bit kind of kind of tired and burnt. And I, I'd had a plan. I, I never, I never planned to do a career in the teams. I mean, I, I was like, I got pulled kicking and screaming every reenlistment contract. In like three year intervals until finally it's like, hey, dude, just do it, you know. Um, I was planning on getting out, so I actually got I had orders to trade at, um, and those got switched over to buds. So I ended up going over to buds, and uh, the intent was to finish school, to go back and and uh, get my degree, and then to get out and go go work for my mom who had like a uh, a leasing business mm-hmm. essentially. So that was that was kind of the thought. Um, I, I had a loose plan going into it, uh, and yeah, you know, I just I also felt um, extremely grateful to come back in one piece from from that deployment, and definitely for a couple of years. You know, whenever you've been through something like that, you realize how inconsequential, like all this other bullshit that we stress and worry about, and all these other things, how they just don't matter. You know. And that's kind of freeing a little bit. Uh, it doesn't last forever, though. And then you get caught up in life and all the other bullshit. But I, I do remember, um, yeah, I, I, I lived it up. I, I had a lot of fun as a buds instructor. You know, what? What? Where did you work at buds? I ended up being uh, the pre phase. It's gone by different names. Mm-hmm. Um, pre buds, fourth phase, whatever the yeah initial guys are showing up there. Yep, yep. Um, did that and went to school. Uh, joined a dodgeball league. Uh, played played with Leif. 
Hell yeah. Down down in <laughs> down in OB, uh, and and we were just crushing souls in Ocean Beach, man, with these poor poor hippies who didn't have uh, health insurance and just bashing faces and. Uh, <laughs> Check. Did you, as you're as you're at Buds now, seeing it from the other side? Did you work Hell Weeks? Yeah. And yeah. What was that I like? Did. Like, what did you learn from that? Uh man, I remember. It. I mean, first of all, seeing behind the scenes is, is really really neat to kind of go full circle and, and to see the, that other side. But, um, yeah, I learned being at Buds and, and in Hell Week that you you don't know like what guys are actually going to make it through. And I remember a couple of times being surprised and, uh, uh, Chuck Keating was actually one of the guys I, I remember putting oh, through, right putting through training and, uh, in hell week, he was emaciated. I mean, I, I don't know. Like don't, couldn't hold down his food maybe or something like that. I don't know if he was sick or had pneumonia or something, but like he lost a lot of weight and was gaunt and just seeing guys like that power through. It's like, mm-hmm. fuck yeah, man. Dude, like this is yeah. <laughs> teams. Teams is great. This is the best organization in the world so you know being able to see that and uh it was fun man it was good and and to be a part of people's history like if you remember all of your instructors yeah and hold them to high regard whether they deserve that or not you know that uh that impression that that you get from those instructors it lasts a lifetime and i still remember my instructors that way so um, it, it was really cool later in my career to run into guys a decade later and like, hey, you put me through buds. Do you remember this? And to hear all the funny, stupid shit that I said. And uh, <laughs> it's good, man. And, 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 and sometimes, you know, I mean, guys come back like, hey, I, I remember you telling the story or, or doing this, man. It's just like it feels good. It's cool. I, I never worked at buds. And so I now I kind of like would like to go and work at Buds right now just to kind of see what it's like. But it was always kind of like, oh, no, I'm in the teams, dude. I'm not going to go back to Buds. Why would I do that? But I think you'd learn a lot and or just not not even learn a lot, but or yes, learn a lot, but also just interesting to see. Like I was talking to Andy Stumpf and he was talking about like he he was in second phase and did pool comp and he, he has like all these little things that he can tell you about oh when he'd see a guy's like hands do a certain position he's like oh this guy's about to go like he's about to bolt to the surface oh if he doesn't bolt to the surface his hands do that and he doesn't bolt to the surface oh that means he's about to like freaking pass out or he just had all this knowledge about like watching people in really stressful situations and how they react and it's just i mean you must have seen that in hell week you're like oh this guy's about to break and you can decide like well if i say this to him probably going to get to the next evolution if i say that to him he's about to ring the bell well yeah and, and that's what you're trying to do is you're trying to get people you know to quit mm-hmm. essentially you're, you're trying to create that environment that people reach that moment of despair and either charlie mike through or they quit i mean that's that's what that's what the selection program is trying to do um and people will say like oh, my my son's going to buds could you have any advice for him or like i'm going, I'm going to buds do you have any advice for him? i was like yeah don't quit that's the freaking advice. Don't quit. Yeah. Train, train, prepare yourself and don't quit. Yeah. Don't quit. Yeah. There's, there, there, there is no magic sauce. No. Yeah. Don't quit. That's magic. Yeah. Don't quit. Could be. <laughs> um, so now you're, you're, you're saying you were planning to get out. I was. Yeah. So, uh, I had a three year tour, uh, set at buds and, uh, yeah, I, I was supposed to get out and I think 2009 or 10, um, and then the market tanked for one. Mm-hmm. There, there were some contributing factors. Mm-hmm. And then uh, more importantly, Leif recruited me to stay in. Hell yeah. Um, he was going back to, he was the OPSO, I believe the OPSO at Team, Team one. 1. yeah. And he was uh, fleeting up to be the XO. And, and, and this was his pitch is, uh, hey man, you know, come back. I'm going to pair you with Jeremy. You do a platoon together. Um, and that's exactly what he did. He <sighs> I, that's a solid pitch it's a solid pitch and it's like you know what this whole getting out thing the economy tanking you know what's another couple more years um and that was also my opportunity to do a, a, a leadership tour a, mm-hmm. a true like leadership tour um as a leading petty officer so uh i got pulled over there actually i left uh i started kind of doing like a mini workup once i knew i was like going to the team and i'm like all right you know because you don't go to buds to get sharp for seal shit. Mm. Um, so I started kind of doing, doing some uh, kind of workup stuff, jumped on a couple trips. And then I wanted to, 
you know, I, I wanted to get the buds stink off of me a little bit. So I, I found my way, uh, snuck on Team One's deployment. They were deploying in 2009 um, as just a strap hanger, mm-hmm. basically. Mm-hmm. And I did did a couple of months, uh, went out to Afghanistan. Um, didn't do anything out there, mm-hmm. to be honest with you. But, uh, you know, it gave me a chance to kind of get out there and, and get away from buds a little bit, interact with the team that I was going to be working at. And then, uh, yeah, Jeremy and I linked up, and, and we, we did a pump. Bro, that's freaking ridiculous. I mean, yeah, that's just awesome, doing a doing a deployment with your, the LPO, and your, your best friends, the freaking platoon chief. Yeah, and I, 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 was, <laughs> in on, all, I, I was in all of Jeremy's platoons, so. Damn, yeah, dude. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's freaking impressive. Um, and. Now you guys are just kicking ass because normally there's like this whole period the platoon has to go through where everyone got to get to know each other. The leadership's got to learn to work together and they're having their little ego, but you guys just roll right in 100% on. Not to mention all your SOPs, you're like, hey, this is what we're doing. This is how we're doing it. That must have been ridiculous. Yeah, it, it was great, man. I mean, there was no no conflict at all between Jeremy and I. And, and you know, we, we rock and rolled and it, it made us a strong platoon. Uh, you know, we had a great OIC, good, good group of dudes. And... Yeah, man, I, it, it went really well and, and really neat. And, you know, I'll take working with people that I know, especially good people, you know, we go back to the old two, two birds in a bush, one, one in a hand yeah. thing. What is it? Five birds in a bush and <laughs> one in the three in the hand? Yeah. What is it? Don't, yeah. don't. Every day of the week. So we, we were set up for, for success. Uh, you know, had a good work up. Shit got a little bit weird around deployment just because uh, of world events and some some changing things, but we were supposed to deploy. Uh, you know, we did our whole workup, um, you know, thinking we were deploying to Afghanistan. So Afghanistan was heating back up. Mm-hmm. Um, this was an area that uh, I was excited to go operate in. You know, I mean, just austere. Um, so I was really pumped to get get a chance to go there. Um, the troop we were in, um, some of the guys had been there prior, so. Um, but it didn't, it didn't work out that way. We ended up, for whatever reason, there was uh, a delay in our deployment. They swapped shit around, shit happens. Um, and we didn't deploy on schedule. In fact, it was like several months later. So bags bags were packed. And um, this is actually when I was introduced to, to golf. Who introduced you to golf besides Navy SEALs, the movie? <laughs> Do you need anything else? Right. <laughs> So uh, was there a guy in a platoon or something that was in? You know it? the uh, I, I don't remember exactly who it was, but our, our bags were packed. Like the issues were packed. We were ready to deploy. I, I mean that that's where we were. Workup was done. You're deploying, and then I guess we were waiting on a deployment order. Mm-hmm. And it, it was like it's like a we're deploying on Monday, and then we show up on Monday. It's like no, nope. you know, wait 72 hours, and then that just kept going and going and going. Um, so our bags were packed. It's like what else are we going to do? Someone recommended that we go play golf I, I don't remember whose idea it was and <laughs> i don't really think i gave a shit but uh once i got out there man got it, hooked it got you huh? It, it, it got me i mean that that round it got me i think i hit one one ball i was like damn that felt good i felt good where'd you play yeah. north island yeah yeah that's a nice place to play i mean yeah. i guess right i'm not a golfer but it seems like a nice place to play you're in coronado yeah 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 that's good so you got your little uh introduction to golf how, like, did you get, did you go out and buy clubs and stuff? I went and I got, uh, I went to like a, a golf store and I got used clubs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like that same night, I think I went Damn. out. Yeah. I, I went out, I got some junk clubs and then just started, started whacking around. Now we obviously had a pending deployment. So, uh, you know, I think we actually went to, they had like a couple of, uh, charity things that we went to, went to a couple of golf events. Actually the platoon went, um, <laughs> And I actually, we, we ended up deploying, we deployed to Iraq, Damn. and I brought my golf clubs. Damn. Dude, yeah, golf is a thing. It's something I never talk, golf is a thing in the teams. For, like, certain team guys, they just, look, there's team guys that are into archery, there's team guys that are into jiu-jitsu, there's team guys that are into uh, skydiving, there's team guys that are into golf and a, and motorcycles. Like, there's little cliques of guys, but golf is absolutely on the list. Actually, I got a friend that was a... Uh, Older guy, not quite a Vietnam guy, but like a little bit after Vietnam. But he tells this story. His his wife 
um, like whatever a- after 13 years or something she, he comes home from work and like his shit is sitting outside in the yard and she says I hate the teams I hate golf and I hate you <laughs> <laughs> that was it bro getting divorced but that's like a team guy thing right like oh what do you care about the teams and then golf and for me it's like oh the teams and jiu-jitsu and some guys like the teams and motorcycles so they put all their money into motorcycles or golf or whatever and that's what they're doing all the time um, and it's it, but but golf is definitely one of the things like there's guys that surf in the teams What else? What are other little hobbies surfing? Jiu-jitsu these jumping. are mine jumping yeah. golf is in there man for some reason golf is in there, but like spear fishing uh, um, I'll tell you why man because the more you get into it. It's hard mm-hmm. and I say this with a grain of salt mm-hmm. like a huge one It's like all right how how hard is golf yeah. it's challenging it's a mental game though it it's a mental game Obviously. i mean there's a physical component there's a lot of strategy to it i mean there's a lot of shit going on in that golf swing that has to happen you know all within a split second and it's frustrating and to be a frogman or some type a dude who thinks that he can conquer the world and then you're hovering over this ball and you can't make it do what it should do it doesn't seem right mm-hmm. and that that's it like that that's what got me is like mm-hmm. Fuck this, man. Was like, anyone, when you went for the first time, was anyone good at it? Uh, there, there were a couple guys in the platoon. Yeah, and there's some competitions. Like, oh, that guy? Mm-hmm. That guy can hit the ball? Mm-hmm. Oh, I can do that. Sure. Uh, that deployment, you go to Iraq? I did, and this yeah. Is now, this is now like 2010, 2011, 2012. 11. 2011, you're going on deployment. Yeah, so we were... Uh, so Iraq is kind of shutting down. It did is, you guys close it down? It is actually shutting down. So we had uh, Jeremy and I, and I don't know, if, I mean, someone else can come out and be like, hey, I had that distinction as well. But I mean, we were the two guys that had the, the distinction of starting and ending like a war, kind of. Because mm. we were there during the invasion oh, and we damn, were part nice. of the last element when they closed down December, whatever it was, 2011. Um, made a nice little certificate about it. And, and then did you guys leave Iraq on that deployment? Like you personally, you and Jeremy personally, like left Iraq and went somewhere else? We closed it down and we redeployed it. Where, so you went back to America? Yeah. 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 So that yeah. was it. And it, you were the last troops there. Like, I mean, mission accomplished. Mission accomplished. Yeah. Well, did you do anything good on that deployment or was everything kind of like winding down? No, nothing sexy. It, it was winding down and uh, it was like catch and release. So we were grabbing bad dudes, but because of the inner squabbling and politics, mm-hmm. they were getting released. So it's kind of like, what are we doing? What's the point? Um, kind of suck. But we did have what was really neat was we were the last show in town in terms of soft um, and Again, it, there may have been another element or something out there, but pretty much the last show in town. And But all the assets were still there. So, like, all these great assets, we had everything. That's sweet. I mean, all sorts of overhead stuff, like everything that you – everything we wanted for every deployment, we had at our disposal. So it was really neat to kind of run the mission like that mm-hmm. with having too much shit. Um, but, yeah, it, it was kind of anticlimactic. We, we closed it down. And and head back and uh, that was it. Short deployment too. And then you roll right into another de- deployment. Did you make chief during that deployment? I did. I, I made chief uh, right before we deployed. So we ended up. Um, I got. I actually got sent to southern Iraq uh, for a month or two and had my own debt. So mm-hmm. I, I was a chief, had my own debt. And that was a really neat feeling to like. All right, yeah, I got my group and kind of like a prelude to being a platoon chief. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then we we joined forces, I think, in Baghdad um, with the entire platoon, and then beat feet, and then yeah, I I got back, and uh, by that point the the incoming CMC just asked me, hey, do you want do you want a spot? And uh, you don't turn down spots. Hell no, not for a platoon chief. No, but there was a caveat. Uh oh, we were we were reorging the team. Uh, Iraq was closed down, and they were looking to get back towards the uh, Pacific. With our team in particular, so that was the catch. Like, hey, if you're standing team one, this is what's happening. Do you want in? And I was like, yeah, man, I'm in. Cool, platoon chief. How'd that feel? Felt great. I mean, that that is uh for me that was the pinnacle. You know, when being an enlisted seal, you know that that was everything I wanted to be was to to run your own platoon, and you feel like, you know, 
doing all the platoons and workups and deployments prior, you feel prepared and all those lessons learned and everything I learned from Tony and my other chiefs and, and Leif and, and everyone else had kind of prepared me for that moment. So it's, it's just an awesome feeling to now have this thing that is your own. And I, I say that, I mean, you, you have an OIC, your shared responsibility. It's yeah, your yeah. platoon, but you know, the, the platoon chief is really running those platoons and has a heavy amount of influence. So to be able to take all the lessons learned and kind of infuse that in that time, um, which is awesome, man. And kind of the honor, honestly, of my career. Of all the shit I did, one of the most rewarding things I did, you know, even aside from the combat stuff, was to be able to to raise a platoon and to do it the way that you think is right. Um, and had a great group of guys, man. We had a lot of fun. We made that, uh, you know, it, it was challenging managing expectations with guys that, you know, didn't have a combat deployment. Mm-hmm. We had a lot of guys who didn't have a lot of combat experience being told that they're not going, you know, to the show for this deployment. So in terms of the leadership challenge of getting people on board with, you know, this new mission, this mm-hmm. new mission for us is to go here and, and do this. And, and while that may not be sexy like this other stuff, it's important and here's why. And in going through all that and, uh, and doing it like in a genuine way that people weren't like, this guy's just selling out and this is all bullshit. Everything we do doesn't matter. And, and ultimately, um, you know, we, we trained hard and we did things the right way and we did all this shit to be a good platoon, which is what you should be doing is training hard, making yourself better, you know, as an operator, as a platoon. Um, so I think we did well with that. Uh, I was um, talking to a guy that was in that platoon and uh, apparently you guys got a lot of um, Arnold on. <laughs> a lot of pumping iron and <laughs> and a lot of uh, predator. So you just kept the you kept the theme going, the yeah. action theme going through the whole through your whole career. Yeah, man. So I, again, I I've been a movie buff, you know. So every time I could infuse something into it, uh, something we used to do is uh, we would roll out to training evolutions playing the theme song from Predator. <laughs> yeah. What is that? The dun dun dun. What is that one? Yeah. What's the? Th- I'm not going to do it. But Come yeah, on. I, I know it. I don't want to do it either. <laughs> okay. You guys are weak. Yeah. Okay. Knew what it was. Ba, it, ba, ba. Apparently you, uh, and I tried to get a hold of this, your Charlie platoon manifesto, which I'm sure we'll get, I'll get a hold of it at some point. Somebody will have a copy of it, but laying out, Hey, this is what a frogman is. This is what's expected of you guys. Uh, from what I understand that left a big mark on the boys that you, that worked for you. Yeah. I, you kind of don't know what's what's going to stick, and you know it, it was cool to see that thing still exists and someone has a copy of it. Um, but yeah, I, I did my best. I, I felt I felt obligated. Everything that I had kind of seen and learned, and kind of where the teams were kind of evolving, and the different experiences that guys were showing up, and you know the different experience that I was kind of bringing, I, I felt obligated to, to pass whatever I could along. Um, and you, you know you spend the better part of 12 years in the teams, you're going to see a lot of things done poorly and you're going to see a lot of things done well. So, um, yeah, you know, I, I mean, I was telling you nothing pills in comparison to all the great stuff that, that you've written, but, um, yeah, I tried to try to leave a little, little mark there. And, uh, I'll tell you what, man, it's just so cool now to see now that I've moved on to see these guys leading platoons and to be, and to lead the community, mm-hmm. um, how that goes full circle, um, it wasn't always easy, man, you know, but really, really cool to, to see that happen. Yeah. Like they, um, <clears throat> I know you made a patch for that. What was your patch at, that you made for the team one? What was it? Uh, you know, the, the Bravo one was uh weird, it was just kind of a hodgepodge. Mm. Um, but the, the Charlie patch that I, well, I, I won't say I, and we, although heavily influenced by, by the platoon chief was, a uh, TCB. <laughs> which is uh, Elvis slang for taking care, Take of business care of business in a flash. So <laughs> we were a Charlie platoon, so there was a big emphasis on the C and the patch, mm-hmm. and we had the lightning bolt, and uh, yeah, that was us. I forgot to do the whole Elvis thing. Like in Tasking a Bruiser, we had, you guys got the freaking card, because you're an Elvis fan, you got this freaking cardboard cut out. It was in the, it was in the, like, our, our planning area in yeah. Ramadi, a yeah. freaking cardboard cut out of Elvis. The king made it to Ramadi, but <laughs> he didn't make it back. I, I don't know where he ended up unless someone 
has been holding them hostage for 18 years. And you guys hit Graceland in work up too. You probably time. did that every yeah, time. I, I was, uh, I, was I, I am a big Elvis fan, especially like late 70s. Yeah. Or not, not, <laughs> yeah, yeah, mid, mid, late 70s where, you know, the, the tempo, it's just, he's going with it. Um, but yeah, I, I went to Graceland <laughs> for three workups. <laughs> Went with uh, went with Johnny and, and some of the boys and, and Leif, um, that last one for sure. Fired up. Is that where you guys got the? Is that when you got the the cardboard cutout? I that was probably Leif's doing. Okay. Yeah, Leif was really good about that. But uh, yeah, I, I think Leif got it. Check. Yeah. Um. So you got this this uh, manifesto going on, um, and th- now this is like 2012. You said that's this is when your dad died, right? 2012. It is. Yeah. So uh, my dad, you know, I told this story uh, a while ago, but um, yeah, just suffered from alcohol, alcoholism his entire life. So that was, that was his, he carried a lot of burden, uh, abandonment, loss of his brother. Um, he didn't pass that down to me like in a way that was damaging to me other than seeing him, you know, hurt himself over that period. But, you know, he had a problem with alcohol uh, my entire life and Went into the teams, um, and he tried to tried to get sober. Like this is in 2004, a week before my second deployment, and you know, not knowing what I know now, especially about coming off of uh, alcohol and, and other drugs, is you can't just cold, mm-hmm. you can't quit cold turkey. Uh, and he gave himself a stroke. Mm-hmm. So 2004, gave himself a stroke, and was just like from that point on, from 2004 to. Uh, 2008, he ended up uh, divorcing his wife. Um, it, it just got bad, you know, so he, he was just, and it wasn't even, a, there was booze involved, but he was heavily medicated. They didn't know what to do with him, and there was a, like a lot of 5150 shit um, over those years to where he was getting getting picked up on the street, you know, just just suffering, man. So me, uh, 2012, uh, basically his, his organs gave out, and winded up in, in the hospital and they were keeping him, you know, on life support. So I was in work up when that happened and pulled myself out, uh, went home and, you know, my brother and I, I mean, basically pulled the plug on my dad. And, and then, uh, you know, a couple of days later did a celebration of life for him. And then I went right back to a platoon. So like not much of a, a break um, or time to wallow for that. Uh, you know, my, my dad and I, we, we left on, on good terms. Uh, you know, I mean, he was, he was, he was a loving dad, did, did a lot of great things, right? Like raised me right in a lot of ways. I get all my manners, you know, from him, those good old, uh, Texas manners, uh, taught me how to fish, uh, shoot. Um, you know, so obviously, uh, losing anyone's tough, losing your dad is tough. And that was, that was a rough time, man. You know, it, it was that that period that year um it just the hits kept coming uh you know there there was a bright bright spot my my second kid was born 6 months after i lost my dad so yeah that that was great um but then just 3 months after that you know chris was murdered um where were you when you heard about that uh we were on work up mm-hmm. we were just in san diego um i i don't recall uh, shit. You know what? It, it was a former platoon mate that uh that called me. I, I was in town. Uh, you know, hit us with the news, and then we assembled and uh, you know, went went to Texas. Yeah. Yeah, that was. I mean, yeah, just just a freaking nightmare. Um. Uh. Yeah, it was. It was a rough time, man. I, I, I had a rough year there. And, uh, you know, aside from the tragedy, uh, you know, of those events as well, the stress of being a platoon leader, mm-hmm. um, you know, we had a pending deployment, all that, uh, jacked up my back big time. Like this was like, you know, wasn't anything like I, I, I broke bones or, or anything like that, but it was it was extremely painful um, right before deployment and a broken bone sometime would be better. It's like, just freaking break the bone. 
the weird like muscular freaking soft tissue shit yeah that stuff and like if you talking to your buddy and you're like oh yeah i have a broken vertebrae they're like oh okay cool like i get it like you can we accept your excuse when you're like well my back kind of hurt <laughs> it's like yeah. the worst right mm. my back's sore I mean, it feels weird yeah. you know it's like <laughs> just it's the worst yeah i I was walking around, I mean, with wraps and all this stupid stuff and doing everything I could to relieve that. I, you know, I deployed and luckily we weren't in a, doing a combat deployment. So a lot of training though. Um, but yeah, I, you know, just, just kind of a weird rough time, just trying to keep my shit together, you know, and, and not let that impact the, uh, the platoon. I mean, especially this is like my chance to, to lead a platoon and, you know, not to muff it up. So, um, but Luckily, you had a great group of guys, and uh, they made it really easy. So. What was it like with Chris? Um, the, like, kind of this whole image of Chris from the outside world, and then you know us guys knowing him, and and then like you who like obviously did multiple deployments with him, and um. Man, it was like, what was your perspective when you saw like the world watching Chris and reacting? And like, I didn't know this, but uh, I think American Sniper is the most popular military movie of all time. Like, beats Saving Private Ryan, beats Platoon. Like, it's, wow. Yep. It's the most popular. I don't know. Maybe Top Gun has got it now, but it, like, it, what did it look like for you? Like, didn't didn't we we all? I don't know if you were at this. They had like a screening of the movie yeah. in Coronado for yeah. us, and we all went to it, and it was really like weird. It it was weird, man. And you know, there's some uh, structural issues when you're trying to fit someone's life into yeah, 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 for sure. a two hour block. You know, so was, you know, trying to make sense of all right. Okay, what what is this? But yeah, I mean, I was glad to see, you know, Chris Chris had a reputation. I mean, the stuff he did in Fallujah was, you know, kind of it was just legendary, man. You know, I mean that that's that's what uh that's where he got the name or, you know, in that time frame. But um, he did a lot of great shit, man, and you know took care of business down there and it's, to see him get the credit for it and, and tell the story and kind of the full, full cycle to kind of the, you know, redemption aspect of him going through all that shit. Like I, I told you when I was done with my third platoon, I, I was mentally smoked, mm -hmm. right? I, I need to take a break. Chris stuck around mm -hmm. and hit another. Yeah. Into Sodder city, by the way, into Sodder city yeah. had another tough deployment. Um, so he got was shot, got shot in the helmet. Did you hear that? Well, you probably knew. I yeah. mean, he got shot in the helmet. Yeah. Like, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, so he volunteered for the hardest duty. I mean, was in Fallujah, that uh, that second pump when we weren't even in Iraq. So, I mean, he constantly volunteered for the hardest duty, put himself in the front lines. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, I, I felt I'm, I'm glad he was recognized for that. And uh, I'm glad, you know, the story was told um, of him kind of going full circle and, you know, I, I didn't keep in great touch with him whenever he got out. And I, I did reach out like when the book was coming out and, you know, just like reconnecting with him a little bit. But he did he did reply back to me and it just was uh, super glad that he left when he did and like super thankful and grateful that he got to be daddy. I, I remember I, I was actually looking through some old stuff and, you know, came across a, a note there that uh, that was one of the things that he really appreciated was you know, getting out of that and being, being, uh, being a father, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And then, I mean, obviously Biggles, w when, when Biggles died, which again, it was like, what was hard about those guys, it was like, we were home, you know? And like, yeah. we all think, oh yeah. Like, w like you said, it's not supposed to happen. Yeah. It's not supposed to happen. And, um, f freaking just terrible. And you know, the, the, the movie, I remember we went to see the movie and you're just like, well, you don't really know what to expect. And it's just kind of overwhelming to see this movie and just, and you know, the, like you, like you pointed out and what I've come to realize what you pointed out is like, they had to take a guy's 
life, his whole life. Um, four deployments, four combat deployments, his w- wife and family, his growing up family, his mom. They had to take that whole thing and put it into an hour and a half. Like that's 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 an impossible task. And so you got to kind of look at it from a different frame of mind. And I think what it did do is it, it did a great job of showing, you know, what the stress is on the family, what, it, you know, Taya's wife had been through his kids and like the fact that you said, you know, like he was trying to, you know, he was coming back. He was going to move in that direction. And I think that's what they look, the combat stuff. It is what it is. This the the way they make things look in Iraq. It kind of is what it is. But to s- tell the story of, you know, and it, it's not just Chris's story. It's the story of so many guys that went on deployment and their families that had to deal with that and the aftermath. So, um, the only th- the other thing that always kind of bums me out is like Chris being such a freaking wise ass and being so funny and being like just. They just didn't capture that yeah. kind of at all. Like, they didn't really show. Like, dude, this guy was fr- funny as hell. Like, would be harassing people, making he, jokes, practicing the whole nine yards. He was not sulking or brooding. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he was he was a wise ass and salty as hell. Yeah, and f- and a cackling, <laughs> aggressive laugh that like if somebody did something. And he was laughing. It was like little darts were hitting. You yeah. know, you could just you, you hear that cackling freaking laugh. So I'll I'll give you just like a little tidbit of Chris's you know mischievous nature. Um, he, used, he used to like to poke me. I mean, we were buddies. We would often on uh, training trips when we had to share rooms or whatever. We'd share rooms, so we'd like do little pranks and stuff. But on our second deployment, we were uh, in Baghdad in like an abandoned building or whatever. And in between ops, I mean, it was sleeping and lift, like get super strong and watch movies and, you know, and until you have something to plan for or whatever. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I used to like my quiet time and I, mm-hmm. I was known to nap occasionally. So I, I would nap and uh, close my door. I, I had my own little room and he did not want me napping. You know, he <laughs> He didn't think that was right. So what what he would do is he would he come and he didn't think that was right. <laughs> he he would doorbell ditch me. He'd come and like knock on my door and bang bang bang, and then you know I'd come out and he'd get me all riled up. And this went on for like a couple months, and I got like really pissy about it. And I actually went to the extent to go get like you know surreptitious camera equipment <laughs> and, and set up to to catch him. I end up not not catching him, but uh, yeah, he's funny dude, great guy. Um, yeah, man, he's missed. Yeah. Um, and then that deployment as a platoon chief, you guys deploy kind of a standard uh, doing exercises and stuff yep. overseas. Um, it wasn't a combat deployment. This is probably the maybe around the low point of combat for the teams. Yeah, I guess it depends on where you are. But for you, it was. Yeah, that's your first non-combat deployment. It, it was, it's and pretty uh, impressive, man. I'll tell you what was. Kind of neat. I mean, the younger guys didn't like it, mm-hmm. right? Because, and we all want to be in the shit, but it's easier to say, you know, when you have a couple of combat deployments, it's like, eh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm good. Um, but the guys that are eager, who've never done that, whatever, you know, didn't, didn't take it so lightly. But, yeah, you know, I, I kind of got that like '90s frogman pig on deployment and got <laughs> to see a lot of the world I'd never seen, mm-hmm. and uh, it was a blast, man. Yeah. I mean, I, I really had some fun and uh i mean honestly at the end of that thing we had done so much training like we were sharp mm-hmm. oh right. man our cqc so tight mm-hmm. um yeah good good group of dudes and uh good deployment different type of deployment mm-hmm. but but rewarding in different ways and by the way you're married this whole time when did you get married so you yeah. married beth your high school sweetheart i did yeah i i married uh yeah sorry don't don't want to forget that no one. i know we're no Thank beth you, you are at the top of our story, but we had to cover some other things. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, so Beth. we ended up, uh, you know, we broke up for a while whenever I, I went psycho pre Navy and mm-hmm. then, uh, started dating again after my first platoon. And then, uh, we got married after, after that Ramadi deployment. Okay. So 2007 check. Yeah. Right on. And, and so she's, she racked up a bunch of deployments. She Bunch did. She, she earned it, and uh, and then I, I have two kids. You know, so one was born uh, in two thousand nine, and then the other in two thousand twelve. Yeah. yeah. Now, after that platoon chief tour, you decide you're going to do uh, you're going to switch over to warrant officer. 
Well, it, it kind of, uh, the tour got extended. They, they ended up uh, kind of keeping us together. There was another reorg undoing okay. what they had already done. <laughs> classic, classic, classic move. Um, so they kept us together. We did, we did like another year and it was like kind of do your own workup, which is kind of fun. And then we did a, another mini deployment to Paycom. So it's like another year. Mm-hmm. And then um, at the end of that, it was clear that I hadn't thought one second beyond being a platoon chief. Mm-hmm. This was like all the way back in high school again, like no plan <laughs> whatsoever. Um, but thankfully, you know, being around good people, someone's going to have a good idea. And one of those people was Jeremy. Mm-hmm. Jeremy had gone warrant the year prior. Check. And I was like, you know, I didn't really think much of it until I was in the position. I'm like, hey, man, what's this uh, warrant deal? I'm looking for I'm looking for a change. And at that point of the career, you know, you have as an enlisted dude, you have a couple different options. Um, you know, you can go the senior enlisted route and or, you know, you can do something like what I did. Um, and I just wanted to do something different. So I, I thought I, I liked I liked that the warrant officer career path was just a little bit different and I thought would challenge me in some different ways. So I put it in a package and um, they must have been low on candidates that year because I got picked up. <laughs> so you get picked up for warrant officer and and now you go to SEAL Team 3. Um, back to Team Three. That must have been kind of cool. Yeah, yeah, that, that was that was really cool. Although in a much, I mean, we talk about going full circle to. Oh yeah, you're you know, like being being a hellion to uh, a company man. Uh, you know, working working up in ops and and with the headquarters. Yeah. And then you 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 know you basically become the training officer. Is that what's going on? Yeah. So we jumped on deployment pretty quick. Um, went back to Iraq. So newsflash, if you haven't been following the news over the last decade, we end up going back into Iraq um, and was kind of thrown to the wolves in terms of like, you know, one day you're commissioned, kind of no training, and then you're like right in the op shop. So I was right right on the wrong side of the ops mm-hmm. in Iraq. Um, <laughs> did that, came back, and then was the, the training officer for that. You know, we did a full cycle. Got it. At, at Team Three, and then where'd you go the next time on deployment? Um, we did a went out to the Middle East, a non non combat zone. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, kinda. and are you still into golf at this point? Yeah, because as yeah. a warrant officer, you got a little bit more, a little bit more flex time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's almost like an Echo Charles type schedule. <laughs> <laughs> Especially after we got back from Iraq, I found myself being in San Diego like a lot, having a lot of time. So yeah, I, I ramped up. That was actually when. You know, the, golf had been an, an obsession kind of up to that point, but like not in a mature way, right? Just like whenever I had time, I'd go golf. And uh, and honestly, in that kind of 2012, 2013, it got me through, I think, some kind of tough stuff there. But, you know, come after that deployment circa 2016-ish, I had some time to actually practice. And uh, lo and behold, like, would you be shocked that when you practice at something, you actually, like, get better? That's the way it works. Like, man. Unbelievable. I, yep. Yeah, I – I didn't have to be losing all these balls, you know, that often. So not, not that I'm good. I'm very far away from good, but I got a lot better. I started practicing and then it it just kind of like, you know, built some momentum there. Once you get a little bit better, um, you want to get better and better and better. And so that really gave me like, as I was kind of griping, you're dealing with this challenge of being out of a platoon, which, you know, whether you leave the Navy that way or it happens in your career, it's tough. You know, you spend an entire career, as this thing, as an operator, whatever it may be, and then you're a company man. I'm I'm working a desk job. I don't have the same buddies. I don't have those relationships. You know, it's important to have something else. Right? If that's jujitsu, mm-hmm. working out, um, whatever it is, I, I found golf. So I just like went into that, and that gave me something that I was constantly thinking about and, and working on. I never really thought about this. Even though I spent my adult life in the SEAL teams, you were talking about the fact that you were home during workup. And I was like, oh, damn. Because I was always in a platoon. So the fact that I was like, oh, all those people, a bunch of those people up in the head shed, they weren't freaking doing what, what a platoon guy's doing. A platoon guy's just going, just like you're just going. And you, I, didn't, I didn't even recognize that until like I was thinking about that. I was like, oh. There's a bunch of people that are just like going home at night. That's yeah. weird. It's weird. You know, and one thing I I didn't really talk about, but uh, I was still dealing with that back injury. That was part of the reason I wanted to go Warren. I 
because I felt like I was never going to mm, get better. Got it. I was like, this is it, man. You know, it's a, Did it's you ever like, figure out what the injury was? It a specific thing? Or was it like musculature? It, it was musculature and some imbalances. Yeah, I, I went like almost two years without any pain relief. And it was like gnarly, man. Yes. So I was like, you know, putting on shoes hurt. Everything we did, it was just excruciating. And if you've dealt with back issues, and there's a lot worse ones to deal with. But, um, yeah, I just really couldn't function with that. But I went in um, after that second pump I did, uh, second platoon chief deal, I went in in kind of desperation to the uh, physical therapy, and I, I'd been working with people and mm-hmm. no relief or whatever. And uh, you know, we're blessed that we have in the community. They hire like some legit dude. So yeah. guys that work for pro- professional sports yeah. teams, whatever. Jason, he was one of them. Check, um, check, right on. Um, not not for that event, but I, I worked with him before mm-hmm. that. But uh, anyways, I, I went back into this guy in desperation. I'm like, dude, I, figure this out, please. And within an hour, he had no shit, figured it out. And he's like, all right, dude, this is an imbalance. We're going to do this and this and this. And, you know, my leg was sucked up into my uh, my hip and was creating just all these kind of, uh, you know, contortion of forces there that were just – so, I mean, he whatever he did provided relief for the first time I had in almost, you know, a year and a half or whatever So did you have was. to go on some, like, stretching protocol or something? I, I did, yeah. And I, I did some things, and I ended up uh, strengthening some things and doing some other stuff. Um and knock on wood, haven't had that. I've had a couple of episodes, but I got th- I got mm. through that. I, I didn't think I was going to get through, but I actually ended up getting in, uh, I, dare I say, for me, ridiculous shape when I was a warrant. Like, dude, because you're, you're not getting hammered mm-hmm. on the work. The workup is hard on yeah. you, right? Like you're running and gunning, body armor, hopping over walls, just up and down, just getting beat down. There's like no rest, shitty sleep, just like all. Shitty all, sleep, shitty food, just all of it, all stress, of it. Yeah. beat down. But now, now I have an opportunity to like chill out a little bit, and uh, I got in great shape, and it is good, man. Yeah. So, you do a couple tours at Team Three, and now your 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 last I think your last tour is at SQT. Yeah. Yep. And what was your job there? I was the training officer. So just overseeing everything. That's it. Yeah. I, I mean, essentially, I uh, was responsible for the curriculum and execution of training so just making sure that our guys were getting the right type of training and that it was being conducted you know the right way so it it was a it was a good challenge i mean every kind of job i had in the teams was a new challenge Mm -hmm. outside of the platoon for sure and these sqt guys are getting freaking outstanding training oh dude for sure compared there's no doubt compared to what I got going through, and then the guys before me, like, did you go through STT? I or through STT, yeah. Yeah, I mean, everything has gotten more professional and yeah. better. So these guys are, you know, high-caliber fucking dudes when they show up to a team. Now, look, you're still a new guy. There's still, like, a lot to learn, but <laughs> they're starting their baseline. Hey, you. Yes, you. You're still a new guy. <laughs> I don't care how well you've been trained. You're yeah. still a new guy. <laughs> the, the baseline. The baseline is so much higher yeah. than, than what it used to be. Yep. Yeah. And then you – at that point, you're like going to retire. You decide to retire. Yeah. I, by this point, so I was kicking and screaming in terms of making it to 20 years. I didn't want to do a career really. Um, but then eventually I was like, okay, I'm going to do it. Commissioned as a warrant. I thought I'd do 25 years. Um, but I went to SQT and that was my real first shore duty that I'd had, you know, in about a decade. Mm-hmm. And I just took a deep breath. I was like, damn, it's time. And I thought that was a great place to end it on. I, I just thought it was like kind of full circle. I just ran, I, I lost steam. That was it. So uh, I made the decision to get out. Um, but yet again, I found myself in a position of like not knowing, you know, I I didn't have anything set up. <laughs> so what was your plan? To buy myself some time. Yeah, I ended up getting into, um, you know, I, I look around whenever I struggle to know what to do. Uh, I look to those around me that are doing doing things. Mm-hmm. And uh, there were some guys that were going um, through a MBA program up at UCLA, uh, executive MBA program. Um, so I was like, yeah, that's that's pretty cool. Um, you know, maybe I'll go learn about business, all the different facets of, of business. Maybe that would be good. You know, give me some skill sets to kind of lean on, get myself a good job. Um, so I thought I'd do that. And that, I ended up getting into that my last year on active duty. 
And that was right around, I mean, COVID 2020, shit got weird. So I, I ended up doing a, a year of school on, on active duty. Um, a lot of unknowns. During COVID? During, during COVID, yeah. So that was like probably pretty nice, I'm assuming, because it was like uh, whatever, virtual classroom or whatever? Yeah, it was easier. Yeah. I, I didn't enjoy it. You know, I, I wanted to be up in in, in person. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't you know, have a hard enough time learning as it is, <laughs> you know, especially on a computer screen. Um, but yeah, so, I, you know, I, I went through that program and uh, halfway through, ended up retiring. Still had no idea of what I wanted to do, although I had taken an entrepreneurship class and they had this class that was kind of like a uh, exploratory class. So you have a you have an idea, a business idea, something. Here's your opportunity to test the concept for kind of viability. Mm-hmm. It just you know just a semester's worth of research. So I had an idea. Um, I actually had this kind of epiphany during that period. I mean, I just woke up on a Saturday and was like, I'm going to make. At the time, it was a, a Navy SEAL inspired golf bag. So like inspired by the kit that we wear, designed in a way, um, and I ended up kind of drawing. I, I grew up drawing and, and doing stuff when I was a kid, but ended up drawing like for a whole weekend, like concept art. and Tactical golf bags. Yeah, yeah, kind of. Um, I like it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Had a name, had an idea, and I was like, I, you know, I don't know. I, it wasn't fully fleshed out, but I had this opportunity that next year – this entrepreneurship class, I still didn't know what I wanted to do at all. I had no clue whatsoever. And I was like, you know, let's, let's maybe just pitch this and let's see if there's something there. Um, had no idea what the market looked like, what the opportunity, you know, didn't really know anything. So I, the one prerequisite to be in the class is you either had to join a team or create a team. So I ended up recruiting people. I didn't know the class that well. We were six months in. So they had this kind of like bio book and I was going through and just looking for like anyone who had hobby of golf. <laughs> and uh, actually the first guy I came across, uh, Kevin Lee was in the bio book, hobby golf. I was like, boom. Yeah. I reached out to him and uh, he's like, Hey man, yeah, I'm in uh, you know, basically been in kind of manufacturing my entire career. So I was like, Oh yeah, great. Let's do it. So he was the first on the team. And then, uh, Re- recruited some other folks and we took that through a series of uh, multiple classes. So it was kind of like a, you graduate from one, you go, you have an ch- mm. option to go on to the next stage. And we started with one group, that first class, and then moving into the second class, we had to like reform teams essentially. So mm-hmm. Kevin stayed on, um, recruited some other people, had a, just a great team, super fortunate. And, and it just kind of built some steam, you know, the more that we kind of researched it and the more I fleshed out the idea of what later would be Hooli and kind of where we are, you know, we moved away from golf bags and, uh, you know, did this research and I thought there was room to get into uh, the apparel side and, and all that. And uh, Golf apparel. Golf apparel. And the company is called? Hooli. Hooli Golf. Yes, sir. I guess it's just Hooli. It's Hooli, yep. It's HooliGolf.com, right? It is. The The website is HooliGolf.com, H-O-O-L-I-E. Which golf. is named after? The Hooli tool. Yeah. So as a breacher, that's one of the tools that you carry. Sure, you carry explosives, you might carry a sledgehammer, and you might carry a Hooli tool, which is taken from the fire department, who uses either a hooligan tool or a halligan tool, right? Yeah, correct. I, I think... Uh, I think we talked about I know this, you and I so talked about yeah. it, but I, I don't fo- I think the Halligan is the guy that originally invented this tool, which looks like a big ass weird looking pry bar, basically. And then people copied the idea and but they couldn't use the same name because they kind of copied the idea, so they changed they changed the design a little bit. But that also is a very practical thing, and that's what in the SEAL teams, that's all we ever said was Hooli tool. Yeah. Probably because we're more hooligan ish. Well, yeah, I I think there was a structural difference too in that I think a Halligan is a one piece yep. cast. And Hooligan is like has a bolt or something that Yeah, it's like a three piece. Yeah, it's like a three piece. Something thing. like that. So yeah, that that was uh you know, we did our name exploration. I was going through and I, I just liked the way it sounded and there's a connection to my background. I thought that was kinda cool and then uh, lo and behold, 
I found out that hooli is actually like an old obscure Scottish golf term that means blowing a strong wind. So Dang. layers, layers, layers. We layers, call man. that layers. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So you know, if you're in Scotland and it's blowing, it's blowing a hooli. Mm. So yeah, you know, once once I knew that, I was like, man, all right, we're on. It's meant to be. And so you reti- When did you retire? So did you get, wait? Let me phrase that. Did you have school finished by the time you retired? No. So no. you re- you retired from the teams. In July of 21, and then... How'd I, that feel? Uh, man, if I'm being honest, like a weight was lifted. Mm-hmm. I felt great. Yeah. It, you know, especially where I was, mm-hmm. I had been away from the platoon for yeah, a while, right? Yeah. The nucleus of the team. So, like, you're, you're a company <laughs> man. You're doing different stuff. Mm-hmm. Rewarding, important stuff. But when I retired, I was, like, at trade at... And so, like, I was out with platoons all the time. I was, like, in a platoon. I was basically in nine platoons at a time. I'd be out with this. And you're just like, oh, my God, how can I ever leave? Yeah. And then I had to clean out my cage. And I was like, oh, this is the wrong move. But after being a TU commander, troop commander, yeah, yeah. I mean, you're just in different yeah. company positions, yeah. essentially, you know, or executive positions after mm-hmm. that. But, uh, yeah, so uh, – Got out July, retired July 21, and then that program that I was in, um, I graduated in June of 22. So, yeah, a year and a half ago, some change. And then by that point, uh, I was all in, man. I, you know, I, I, I looked at all the pros and cons and basically came to the conclusion that if you think you have a good idea and you can pull it off and you don't, I mean, I, I'm just going to regret that my entire <laughs> life, you know? So the, uh, there really was no other choice but to proceed. Mm-hmm. And obviously, uh, you know, we're a young company, uh, ended up launching this last, last April, lot of stuff to figure out and being a small company is precarious, mm-hmm. lot of stuff to figure out, but, uh, it's extremely rewarding. And I found all these other things that when I was looking for, what I wanted to do, you know, I, one of the things that just to back up here a little bit that I think is worth mentioning, give these guys a call out because they do great work, but there's an organization called the honor foundation. Mm -hmm. Um, and what they do is they help soft transition from the military. And, you know, it's a, I don't remember how long the program is, but essentially there's kind of like a, uh, exploration period like a self exploration period uh, so did you do that whole thing at the honor foundation I did yeah and you know I kind of like didn't want to do it but there were other guys that I respected that were doing it mm-hmm. I'm like all right I got to go do it I don't want to do all this touchy filly stuff and get in line with my you know emotions and history and blah 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 and uh it ended up being like one of the best things for me because wait did you do all that stuff what is that stuff well I, the first I think the first 6 weeks it's like journaling hmm. and like like going through your history and trying to like, you know, decipher what makes you tick. Hmm. Or like, here's your history, but why why is it like that? Why did you do this? Why are you the way you are? Why why did you choose this path? What drives you? Like those things. Like hmm. why why are you waking up in the morning? So so you did ended up doing all that. I did. And you got reward out of it. You I did. learned something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I did. I you know, it didn't pop up when I was in the program, really. Mm-hmm. Like I, I was, they, they give you a coach mm-hmm. and the coach is supposed to kind of guide you through the process. And I was kind of. Is the coach a civilian or a team guy? Civilian. Okay. Civilian. And, uh, you know, they try to align if you have some sort of industry you're trying to get into right. or something like that. They want to try to align you and personalities and stuff like that. So they do the best they can. But I uh, had, had a great, great uh, coach there who was helping me guide through some stuff and have these conversations. But, you know, looking back, I, I could see he was, he was trying to pull teeth because I wasn't being easy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I wasn't converting very easily. But what I got from that program, like really what it did is it forced me to look at my priorities. Like what are the things that I think make me tick? Um, and these things equal happiness, right? And that's that, that mix of, you know, what am I trying to get out of my family life? Mm-hmm. What am I trying to get out of my work life? And like really – what am I trying to get out of work? Am I trying to make money? Am I trying to be home a lot? Am I trying to be my own boss? Uh, I didn't have all those answers, but it it set the precedent for me to be introspective and to look at all that stuff. I found it very, very helpful. And it took some time, but when I started to get into the Hooli stuff, I 
was like, you know what, man? I kind of like designing shit. And I kind of like building things. And I kind of like the challenge of doing something that maybe the odds are stacked against me, um, building a brand. Uh, these things are, are kind of scary, like in a different way, um, risky in a different way. Um, yeah, I just kind of, it, it grew on me. And then it's like, man, maybe maybe I'm an entrepreneur. Yeah, I'd say you're definitely an entrepreneur. What what I remember is like you were, you initially talked to me about this idea and you're like, well, you know, I'm in the golf. I'm like, oh, I don't, I don't like golf. Come talk to me when I'm 98 and I'm going to start playing <laughs> golf because I'm doing jujitsu and I'm freaking surfing and I'm playing guitar and all this stuff. But, you know, but I was like, oh, but you're like, hey, I got this idea because you're, but I know I've known so many team guys that were so into golf. And then when you were telling me the idea, I was like, well, I also know there's a whole group of dudes that play golf that are not like a stereotypical golf person. And I was like, oh, you're going to freaking land because there's all kinds of people that are, that think the way you think about golf and they're a huge part of that market and I know tons of them and no one's no one's reaching them. No one's no one's talking to those people and definitely no one's making cool stuff for them to wear. So as soon as you were talking to me, I was like, oh yeah, this is gonna be this is gonna be great. You're gonna nail it because that those people exist. And you're making this is what I always think is important. You make something that's for you and your friends. Like you're making something that's for you. I make all kinds of stuff that's for me and my friends. Like I make jujitsu gear. Why? That's for me and my friends. Make rash cards. That's for me and my friends. Make energy drinks. That's for me and my friends. This is all stuff that I use. And so as as you were talking to me, I was like, oh, he's gonna make stuff for him and his friends. And there's a and I know that there's a huge, I mean, look, golf is a freaking huge thing. And I know that it's not all people in a country club with a Mercedes. It's a bunch of hooligans. And so, oh, you've got a whole group of people that you're going to be, that, that want to get on board with this. And not only that, but people that, you know, they're doing it early in the morning. They're doing it because they got a regular job. They're doing it, you know, in between when they're taking care of their kids. They're practicing in their backyard, hitting into a net. You know, like these are the people, there's a whole culture of like hooli golf that's out there. I already know it. And so when you were like, oh, I'm going to make clothes for them. I was like, oh, that's freaking awesome. That's going to do outstanding. So it may be your first effort in business, but I think it's going to slay because I think you're you're nailing a group of people that are, are that think the way you do about a very... Uh, something that people are super passionate about. I've seen freaking team guys spend their all their money on golf, right? New clubs, new balls, new freaking tees, new this, new that. But they're hardcore dudes, and and they work out and they train. And so you're taking that team guy approach to golf, and I think it's gonna crush. So, man, that that's awesome. I appreciate you saying all that because you said it way better than I possibly <laughs> ever could have. Man, that's it. I mean, you know, we're trying to. Trying to bring golf to uh, you know a, a group of dudes out there that are cut from a different cloth and see the world maybe a little bit different and yeah maybe a little bit hardcore up in the mind yeah you know? like dude you post workout stuff and like early morning golf right you're like dawn patrol golf pre dawn golf is salt <laughs> like that's what you're doing that's if I when I start playing golf when I'm seventy nine years old I'll be like early dawn patrol golf. I'll be in the game. I'll be I'll be Huli to the to the ah, core. Huli to the core. I know what the issue is, man. You're you're scared to get hooked because it, it it's an all well, this. I definitely don't need any more hobbies. I no, can tell I you that right no now. No doubt. Um, and and especially a hobby that takes four hours. Like, and I know you could do it faster. How fast can you play? How fast can you play nine holes? Do you play nine or do you play eighteen? No, I'm not playing nine. I'm I'm is no that quitter, like a, Chaco. Okay, Come it. on, man. So how long does it take you to play eighteen holes? It it depends. So if I'm hitting it good, I could do it in two and a half hours, like at a mild. Do you jog a little bit? Eh, I might jog. Okay. Uh, it it <laughs> yeah. it really depends on how I'm playing. Um, like just an average round, even if I'm playing like shit, uh, three hours. Uh, and this is all if I get off the first, you know, tee first. Mm -hmm. So if there's no one in front. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, but yeah. I played as fast. I mean, now uh, there's this new thing. I haven't tried it yet, but I, I'm gonna have to get back into running shape. Drop a couple of lbs, but they have speed golf. And these guys do it like in an hour, hour and a half, and they're like legit sprinting around. Um, I've done that, and mm -hmm. the fastest I've golfed is I've, I've played in less than two hours. Yeah. And for, for a hack, that's pretty damn fast. Yeah. You went to the freaking caddy course in Scotland. 
what what's that all about? How long did that take? What kind of pressure situations were they like? Yo, we give me a club, <laughs> give me a club. What's the distance? What's the distance? Oh man, I'm I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, another good, great organization worth uh, talking about. But um, Caddy Schools for for uh, Caddy School for Soldiers is another program. That's a program I went in this last May. Um, great organization, and basically what they do is they fly a group of veterans out. Uh, to Scotland and it was a month period that we spent in Scotland and really the purpose of the uh, of that is to you know guys who've been through a lot of shit to uh, share their experiences with each other you know help each other uh, heal and find out what's what's next and uh, and connect with golf and then also to you know find some employment so there's a lot of guys who leave that program and they they are caddies um, you know, working their way up or uh, going to resort towns and mm-hmm. being caddy. So um, it was an awesome experience. I had a great group of guys. And to uh, to everyone, you know, running the program, just say thank you guys for having me. Um, kind when of you, when you, does, so every, this is soldiers, what is it, soldiers what? What's the name of it? Caddy School for Soldiers. It's caddy, they all go to Scotland or yeah. just some? Yeah, it's a, uh, I, they had one class um, that I think went to Whistling Straits, um, but yeah, they have a couple couple classes that go each year to Scotland. That mm-hmm. that's it. Yeah, Damn. Uh, unless something's changed. How uh, much does it cost to go to caddy school if I was just like signing up? Well, I mean, if you're a veteran in the program, it's free. No, but what about me? Oh, or not? What about Echo? He's not a veteran, but he's just fired up for golf and he wants to go. Do you even know? Ah, uh, man, no clue. But uh, you're talking airfare, that's couple grand minimum and then you talk about I mean we stayed they have a uh, they have a house in St. Andrews so you know since you don't know much about golf but I do know that that's like the that's the mecca of golf it is the holy girl that, that, that is the best way to say it is the mecca of golf it it's is ground zero is it where ground, golf started there's probably some debate but mm. um, field, field course is pardon me hundreds of years old yeah, I want to say they've been pissing people off for hundreds of years. <laughs> I, I want to say, uh, yeah, I, I hope I don't get this wrong, uh, but you'll just edit it out. I think it's from the 17th century, um, like old, mm-hmm. old, old. So, uh, yeah, I mean, you you go there and, uh, man, one of the best places I've ever visited. I can't wait to go back. I don't know when that will be, but um, the country is just so gracious. And, you know, it's just amazing. And, and you go around best golf courses, you know, probably on the planet, and they're all stacked right next to each other. There's so many golf courses. Are they sitting you down? Is They're like a freaking old freaking Mickey type dude that rolls in with like sunburned face leathered. And he's like, let me tell you, when you get in the sand trap and there's a four knot offshore wind, you want to go with this. Like, is it like that? Like, what's it going down? Yeah, so in terms of golf Yoda, where's he at? <laughs> they have a training program and, and they go through kind of the basics and, and most of the guys that show up are proficient golfers, but mm-hmm. not always. It's not a prerequisite. In fact, one guy was uh, you know, a great guy was out there. He had just picked up golf. Um, so they go through some of the kind of fundamentals, but in terms of like what you're doing as a caddy, your goal is to help your golfer have his best day. And so there's a lot that goes into that, um, aside from the tactical stuff of, you know, what is the yardage, mm-hmm. what is the lie. You carry a rangefinder. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I I actually I went old school and milled it out. No, I I stepped it out. Yeah, I I but, didn't I, I but, didn't use a rangefinder in the program. They have uh you have a book, and you have markers on the course. Oh, okay. So you're using markers and like Got okay it. from there. It's 20 paces, it. and I mean, just like your your diving yeah. pace count, I, yeah. I had a pace count. Okay. Um, but yeah, really, really fun and, and rewarding. And uh, I, who knows, man? Um, maybe in retirement, I'll I'll go caddy and uh, I put in my LinkedIn profile, uh, part time caddy for Part-time hire. Caddy. No, no one's taking me up on that, but <laughs> I'm, I'm stand willing. by, bro. <laughs> you may be out there yeah. caddying. Yeah. But uh, you know, the other part in terms of helping someone have their best round is managing you know, emotions and strategy out there because having someone who can help you make the right decisions out there when you're not in the heat of the moment because, you know, ego, you you talk about ego a lot. Ego on the golf course, it's not good, Mm -hmm. especially when your skill level doesn't, isn't, you know, 
up to your mm-hmm. levels uh, of the ego. On par. On par, yeah. Yo, Thank you. Ooh, look at that. Yeah. He speaks up and he comes in with a slam dunk <laughs> pun, bro. He's been waiting all he, day. He had that written down. <laughs> just waiting. Just yeah. waiting. Man, good to go. Good. So that that's you learned a lot and good. You you were posting cool videos and stuff when you were um when you were over there. It looked looked freaking badass. Absolute and, blast. And yep. obviously I'm not a golfer, but you know, we know how that goes. Um and that obviously helps you out with Huli. You understand the game better and all that, which is which is awesome. By the way, you know, we mentioned Beth, your wife. Um she is a, a program manager for the Navy SEAL Foundation, which is like just awesome. And she's been there for a while. But um I just wanted to point that out that, you know, you've been out there, you know, serving our country and now you retired, but she still is serving our country and serving the teams through what she does with the Navy SEAL Foundation. Um, pr- pretty awesome effort and a great organization that has helped, uh, obviously helped so many of our friends and, f- and our friends' families. Um, what, what's that like? What do, you, what do you look at from the outside? How hard is she busting her ass to make that happen? And is, there, is it possible that anyone could be more passionate about taking care of team guys than team guys' wives. Yeah, it, I mean, you, you said it right there. It's uh, The organization is just amazing. They've done so much over the last couple of decades and continue to, you know, I mean, help out the families. And and now, you know, with uh, all the veteran issues, they've, they've got these new programs. Um, the Warrior Fitness Program just opened up in mm-hmm. San Diego, helping, helping uh, veterans, team guys, you know, recover from years of abuse on their bodies and, and minds and all that. Um, and, and always, you know, there for the uh, wounded and family of the fallen and all that. So, yeah, man, to, uh, it's been really, really neat to see Beth, you know, pick up that service. I mean, she served, you know, I mean, while I was running around doing stuff, you know, running the family, I mean, that's, that's service, mm-hmm. keeping, keeping the family together, keeping everything moving the service and then to get out, you know, and have her do that and be a part of that organization. It's just really cool, man. And on top of that, it's, it's really neat to stay kind of connected through her to the community as well. Yeah. So kind of a, another, you know, blessing as well. No, it's awesome. And it was pretty cool. We, we all went to an event and correct me if I'm wrong, but there was four, it was a Navy SEAL foundation event in Los Angeles and there was four guys from Task Unit Bruiser there, and we were all with our wives, the same wives that we had. I mean, I guess Beth was your girlfriend at the time, but Jeremy was there with his wife, still married, and then one other guy who's still active duty with his wife, just still there. There's four of us there, right? Uh, I, th- I, I remember the three. I don't know about There might the, have been uh, one more. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you're right, yeah. There's four of us. There are four, yeah. so... Pretty awesome, pretty awesome to see, and we got a we got a picture of that momentous occasion. Um, four team guys that have all been married <laughs> to one woman for a long time. That's pretty impressive, and uh, pretty impressive what that foundation does. And Beth, thank you for what you do, um, and thanks to that foundation for what you guys do. What else does this get us up to speed? Man, I, I mean that. I think that's everything. That's the most I've talked about my life <laughs> ever. Ever. <laughs> ever. And hopefully, you'll never <laughs> have to do it again. <laughs> yeah. No, man. Uh, you know, thank you for having me on. Um, yeah, I said when I started, or if I didn't say, I meant to say. Extremely humbled to be here, man. I mean, to think of the people that have sat in this seat um, and kind of what you've done, you know, over the last decade, man. It's it's amazing. Glad to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Um, yeah. That's all well, I got. Echo Charles, you got any questions? Yeah, yeah, I got a few oh, questions. Oh, here we go. So you We're going football questions. So, well, no. Come on, bro. Not as much. That's your job. Do, wait, D-tackle no, and nose guard, right? Football. All right, so uh, I started out uh, D-end uh, freshman year, and then I moved to nose guard. Hmm. Yeah. Because 190, 195 is not big for nose guard. Oh, no, 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 yeah. no. I, I wasn't big, but yeah. uh, I was aggressive, and, and I was a shoot-the-gap nose guard. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, relied on the speed. That's good. But you were into drawing growing up. I did. Do yeah. You think, do you think that that has a direct correlation to you know design close like that? Hundred percent, man. Right? Like there was a. You know, it's it's interesting. Guys come on your podcast and, and do interviews. You, you learn about a lot of things, and I think there's a lot of guys who are kind of 
unless you can come up with something better creatively inclined. Oh, for sure. You know, I mean, like play guitar. I, I grew up playing guitar, mm-hmm. um, drawing. You know, you got guys that are great at photography or this or that or whatever. And uh, I think that all plays into what we do. I yeah. mean, there, there's a, a lot of creativity to, you know, being a special operator. No doubt about it. Yeah, for yeah. sure. What was the uh, what was the original name for the tactical golf bag? Uh, we didn't have a name. It, I mean, the no, you had a name. You had a name. Did I have a name? Did you write? D- it down? Didn't you just say you said, you said we had a name for it, and then it eventually oh, the, became who? I, I I had it. I had a name for the brand. Yeah, yeah. What was I had the a name, name for the brand. The uh, the original, <laughs> the original. Oh God, oh man, I'll say, it. was was Hooli Bros. Hooli Bros. Hooli Bros. Oh. <laughs> Dude, Wait, yeah, why okay. is it? Yeah. Why is that? Hey, bad? we can edit this out, <laughs> bro. <laughs> Wait, why is that bad? Just because it's too bro, I, I, bro. Look, man, I, I was very early. It the idea hadn't matured, but but Huli yeah. Huli was in the first iteration, and yeah. then and then I played around with hooligan. So we went through like our first mm. kind of uh, class as hooligan golf. Mm. I kind of liked hooligan golf yeah, because that's the kind of people that I think we're talking about. But yeah. then I think there's more layers going straight. Hooli. Hooli, well, yeah. layers. And yeah. it's cleaner. And it's, it, it, yep. it's, it's too on the nose. Yeah. Hooligan. And yeah. then you've got also the wind, the Scottish the Scottish wind blowing through. So we yeah. got all kinds of oh, yeah. going yeah. deep. Yeah, Hooli comes off as more refined, which is kind of the same element of refinement that golf kind of hmm. seems to have. But it's not overboard. Know. Not overboard. It's, and an, it's not Well, too the whole snobby, idea right? is already not snobby. It's already mm-hmm. hardcore. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. But then if you take that hardcore, no matter how much you refine it, it's still going to be hardcore, no matter what. You see what I'm saying? So I think Dude, it landed perfectly. I'm going to have to get my father-in-law some golfer. Mm. And my dad. I'll have to get them some, some golf shirts. Yeah, man. We'll see what's up. Hey, if, if, I, if I don't play golf, can I still wear your stuff or no? Yeah, absolutely, man. I mean, look, it's just fucking cool-looking shit. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, like this, like... I yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, you see, it's got like, like a little camouflage yeah. activity in the yeah, collar. That's kind of the interior. deal. Yeah, yeah. so it's kind of subtle. Yeah, look, we're we're starting in golf, and we hope. I, I think the spirit of the brand is sound. I mean, all, all the things that you just described, which I will not try to say as eloquently as you. I mean, that that's just a spirit, right? You know, like we we can take that. We can, uh, you know, whether we get into kind of like lifestyle apparel or. You know, you get into other sports or whatever. Um, but, yeah, there's tons of people, tons of Huli customers. And I'll just say thank you to, you know, all of our customers uh, out there but um, that aren't, aren't golfers. So, you know, please, please do. And, and, out. and people can find you. So it's HuliGolf.com. That's where you can get the stuff. You can go to Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at HuliGolf. And then you have a YouTube channel that you're the star of. Hell, yeah. Yeah, I, look, I haven't been posting on YouTube that often. I'm, I'm going to get back to it. Um, but it's it's over the top Hooli, at over the top Hooli. Did you know that's what it was? Yes. Why is it at over the top Hooli? What's the what's the difference here? Well, I mean, over the top is... The Sylvester Stallone movie? Well, I think for uh, copyright purposes, I, I can't say it. But, uh, you know, the yes, over the top is a great <laughs> silver Sloan movie. It's just a coincidence. Mm-hmm. Um, but over the top is also layers. I'm talking about layers yes, here. Sir is a it's a problem in a golf swing so if you have an over-the-top swing uh, it's a it's a swing fault so okay. there's there's, right. there's some layers there yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah uh, over the over the top Hooli and then uh, also at lead Bob Holland is my personal handle kind of a new account on Instagram have we reached out to uh, the DOD King you know what I'm talking about yeah oh yeah, yeah. this dude um, he's because I because I follow you now all of a sudden I get golf stuff in my algorithm <laughs> which is you know but and you know I'll I won't look at much of it but I saw some kid and he and I said from 757 from Virginia Beach where the teams are and he does this whole thing. He doesn't use a T. Do you know what a T is? Yeah, Echo I know Charles? what a T is. Okay, thank I'm just you. making sure. No, 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 no. no. Uh, thank thank you for sure. asking. Well, yeah, yeah. the thing is he doesn't use one. Okay. The DOD means drive off the deck. Okay. So there he's out know. there and he just talks mad shit. Okay. Anyone that uses a T, he calls him a weasel. He's like, oh, weasel, no. you cheat, and all this stuff. T using w- weasel. Oh, T using, using weasel. weasel. So okay. he says, oh, you know, oh, all you weasels out there and keyboard warriors. <laughs> Dude, he goes off. Yeah. But then he cracks mm. these drives off the ground. He just throws the ball out there. Wait, who is this? He's a guy. It's his, a, his handle is actually CVA 
underscore golf, I believe. Yeah, oh, it's like, like, a, I, inner, like an influencer dude or something? Yeah. Or, uh, hell, yeah. You guys yeah. Know. yeah. He's the most popular golfer there is. <laughs> it, but it's but it's okay. it he, is he, man. he will be now he yeah. will be he should be C I think his first name begins with C mm. and then it's VA because he's from Virginia he's from Virginia Beach no okay. less and then what's the last part of it I think it's just CVA golf yeah, okay. Think, so. okay but his real thing is DOD King and he oh, tells yeah. people he's like because okay. I'm the king he yes, says yes, okay. and he says I'm a uh, I'm five foot seven I got crooked teeth and a mullet, and I'm about to just crack this down the fairway. There we go. Down yep. the fairway. And he throws the ball out, and then he just walks up to it and just cracks it. Yeah. And look, there's some of the keyboard warriors out there. <gasps> yeah. They're saying, oh, it's fake. Mm. But then he'll do like a long version and be like, how fake is this? He'll throw it out there and just hit it. There's no edits. Oh, he's okay. he's good, man. He, he's blowing up and he's doing some flabs. And uh, yeah, guy's got skills, man. He's not very big, but he smash, smashes it. Yeah. So we'll get the, we, we got to get you connected with the DOD king. I mean, I, I am a T using weasel. Right, but he doesn't want to be one of these people that's wearing golf shirts that are made by weasels. He wants to be probably, I would imagine. He's, because he's also like a working class dude. He's not a snob. He's out there, he's out there working. He's got a job, you know. Sure. So yeah. I, I think he's already sporting someone else's stuff. I, yeah. that, that's what it is. Whenever you get a following, but okay, well we'll yeah, see. Yeah, we can collab. We'll see. I don't think he's a weasel. I think he's a good American. He's from Virginia Beach. I think he's probably going to be really interested in representing Hooli, which is more legit than whatever bullshit he's rolling up right now. No offense to Dod King, and look, I'm not a golfer. But he looks like he cracks it pretty good to me. Brad, for someone who's not a golfer, you seem to know a lot about it. Dude, once you got, he got in my algorithm. Hey, <laughs> got in your got algorithm. Got in my algorithm. Got, yeah. So um, props, it. props to that guy. Props, props, um, props. Uh, so that's where people can find you. YouTube, Over the Top Hooli. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, at Hooli Golf. And then HooliGolf.com if you want to just go there and get a badass shirt. You could wear that shirt to a meeting. You could wear it to dinner. And yes, you could wear it playing golf. And you got a bunch of cool designs that you're the designer of now because we apparently you're the design guy. Hell well, yeah. I'm, I'm not the only designer to give credit to our great designer. So. Check, check. Uh, Echo, do you have any more questions? That is it. Good to see cool. you. Yeah, uh, thanks, man. Bobby, any other closing thoughts, man? No. Good times, man. Thank you. Wrapped it up. Um, well, thank you. Thank you for coming down. Uh, it's freaking legit. And that guy's are now retiring. Uh, look, I hate the fact that you all have to retire, but they retire and you can come down here and kind of share your story. Um, it's awesome. I appreciate it. Thanks for what you did for the country. Thanks for what you did for the Navy, for the teams. Thanks for what you did for tasking a bruiser. Thanks for the lessons that you passed on to the next generation that are out there using your lessons for their platoons right now. Um, thanks for what you did. And you never faltered. You never wavered. You stepped up, you led, and you set an example, an outstanding example, and you passed on the highest standards of the frogmen. So thanks, bro. Yep. Thanks, brother. Appreciate it. And with that, and this actually means a lot in this particular case, yep. Bobby Holland has left the building because you know that, that came from Elvis. Lead Bob, yeah. Elvis has left the building. Yeah. That's where it comes from. Oh, yeah, yeah, the layers. And, yeah. and okay. so... Today, there's a lot of meaning when I say that Bobby Holland, lead Bob, has left the building. He's, we talked about it a little bit. He's, he's, he's a fan of Elvis. Yeah. So Bobby Holland has left the building. Awesome to have him on and see what he's doing here, bringing back a lot of memories. Um, very cool. So thanks, thanks to lead Bob. It is always interesting to hear you. Even the same thing with GIF. Mm-hmm. Like, Especially when there's other players in the whole history of the story, you know, Leif and like, you know, um, Tyler. Mm-hmm. I know Tyler. Mm-hmm. I've actually, I have a whole separate history with Tyler, by the yeah. way. I don't know if you guys knew this, but um, so I've known Tyler. Well, you knew him from hanging out when with you were. Jeremy and Kiko, yeah. yeah. Coming, yeah. A so, different Jeremy, by the way, yeah, different than Jeremy. the Jeremy that we talked about today. Yeah. The but, Jeremy that we talked about today is a different Jeremy. Different Jeremy than yeah. you're, yeah, exactly. Than the Jeremy that you're talking about. So there's so, like, yeah. let's say there's a Hawaiian Jeremy, yep. and then there's a different Jeremy. A not Hawaiian Jeremy. Yeah. yeah. So 
Yeah, so it always is interesting to hear like another, essentially another perspective mm -hmm. of a timeline that I'm very familiar with, with characters that I'm very familiar yeah. with. Very it's kind of like um, when they do a, a like a, a prequel or a sequel. Prequel, yeah, yeah. But, exactly. but it's more like a prequel, right? Prequel. Because a sequel, you kind of, you're carrying on, but yeah, yeah, exactly. a prequel, you're kind of learning more about what you know about already. Yes, exactly. Way. So there's something a little cooler about it. Yep, exactly. I guess the only, Hooli is a sequel. Right? Yeah, that's like, oh, cool. there's more coming. More right. to come. Yep, exactly. Hooli, business, <laughs> oh, brother, golf. There's a, there's a movie called Go. The name of the movie is Go. And it's a... it's a. We should make a energy drink called a Go. Oh, we did. <laughs> no, we cool. Did. Okay, what's it about? Uh, it's a, you know, like a little thing thing that they all, this group of people get into, mm -hmm. these kids or whatever. Uh, like, you know, young 20s, whatever. Mm -hmm. They go to Vegas and all this stuff. This, this trouble they get into. And they all have their, and they split up, and they get back together, and they split up or whatever with their different. Um, over time, over one weekend. It's like a night okay. or so. Got it. You know, and but it's so it's like three movie, you know, like in three stories mm -hmm. in one movie. Mm -hmm. So and each one is from a different person's perspective. Yep. So it's the exact same story, but it's from this guy's perspective and this girl's perspective. It's like that. Mm -hmm. That's what it felt like. So you saw a different perspective today. Another perspective, to hear, you know, man. a lot, of, a lot of overlap, which makes it so interesting. And that's what made the movie so interesting, because when, when the overlap, you're like, oh, that's what was going on at that time. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Same deal. Yeah, and it's good to be able to capture that stuff. Uh, I mean, and even Bob was telling me, you know, he was going through like just thinking about stuff, and he said it on the podcast he's been doing some thinking about everything, and you start to remember little things, and like even the story he was telling about being in Mount and like, like rappelling off the roof and like. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna think about it more. I can't really remember it right now, and yeah. and so it's nice to be able to capture. Like at some point, you forget stuff that happened. Yeah. The more stuff that happens in your life, the more stuff you forget about. Mm -hmm. The further away you get from it, you know. Leif sending me those emails, and Bob would say an after man. He's like, that email account doesn't exist anymore. So oh, yeah. Bob doesn't even have access to those emails that Leif sent me. Mm -hmm. So. Man, to have, and those emails, those old emails are really interesting to look at because they're a, they're a, uh, a stamp of time. Yeah, it's like a historical. And like, it's you, you wrote it, like yeah. you wrote it yeah. and that's you at that time. Yep. And you, you can get older and you can learn more and you can become more wise and you can become more jaded. But at that time, this is a pretty good representation of who you were and how you felt at a certain time. Yep. Yeah, so pretty cool to be able to have those documents and be able to go through them and get back those memories. Even even after we got done recording, he was like, he he said when I started reading, um, he was kind of like, wait, oh, he you know it was like coming back to him. The memory of it came back to him. Yeah. So it's very cool to be able to reopen those things and remember details that you might not otherwise remember and don't think about and all that stuff so mm. thanks for coming on bob appreciate it lead bob lead bob still on the path after all these years speaking of the path mm. deaf reset's coming yep deaf reset is starting Jan listen technically speaking starts january 1st mm. reality starts right now like if you if you got to be ready for deaf reset you can't just show up. It's like going to Buds. You just don't roll into Buds. Yeah. Oh, first phase, day, what do they call it? One, one day. Like first week, first day. Yeah. They call it oh, one, one day. If you roll into one, one day and you haven't done some, <laughs> they give you, even the even they, the milit, the Navy mm. gives you six weeks prior to one, one day. Mm. So one, one day is coming January 1st. Yeah. You got to be ready. You got the prep phase going on right now. We got the warning order. So we're going to get our lives Physical, mental, professional, family, leadership. We're going to get them all squared away. Starting January 1st. There's prep work that's happening now. Don't go into it cold. You won't make it. So go to thedefreset.com. We got workouts and fitness with Jason Kalipa. We got leadership with Echelon Front. We got discipline directives coming from me. We got Jocko Fuel. We got, but there's like benefits, benefits, you call them. Hell yeah. We're going to give away like tickets to the muster. We're going to weigh a bunch of Jonko Fuel stuff. So, defreset.com. Come and check it out. Let's get on the path. Be prepared. January 1st is coming. It's December 1st right now when we're recording this. I don't know when it's coming out, but time is ticking. Be ready. Def Reset. Go to the defreset.com. Speaking of Jonko Fuel, jonkofuel.com. I am currently. <coughs> 
at this time, two goes deep. Yep, I'm one. And I'm feeling very fired up. So now look, am I fired up because Lee Bob was here? Sure. A little bit. Kind of. Yeah. Kinda. Am I also fired up because I had a few go? A two go? Yes, I am. Uh, so do I have downside? Am I going to crash? No, nope, I'm not going to crash. Am I going to get type 2 diabetes? No, I'm not. Am I going to get some other weird uh, gut problems because I have artificial sweeteners? No, nope, none of that's going to happen. So my downside is nothing. My upside is everything. Go to JockoFuel.com. Get yourself some go. You can also go to Wawa, Vitamin Shop, GNC, Military Commissaries, AFES, Hannaford, Dash Stores in Maryland, Wake Fern, ShopRite, HEB, HEB down. They're in Tejas. Yeah. Meyer up in the Midwest, Harris Teeter, Lifetime Fitness Shields, small gyms everywhere. And listen, if you own a small school, a, a jiu-jitsu school, CrossFit school, powerlifting school, Olympic lifting school, maybe it's just a straight Globo gym. But you want to sell Jocko Fuel? Email jfsales at jockofuel.com. Chaz, he'll get in touch with you. Have you met Chaz yet? Mm. Oh, old school. Old school, yeah. old school in the game. Yeah. Just getting after it. So... That's what we're doing, milk, protein. Because sometimes, you, look, well, let's face it, sometimes you need 30 grams of protein, yeah. like right now, yeah. Oh, RTD. Yeah. Yeah. Just crack one open. You're good, 30 grams of protein. You're I, good. I figured something out. What's that? About the, the milk banana RTD. A little side Sh- side note. So, Please share. So the, <laughs> but, Do share. So, you know, like me and me, like many people, I'm not, you know, banana is not the number one flavor. Usually it's going to be chocolate. Usually, right? this is just in world. In just the world? in general, okay. yeah, you know, banana flavor. It's kind of mm-hmm. like mm, you know, it takes a special, you know, like you. It's very rare that that's the number one flavor. Some people like I dig Being it for an individual human being. Yes, to prefer banana as their number, number one ways. favorite okay, flavor right. in yes. general. Correct. Right, and I'm one of those people mm-hmm. where I like the chocolate. I like the whatever. So the banana is like mm, fine, but but for whatever reason, freaking the banana milk RTD is my number one favorite one. I don't know why. Okay, till now. So I used to make these homemade milkshakes back in the day when I was when? a teenager. <laughs> Dang. Hell yeah. And the the formula was freaking good. Like really good. So here's the recipe. It's sugar, milk, vanilla, one egg, one raw egg, mm-hmm. and one banana. Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> bro, bro, I'm telling you, you get the ingredients and the proportions perfect, bro. It tastes freaking super good. Uh-huh. Especially if the banana is a ripe banana. You can't get the underripe banana. Mm-hmm. The pre-ripe banana. Don't do that. The ripe banana. What was Tulsi's deal with bananas? Oh, yeah, the frozen one. Frozen. Yeah, yeah, to yeah. make it more creamy, whatever. Okay. But nonetheless, that was the formula for my homemade milkshake. It was mm. freaking, bro, it was really good. So she blended up really good. The egg makes it like thicker inside. Bro, it's really good. Oh, yeah, ice too. That's what the Mocha RTD banana tastes like. Bro, it tastes exactly like it. GTG. GTG, big time. And if you put it in the <laughs> fridge for a long time or the freezer for a short time, it'll be extra cold, which adds another layer of, like, um, what do you call appeal to the taste. <laughs> Bro, I'm telling you. I'm telling you. Oh, there you go. All kinds of good stuff. Joint Warfare, Super Krill, Vitamin D, Cold War. That's it. That's what we're doing. Hydrate. Hydrate. Yeah. You're going to need to hydrate. Get done with that. Even before the jiu Yeah. And then... Here's a key component to your daily life. Greens and creatine. If you're not doing greens and creatine in the morning, you should be. Yeah. There's no one that shouldn't be doing that. Not one person. Yeah. Everyone should be doing greens and creatine like brushing your teeth. Brush your teeth, greens and creatine. Actually, don't do it right away because you get that weird, what's that thing? thing? What is it? You don't want to do that. <laughs> you brush your teeth, you can't drink, you can't eat anything for how long? Half an hour? Yeah. Yeah. Not 45 minutes? 45 minutes. Sounds, okay. Sounds. So 45 minutes, then maybe you get done with your workout. By the time you're done with your workout, 100%, you're cleared hot. Yeah. For oh. greens and creatine. Or you can follow my protocol if you don't know already. I said it before. Right when you wake up, no problem. Mm. Uh, great. I don't care. The greens I don't put in, but I put, just put creatine hydrate. Boom. Pre-brush? Pre-brush. 100%. Pre-brush. Pre-brush, creatine, and, and the Why hydrate. Do you brush your teeth, bro? Right after that. What, you go down to the kitchen and you're like functioning, doing stuff? Bro, it's staged right on my nightstand. Oh, okay. A whole thing of hydrate. Water's already there, Hawaiian, from last night. Okay. See what I'm saying? Hydrate creatine right there. Here's what's bad. Anyone that goes in my room and they know what cocaine looks like, you know how the creatine you put in, you spill a little bit? Bro, it looks, it looks bad. But, hey, man, if you can endure that, bro, it's a perfect staging uh, sequence. <laughs> See what I'm saying? Yes, pre-brush, boom, done, before I even get up. I'm already fucking in. You see what I'm saying? 
with the creatine. Dude, I'm going to give that the triple stamp of approval. <laughs> dig it. Dig it. Hydrate and Shit. creatine. I had the vision of you walking around your house with morning breath for like an hour. <laughs> your wife comes down. Sarah Charles is like, yo, get back away from it. <laughs> Go back upstairs. Back away. Get, yeah. out the, get out the Listerine homes. I already got so that's what we're doing. Jockofuel.com. Go check it out. OriginUSA.com. We're doing jujitsu. We're lifting. We're hunting. Are we playing golf? Some people are. Yeah, kind of. I mean, shoot, you hear freaking Lee Bob talk about it. You're kind of like, oh, there might be a little bit more to it. I've never, you've never played. Have you ever played a round of golf on the golf course? I have played like literally one round of golf. On the golf course. On the golf course. Where where else would I play a round of golf? I don't know. You know how they say mini, I've played mini golf. It's not the same thing. i played more mini golf, yeah. I yeah, played I played that. mini golf. Before. I've Bro. never played one single round. <laughs> I was playing mini golf. I was playing mini golf. My son he was probably like six, sure. and he straight up like full driver with yeah. the putter, like full driver <laughs> shot that thing like Tiger Woods. <laughs> Bro, it was like such a hazard. <laughs> it was if if it would have hit somebody like another oh. kid, yep. it injury. would have been major, major injury, concussion, yep. possible like temple shot, death. Uh, I don't know, but I believe uh, OriginUSA.com. That's what we're doing. Get awesome closer, and they're all made in America. Look, we in this country have fought for freedom, and right now we're selling that freedom, selling it. You go and buy something from China, you're, 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 you're selling it. You're, you're giving it away. All this freedom that we fought for, being sold. Don't let it happen. Buy American. Buy American made. We go through the most extreme lengths to produce and manufacture things in the United States of America at originusa.com. Everything that you need. Workout clothes, hunt clothes, jeans. You need a pair of jeans. You probably need two pairs of jeans. We got you. Get American-made jeans. Support the American worker. Support the American co- economy. Support American security. Because if we can't produce things in this country, we don't have a country. OriginUSA.com. Go get some. It's true. Also, Jocko Store. Going to represent on the bill. Whether you're on death reset or not. You're just on the path in general, or even if you're taking a break from the path, doesn't matter. You can still represent. Look, I'm not recommending it. I'm not over here recommending Look, getting off the path. If you're taking a break from the path, yeah. by the time the order shows up, you should definitely be back on the path. Well, from an ideal standpoint, I think yeah. you're right. But on reality, boots on the ground. Hey, <laughs> we live in a world where some people aren't on the path 100% of the time. What I'm saying is it doesn't matter necessarily. Uh, it's hard you to put on a Discipline Equals Freedom t-shirt. Yeah. And not be on the path. That's true. It's hard to put on a Def Core T-shirt, a T-shirt yep. that literally says Def Core on it. Yep. Discipline equals freedom to the core. To the core. And you're like, yeah, I'm gonna. Where's that donut at? Yes, it's very hard. You're correct. So, but we live in an imperfect world in human beings, which we yeah. all are. I can see what kind of mood you're in today. <laughs> <laughs> Did you violate something? I'm a, I'm Did you? A... <laughs> do we have problems? Did you train today? I'm a very understanding. I did not train today. I'm a very understanding person. You see what I'm saying? That's all I'm saying. That's really the end all be all point that I'm trying to make. Look, but you can still represent. When you do, you want a new shirt that you want to represent with, you go to jockostore.com. That's where you get it. Discipline equals freedom. Regardless if you're resting or not, it still does equal freedom. You know what I'm saying? Check. Good. You think things are going to go freaking perfectly the way you want them to go right now all the time, every single day? They don't. No, not going to happen. It's okay. It's okay. Everything's going to be all right. Anyway, you want to represent jockostore.com. If you want to get in the Short Locker subscription, what that is is a new design every single month. It's good. People like them. Check them out. See if you like them. If you like a boom, subscription, that's where you can get that as well. Hey, speaking of America, Americans, look, do we need milk? Yes, we do. Do we get 30 grams of milk? 30 grams <laughs> of protein in milk? Yes. yes. Do we yes. get 14 grams of protein from a milk cookie? We do. Yeah. Guess what else? Sometimes you need supplemental protein. Actually, <laughs> your primary source of protein. Primary, yeah. Let's go steak. Yes, sir. Let's go American steak. Let's go Let's go primalbeef.com and let's go coloradocraftbeef.com. Two American companies bringing you steak that tastes like It's just it's just next level. Brian it's next level on that grass fed fruit finish. But I had the um I got the burgers right mm-hmm. last night or last night I was making the burgers. So here's a good tactic too. Just it's a side tip. Look. Mm-hmm. Does it matter? <laughs> look. 
<laughs> is this essential to do? No, but it's a side tip might help you out. So what I do is I grab the burger, I grab three of them, right? You know, they come in the stacks, yeah. right? Get them to room temperature. I ball them up into one big ball and I make, make them into a bunch of sliders for the kids. Mm. Grass fed fruit finish. That's where you're at. That's what I did last night. Yes. <laughs> Check it out. We got you. Colorado craft beef.com and primal beef.com. Go check those out. Subscribe to the podcast. Check out Jocko Underground. Check out our YouTube channel. Check out Psychological Warfare. Check out flipsidecanvas.com. Dakota Meyer selling you cool stuff to hang on your wall. Keep you on the path. Also, bunch of books. I've written a bunch of books. You know what they are. And look, they will help you. They will help you. Read them. Read them. And then look, you got kids in your life, get them away the Warrior Kid books, one, two, three, four, and five. These are the books, when you get them and you see kids read them, you see their lives change. So that's what we're doing. Check them out. Mike and the Dragons, About Face, Extreme Ownership, Dichotomy Leadership, it's all there. Echelon Front, you heard about Leif Babin today. He and I have a leadership consultancy. It's called Echelon Front. Go to echelonfront.com, we can help your organization. We can help you with every problem that you have because all the problems that you have are leadership problems and we solve problems through leadership. We got live events. We can come into your your organization and work with you on a long-term basis. We will figure out a plan to get you and your team aligned. So echelonfront.com, we also have an online training academy. If you want to train, look, for leadership, but it's training for life because when you interact with other human beings, which you do all day long every day, unless you're a hermit, you gotta interact with other people. That's leadership. So you gotta lead yourself, you gotta lead other people, you gotta interact with other people. Go to extremeownership.com and learn these skills. Also, if you wanna help service members, active and retired, you wanna help their families, Gold Star families, check out Mark Lee's mom, Mama Lee. She's got a charity organization. If you wanna donate or get involved, Go to americasmightywarriors.org, also heroesandhorses.org, also Jimmy May's organization beyondthebrotherhood.org, and finally the Navy SEAL Foundation, which is where Bobby's wife works. She's been there for a while, but there's a bunch of great human beings. These are the people, this is the organization that takes care of SEALs, families, and the SEALs, but when someone gets killed or wounded, their support is unbelievably strong. So check them out as well, Navy SEAL Foundation. If you wanna connect with Bob, he's on the interwebs, hooligolf.com. He's on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, at hooligolf. He's on YouTube with over the top hooli. And Echo is at Echo Charles. I am at Jocko Willink. And again, just be careful, because the algorithm, you'll look at one golf thing, and the next thing you know, you'll have a bunch of golf stuff inside your algorithm showing you the DOD king. So just be careful. <laughs> or whoever else. You know, if you look at a one dog, one knife, you'll have a thing full of knives. It's true. You if you talk about something, it'll pick it up, put it in there. It's wild. You gotta turn off your microphone setting on your phone. Okay. It's true. Sounds like a good plan. <coughs> so just be careful. We're there. There's algorithms on the hunt. Once again, thanks to Lead Bob, Bobby Holland, for joining us today. Check out hooligolf.com. Most important, thanks to Bob for his service, leadership, and the teams, and for our great nation. And thanks to Beth as well for everything you do for all of us. And thanks to all the personnel out there in uniform right now that are serving and protecting us around the world. Your sacrifice is appreciated and will not be forgotten. And the same goes to our police, law enforcement, firefighters, paramedics, EMTs, dispatchers, correctional officers, Border Patrol, Secret Service, and all first responders. Thank you for serving and protecting us here at home. We are grateful. And everyone else out there, you got a good example from Lead Bob, Bobby Holland. Step up, work hard, have fun, have fun, have fun, man. Put some Elvis in your life. Take care of your friends, take care of your family, run things, raise the bar, stay humble, and of course, keep getting after it. And until next time, this is Echo and Jocko, out.